Yes. All right, good morning. Um, good morning and welcome to the Ventura County Board of Supervisors board meeting. Welcome to your boardroom. Today is Tuesday, August 4th. Uh, we'll call this meeting to order with a roll call. Supervisor Boy? Here. Supervisor Parks? Here. Supervisor Bennett? Here. Supervisor Zaragoza? Here. And Supervisor Long? Here. Okay, now if we would all rise, please, and join in a pledge of allegiance to our flag. Mr. Powers, would you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Next up, we have our minutes from our meeting of July 28th for board approval. Have a motion and a second to approve those minutes. And could we have um, a vote, please? Please vote. Why is this pen not wanting to get that off of there? And that passes unanimously. And now we have agenda review, Mr. CEO. Thank you, Chair Long. Board members, uh, item 12, Harbor Department. Authorization to execute an exclusive authorization of lease with NAI Capital for real estate brokerage services for parcel K-1. Comment letters from Audrey Keller, Mike Mercadante, and Dottie pringle Hamans have been submitted. Items 23 and 24, Public Works. Public hearing regarding adoption of a resolution approving the proposed water allocation rate increases, pass-through and refund of surcharges, and revisions to rules and regulations for water work districts numbers 17 and 38 respectively. A PowerPoint presentation to be used for both items has been submitted. Item 25, RMA, public hearing regarding screening of proposed privately initiated general plan amendments to change land use designation from agricultural to existing community. A PowerPoint has been submitted. Item 26, Supervisor Bennett, request to re reconsider motion number one from item number 41 from October 28, 2014, Board of Supervisors meeting pertaining to sidewalk repair. A comment letter from Barry Gabrielson has been submitted. Item 27, Public Works, public hearing regarding updated report of sidewalk repairs and costs. PowerPoint has been submitted. Item 28, RMA, receive and file report and provide direction to staff regarding Ventura County General Plan update. A board letter and exhibits one through three have been submitted. And there's an addendum agenda, item 34, Supervisor Parks, recommendation to establish board policy for notification regarding controversial agenda items. Comment letters from Audrey Keller, Mike Mercadante, Lorraine Effers, Robert Chattanever, and Sandy Bardos have been submitted. Uh, and then finally, I understand uh, there may be a request to hear items 22 and 30 at the same time. That's correct. Okay. And that's it. Okay, board members, any other agenda items of note you wish to comment on? Okay, with that, we need an action to move the agenda as modified. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Now, um, board members, it's our time for our moment of inspiration. I'm very pleased uh, to have with us this morning to inspire us. Um, as you know, tomorrow kicks off our um, Venture County Fair, and a very important part of the fair is uh, the 4-H program. And so I've invited this morning, we have um, Hannah Hassian and Francesca Cherry, who are going to... Uh, speak to us from the 4-H program. It is a part of the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources, a statewide network of the University of California. It's an organization for youth ages 5 to 19, and it promotes hands-on experiential learning in the areas of science, citizenship, and healthy living. The program mission is to engage our youth in reaching their fullest potential while advancing the field of youth development. The first 4-H club began in Ojai in 1902, and Ventura County 4-H started in the early 1900s. Now Hannah, 
who is with us this morning, is an eight-year 4-H member who helped to restart a 4-H camp, Chief Peak, Upper Ojai. 4-H um, club president for three years and also the club treasurer. Participated in a canned food drive, beach cleanup, thank you cards for our troops, and homemade blankets for child protective services. Active in community, including Lake Casitas rowing team. And her future and goals, goals are to become a 4-H state ambassador, attend college, and attend veterinary school. Francesca is a 17-year-old graduate of Lorena High School in Thousand Oaks, attending Cal, uh, California Polytech State University, San Luis Obispo, majoring in dairy science, member of Santa Rosa Valley 4-H for six years. Her market lamb project and horse project, barrel racing, raised, <coughs> raised about 12 sheep, including breeders, yearlings, and market lambs, team leader, director of community service, all-star barn manager, sheared over 200 <laughs> sheep in the past three years for Santa Rosa Valley 4-H. As an all-star ranking member, led a 4-H sustainable U camp at the University of California Hanson Agricultural Research Extension Center in Santa Paula, focus of camp on 4-H camp activities, and developed an educational video that does a step-by-step -step process for shearing sheep. These are impressive young ladies and very strong um, representatives of what a wonderful program program we have in our county through our 4-H. So welcome and please. Good morning. My name is Hannah Hassian. I'll be a senior this year and I'd like to share with you how 4-H changed my life. Growing up, I was very shy and 4-H has helped me overcome that. Now, you probably couldn't get me to stop talking. <laughs> I started off by giving presentations at our club meetings. I worked my way up the ranks being a club treasurer and eventually club president. 4-H is a worldwide nonprofit youth organization that is focused on engaging youth to reach their fullest potential while advancing the field of youth development. It involves record bookkeeping, community service, and various projects ranging from arts and crafts to large animals. For the past seven years, I have been involved in the swine project. My summers have been spent raising swine and auctioning them off at fair. Learning about animals has deepened my love for them, and that's why my future goal is to become a veterinarian. 4-H has taught me the value and importance of community involvement and valuable skills like citizenship, communication, teamwork, and leadership. Without this organization, a wonderful mentor, and my parents, I would not be where I am today. It has been a privilege being the Ventura County 4-H All-Star this past year and being actively involved in my community. 4-H is a true passion of mine, and I plan to use all the skills I've learned for the many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Long and fellow board members, for having me here, and Hannah. Um, my name is Francesca Seri, and I am 17 years old, a 4-H member of Santa Rosa Valley 4-H, a recent graduate of Lorena High School, and like um, Chair Long said, I will be attending Cal Poly San Luis Obispo this fall, um, majoring in dairy science. Um, today I will be sharing how 4-H has modeled me into the individual I am today and inspired me to help others. I can definitely say that 4-H has given me the life skills I need in all aspects of my life. The leaders of 4-H, both club and project leaders, have continually supported me. They have done everything from encouraging me to become the board, uh, take club board member positions, such as director of community service, and eventually recommending me to come, become an all-star. They were even polite enough to write some of my college recommendation letters. Originally, I wanted to be in the Pygmy Goat Project, but my dad accidentally signed me up for the Market Lamb Project. <laughs> Two very different projects in that the Pygmy Goats you get to bring home at the end of the year and the Market Lambs you do not. <laughs> but in the end, this ended up being the best decision I ever, or mistake I ever made. <laughs> Through the great leadership of my project leaders, Darlene, Herb, and Martha, I have become a more responsible and hardworking individual. By taking on this project, I had to feed my sheep daily, I had to clean his pen, I had to monitor his weight, I had to exercise him, and I had to practice showmanship with him. 
My parents weren't going to remind me every single day to go feed my sheep or to practice with him or to go do anything with him. It was all on me. <laughs> As I grew older, these qualities became part of my character. They became my strengths and allowed me to succeed in academic, social, and personal aspects of my life. I definitely think the aha moment I had when I realized the for impact 4-H had on me was when I completed my Emerald Star project. This is a 4-H award received through the completion of community service. For my project, I decided to make the educational sharing video. Uh, I have about three years of, of experience sharing uh, sheep. I've done 200 over the years, both for 4-H and for independent people. I sheared just 40 in this past week and as we prepare for fair. And I decided to share my tricks of the trade with other 4-H members. So my dad filmed me, I edited the footage, and I sold the DVDs and returned the profits to Santa Rosa Valley 4-H Market Land Project. This was one of the last experiences I will have with 4-H, and it was one of the most impactful. This project embodied to me my personal 4-H experience of gaining knowledge, applying it, and then sharing it with my community. Without the experiences I've had through 4-H, I would not have received important skills of leadership, responsibility, confidence, and self-worth. 4-H has allowed me to meet new people, get in touch with the community, become more independent, and most importantly, allowed me to find my career path, which, just as Han Hannah said, is uh, to become a large animal veterinarian. From my experience, I truly believe 4-H makes the best better. Without 4-H, my, without my life would not be the same. Once again, thank you very much. Well, thank you both. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. And uh, as the fair does kick off on Wednesday, your your activities really start next Monday, correct? All the 4-H and... Yes. Yeah. That's so, exciting. We're you, very excited for fair yes. and all the good memories it'll bring. Yeah. <laughs> you both have become very good speakers. Very good public speakers. <laughs> Thank you so speakers. much. <laughs> very good. You know what? I think Barry and... Uh, we should pick these people up. Get out of the right. yeah. <laughs> Head of the hospitals right out there. So right. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I think we're both really excited for the future. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you for excellent work. Thank, excellent presentation. Thank yeah. you. Thank I, can, you. I can tell your family is very proud of you, and it's, it's well deserved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank nice. you. So and, much. and what a wonderful county to live in. That you know, people from Ohio and Santa Rosa Valley. That you guys can grow up and, and learn about working with animals like that. I just think it's wonderful. Good luck at the fair. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you for having us. We wish us. you the very best. Thank you for coming in this morning. Yeah. Oh, we want to get a picture? Go ahead. Oh. All right, no more. <laughs> <down there. laughs> That's Thank okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Isn't that? All right. <laughs> Inspirational for sure. Got Young their, women. Got their cowboy it. boots on. Yeah. That's great. <clears throat> Okay, board members, um, item 7, our consent agenda, 11 through 16. Anyone wish to poll or have yeah, comments? Madam Chair, I'd yes. like uh, just a quick explanation on uh, item 12 from Lynn, maybe a minute or so, just to kind of clear up, you know, the, the terms. Okay. And because uh, I had, a, oh, we had uh, an email and I, uh, that was sent to me and all of us, and, and I just want the clear, clarity on the terms. That I, I think this misunderstanding, can, can we share that now? Please, sure. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ms. Krieger. Good morning. Good morning, members of the board. Mr. Powers, Lynn Krieger from the Harbor Department. Uh, yes, this is a pretty straightforward agreement. I mean, generally, restaurant leases are not less than 10 years. Often they're 10 plus 5 plus 5 because it just takes so much money to improve them. However, in this agreement, uh, the commission is paid per year for each of the first five years. So if it's a three-year lease, you only pay for three years. Um, and then 4% for the second five years uh, in a lump. It should be a 10-year agreement. So there is not an agreement to pay 10 and, years up front. And apparently, all too, you know, the, the, the uh, commission is not an expense to, to the tenant. No, not an expense to the tenant. It comes out of the rent that we the rent that will thankfully receive. And normally those, uh, those uh, contracts are about 10 plus 10, and, right. and normally, you know. Normally. Yeah. yeah, We and we don't normally hire a broker because in California, even in California, there are not that many developers who can do the major projects like a hotel mm -hmm. or a fisherman's wharf, but restaurants are a real specialty, so we believe we need some help on this. So and and, you. and you have, we have a security deposit, and we can always, you know, right. take the property back in case of a de default. Correct. I just wanted to clarify that, uh, Madam Chair. 
Good Thank to you. do. Thank you. Thank you for coming in on that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, board members, any other consent requests or changes? Yeah, can I, uh, can we pull item for discussion number, I think it's uh, 6, uh, 15. 15? 15, 1-5. Five. One 1-5, five. okay. Uh, shall we do that and have that discussion now? Sure. Okay. Okay. Is that I, is a public works item? Yeah, it's a public works item. Um, this is an item, I guess, we're raising uh, fees at the landfill. I know that this doesn't go to the haulers or the landfill. It just basically is a fee that goes to the county, right? Yes, uh, that's correct. Yeah, that's right. And so I guess at the end, we're supposed to raise fees or costs or whatever it is. If we have additional costs, we're supposed to do the cost. But Every year I look at this thing and we just keep raising these fees and I don't think we have additional costs that keep increasing that we're making above some money. You know, we've got a lot of extra money that comes off the rate payers that pay when, they, when, when a trash is hauled there. So I guess I always I struggle with the idea that we just keep raising this rate because I remember one time ready where somebody was just, we do because we can. And at some point we've got to say we don't need to do it or unless you can come back and tell us, yeah, there's no, we've got additional costs. We need to have this rate increase. I don't know. If, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but I, I guess in a sense I do. <laughs> okay. Well, um, good morning. I'm Bruce Belusky uh, with the uh, Water and Sanitation Department, Public Works Agency. Um, it's a board approved agreement with uh, waste management. Um, it, revenues generated for general funds, so I don't know if I'm at yeah, you know, and that, that's that's what I really wanted to say. It's really just a general fund money that's going. That's it's correct. Not yes. Paying for your department, it's not adding any. You know, it's just one of those things. I guess I look at. We have a contract. We can raise it if we want to raise it, and and we do. And I, I just at some point we got to say. At some point we just say, somebody that adds was it four something cents per ton, whatever's going in there, and it's the people that are in the cities and the counties that are it's going to that landfill that are paying for that. And I guess I get to a point where. We're only supposed to be charging based under government what it costs us to do something. So it's not your issue. It's just what we up here as a policy. That's why it's just hard for me to support this. So anyway, I appreciate you your comments on that. My Thank pleasure. You. So this is something I just don't think we should just continue to do unless we have needs for the money. So. Anyway. That's all I want. Okay. Great. All right. Any anything else on consent? Can we vote on that separately? Sure. So I was going to ask you if that's what you want to do. All right. We'll so I'll move the consent calendar except for item 15. Okay. I'm Thank sorry, this, the one on the floor is number 15 itself right now. We can vote on that. Okay. Right. Let's act on item 15 first. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. That passes four to one. And then the remainder of the consent item. Motion and second, please vote. And the remainder consent is approved. For the record, ma'am, for item number 12, there was an additional comment letter passed out of the dais to you this morning from William Switzky that will be added to the record uh, at the conclusion of the meeting. Correct, that was at the dais, and thank you for calling you. that out. All right, uh, at this time we have public comment. Any public comment request? We have one. Public comment? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it on the screen. I'm sorry. Michael Nye. <laughs> sorry. Good morning. My name is Michael Nye. Effective July 6th, I became the executive director of the Area Housing Authority of the County of Ventura. I'm not new to the Area Housing Authority. I've been there for over 25 years most recently as the Finance and Section 8 Housing Program Director. The Area Housing Authority serves over 3,400 low, very low, and extremely low families within the unincorporated areas of Ventura County, the cities of Ojai, Fillmore, Thousand Oaks, Simi Valley, Moore Park, and Camarillo through our housing program. Our largest program, the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, which we administer for HUD, provides <coughs> landlords in Ventura County 
with subsidy payments of over $25 million on an annual basis. This is on behalf of our program participants. In order to keep our partners, you, better informed, I have directed staff to contact your individual offices to, with regard to providing you with a monthly board packet via email. The board packet includes draft meeting minutes, our staff reports, budget information, along with statistical information on local rents, distribution of vouchers, vacancy rates at our properties, and resident programs. Also, as of July 28th, the complete board packet is available on our website. I have provided the clerk with copies of my business card to ensure that you have correct contact information, and I thank you very much for your time today. Mr. Nye, I just want to say I appreciate you coming and um, that, that gesture of openness in terms of your agenda and all that stuff I think is uh, uh, very appropriate and, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so thank you very much for that. I, I do have two quick questions for you. Um, do you do, do, does the Housing Authority keep uh, statistical information on the residents in terms of any kind of racial breakdown? ethnic breakdown and do, do you keep any statistics on income categories served you know how many people in the lowest very low that could do you, do you keep that that statistical statistical information we do that the uh, to answer your first question no uh, -huh. uh to answer your second question yes we do great and, and that is readily available All right. be happy to share that at any well, time very nice of you come today thank you thank you for having me Yes, it is very nice. Thank you and welcome. Look forward to meeting with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Any, any other uh, speaking requests under public comment? I don't see any. Of course, I didn't see the first one. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. Um, then that concludes the public comment opportunities. We'll move to our board comments. And let's start with Supervisor Zaragoza this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd uh, like to share that last week I attended a retirement for Vicki Swainson. She was one of my secretaries when we had secretaries over at the City of Oxnard. She retired after 32 years of service with the, with the City of Oxnard. And also, I'd like to uh, adjourn in memory of the folks on this list, and I'd like to call out that uh, you probably all read in the paper that last week on the 28th, uh, late Tuesday, the City of Oxnard Mayor Tim Flynn's wife, Julie yeah. Flynn, passed away. She was very young uh, young lady of I think approximately about 48 years she left you know the three young girls and, and her husband and I'd like to show that the rosary will be held at uh, Santa Cruz Church at 323 South East Street in Oxnard uh, the rosary is going to be on Friday August the 7th at 7 p.m. with a mass of resurrection at the church same church on August the 8th at 9 30 a.m. so that's all my comments. okay mm -hmm. yeah our condolences Yes, the, the condolences yeah. to the family. Yeah. That was sad, very sad. Um, Supervisor Bennett, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'd like to ask the board to adjourn in memory of the people on this list. Um, on item uh, 26 that we that uh, I have on the board agenda, it asks for a report back from uh, the CEO by September 15th on emergency preparation. Um, same day that I filed that, Supervisor Long contacted me and said she'd just come from the emergency planning Council and that they are going to have agency-wide um, preparations and presentations ready for the middle of October. So um, I just want to go on record as saying I'd like to modify that. I did. I had no idea they were coming forward or something. But with El Nino coming, it's appropriate to get it. So um, I'd like to just modify this to ask the CEO to coordinate with them. So in mid-October, the CEO coordinates a, a comprehensive presentation on our preparations for El Nino. Um, and then uh, finally, um, I had the real pleasure of attending the Vietnam veteran uh, closing ceremony that they had at the at the museum. Uh, and uh, they asked the families of the fallen Ventura County Vietnam vets to come and receive a uh, resolution, a plaque from the Board of Supervisors. I'm sorry, a certificate from the, from the Board of Supervisors. And um, I just have to tell you, those 
parents, those brothers, those sisters, they were really moved. Uh, and they didn't get proper recognition back at the, back at the day. And um, it, this was a really a real healing thing. George Sandoval created two great films mm -hmm. about the, the experience. And um, these guys talked. I mean, one of the most incredible ones was uh, one of the vets coming back and talking about how uh, veterans of foreign wars wouldn't give him any help because it wasn't a declared war yet. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, those vets went through, uh, you know, the, 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 the horror and the tragedy and the tension of, of war and then didn't go get, you know, get the benefits on the other side of that, or, or I should say not the benefits, but the recognition. Uh, so it was a very good event, and I, I really have a lot of admiration for the people at the museum and George Sandoval and the others that pulled that together. And our Vietnam vets that we recognized here were there, and you could tell it was, it was more than just a normal veteran ceremony. So thank you very much. Very much so. Supervisor Parks. Okay, thank you. Supervisor And that Coy. was all with my mic off. <laughs> we all heard. Yeah, um, Mr. Powers did a wonderful job, and I agree with Supervisor Parks that uh, people coming out, there's a lot of information, but it was pretty clear and absorbed, and, and it really gave people a lot of, wow, I didn't know the county did those things, and it was, it was just good. It was very good. It, so all of yourself presenting and the people helped prepare, it was, uh, it was great, and a lot of his uh, senior leadership was there, so a lot of the people got to meet that, so I think that, that was great. Um, I don't have a, a journal memory, so I'm excited about that. But uh, also, I'm, all of us know uh, Mary uh, Levin Schwabauer. You yes. know she's, you know, she became the uh, grand marshal for the parade. I yeah. mean, for the fair this year is great. And the parade, I think that was yeah. uh, good. You know, realize how long they've been involved with all that stuff. And you, know, I read some of these notes that they were giving me about all the stuff. Well, what about it? You know, goes back to the point where you know, her husband was, you know, you know, president of the fair and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. she, they laid it back to. When her grandparents came, as well when the fair all started back here, and so there's this whole tie with that whole family. Yeah. So it's just great that she's doing that. So just want to say congratulations to her. Yeah, that's wonderful, nice. Wonderful lady. Yeah, Absolutely is. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I have a uh, one person to adjourn in memory of Clementia Sanchez, known as Tina in Camarillo, taught Spanish at Camarillo schools for decades, active with our Pleasant Valley Historical Society was honored as a Doña, a delightful woman. You never talked to Tina that you weren't smiling because she was always just so joyous about her community and and, um, and she loved being a teacher. Um, I'd also like to just call out and recognize our uh, auditor controller, Jeffrey S. Berg, for being recognized as Award for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Um, <clears throat> as we know, this is a um, awarded to our county from the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada. And it is something that to be recognized, this is the 33rd time that we have received this award, but it takes, it takes um, leadership and due diligence and good work by the entire uh, staff of the Auditor Controller's Office to continue to produce excellent reports and get this recognition. So thank you very much for your work on that, Mr. Berg. Um, I'd like to comment, uh, I, I think you all, well, since we are all, uh, the county, a member of NACO, um, we get uh, various uh, releases and information sent to us from NACO. One of the ones that uh, we just received that I just found a very good piece to use for us as we're out talking in the community 
and, and the CEO and the leadership team when you're talking to the community about what is the county's ro ro role in health care. Um, and this um, NACO uh, <coughs> presentation that's available is uh, Medicaid in counties and what's the basics of Medicaid and what is the county's role. 960 counties um, have county supported hospitals. Um, 750 have public health authorities and over 1,500, almost 1,600 have public health uh, departments. And as we, we all know, um, it's a federal entitlement program that again uh, was just uh, celebrated its 50th year. It's the largest source of, source <coughs> of health care coverage in the U.S. covering one-fifth of the population. Um, it is, uh, as I mentioned, it, it covers various areas for services through county nursing homes, through behavioral health and public health. It's the largest source of funding for mental health services in the U.S. and playing an increasing large role in reimbursement of substance use disorder services. And so that's always important to us as we, as those things, as programs like this intersect so many other service areas that we are responsible for. Um, you know, our, our uh, AB 109 and now uh, Proposition 47 and what are we doing to really um, uh, intercept and, and do prevention services. Um, county innovations and Medicaid delivery recognized through this program uh, and as you read some of that you say, well that's us, that's us, we do that. And mm -hmm. it is that having those clinic system in the <laughs> county so there are medical homes that patients have uh, uh, entry to and then that of course the strength of our two county uh, hospital system and um, uh, looking at those primary care services. And it is uh, multidisciplinary care coordination that is becoming the innovation. And again, they, in this particular document, they call out Hennepin County, Minnesota. And as I walked through this, uh, I said, well, that is us. That's what we do, mm -hmm. too. So um, it, it really is a good uh, document. Uh, certainly encourage all of you to, to look at it and, and use pieces of it as you're out talking in the community. So the public really understands the dynamics of what we do in health care, um, uh, what we do and what we're challenged with, and the many things that intersect the many programs that um, uh, uh, come in through our health care system, uh, whether it be by voter initiative or by uh, compassionate care that we provide to all of the folks in our county. And, and that in itself means, or says to me, that sometimes um, uh, we'll, we'll read something or we'll hear something that, you know, the county's fallen down on the job here. And I'll just say to you that um, it, it really is not the questions, it's the questions that um, have not been, not been asked as to, okay, what has the county been doing to ensure that we're providing quality care and, um, and making sure that uh, all of our employees are supported and that we continue to build trust both with our workforce but in the community so they continue to understand uh, and appreciate the services that we deliver. Supervisor Foy and I get to see uh, and hear probably more, uh, more than not, um, uh, whether it's in the oversight meetings or in closed sessions with those oversight meetings, the many challenges and dynamics that we have, again, in um, delivering the care in, in Ventura County. And that care is going to continue to be challenged because the private sector market is is going to look to pull good quality people from our system, offering them bonuses that we can't and don't offer, offering them um, uh, uh, anything they can to bring them over into their system because it's that competitive. And we know in some areas we have shortages of the professional skills uh, that are coming up through either the programs that are uh, that feed into our system through our nursing programs, our academic professionals. Um, our doctors and, and how competitive we have to be to be able to get the specialists we need to keep our system strong. So it, there's never just um, one answer to why there's been uh, a challenge in the system because it is so dynamic. There are many answers and many um, reasons. But the most important one I think for us is to continue to build trust in the system continue to support our workforce, continue to work with our CEO and our leadership team of the healthcare agency and our hospital. And, and when, they, when they say to us, we need to uh, take some stronger steps forward, we need to do X, Y, Z, that we listen closely, 
we're informed and we support them because it's the, it is the way that we'll continue to keep this safety net of services, but this quality um, uh, level of services throughout our healthcare system. So I, I just, I think with uh, reading this about um, uh, Medi-Cal, knowing that the Affordable Care Act has really uh, uh, challenged us and, and, and makes us uh, work stronger and reach higher and, um, and again be really plugged in to what the needs are so we can be um, uh, flexible and, and, and strong in the competition and have quality service. So I, I appreciate the, uh, the work that NACO has done to really put pieces together that we can reach out to the community and talk uh, to them about the, the services that we do provide. So there, that ends that. Supervisor Long, yes. if, if, if I could, um, uh, just would like to point out under my board comments uh, that the, 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 we have the most convoluted, balkanized health delivery system in the world here in the United States. And in this environment, we're challenged with providing you know, this public interest care as a public hospital. Um, and uh, so I just want to compliment uh, that, or, or, or not compliment, I, I want to remind us all that it's just, there's going to be constant challenges because it, it's so dynamic, it's so changing, and it's not, it's not the kind of challenge that's faced by people providing medical care in most other industrial countries where they have a much more logical delivery system and they can focus their energy just on the medicine. Here, you spend as much time trying to figure out what's the, what's the combination of funding sources that's going to get you this, and all of a sudden the funding sources change and then you have this competition between the privates and the publics and the privates then change what they do. and they change. You spend more time on the non-medicine side of medicine right, um, to be able to deliver. And so um, I just, I appreciate you and Supervisor Foy, you serve on that oversight committee in terms of what you're trying to do. I appreciate NACO in terms of what they're trying to do. And from time to time, we have to remind everybody, it is remarkable to do, to do, to, to deliver good service in, in, in spite of what people would say. I mean, across the board, Private doctors that work in private hospitals tell me the same thing. Everybody says the same thing. The system is broken and everybody's trying to figure out how to, but the only people saying the system isn't broken are the insurance companies up at the top, right? That almost everybody else is saying it's broken. You know, private doctors, you used to, you know, have a very different view of that and said, leaves now they say the system is completely broken also. So congratulations uh, yeah. for, 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 tra for working, I guess, working hard in the environment. They're, Thank you. Well, and and that uh, that continues. Um, one one last thing I'd like to comment on um, on Saturday I attended and the CEO was there and others of our healthcare team, um, the American Cancer Society gala, and I only raise that because the sheriff is in the audience and he was our MC that evening. He did such a fabulous job. It was a very wonderful gala, raised uh, good money for our local American Cancer Society, and um, uh, was very much appreciated. Thanks for your role there, Sheriff. Other duties as assigned, or asked. <laughs> okay, um, CEO. Thank you, Chair Long. Board members, just a couple of quick items, and following on to your comments on uh, healthcare, and just wanted to give you an update on the uh, OR nurses at uh, VCMC. So, uh, as you uh, alluded to, Supervisor Long, the, uh, the local market here in healthcare changes very quickly, you know, and you can see when you already have a shortage of specialty nurses, particularly OR nurses, and then other hospitals, you know, are aggressive in recruiting them with sign-on bonuses of three to 5,000, that can have a, an immediate impact. And so a couple things have happened. Uh, we responded in a couple days with a market-based premium that your board supported uh, for the full-time regular nurses. And then next week, we are bringing uh, a similar market-based premium adjustment for the per diem nurses. That will also help with uh, the circulating nurses there. It will help with staffing because it's a, it's a compensation issue, but it's also a staffing issue. And that compensation, of course, will help uh, bring that uh, staffing up to where it, where it needs. Uh, some other issues that they raised, uh, the OR nurses that is, uh, they requested, uh, because of the intensity of some of the trauma cases uh, and the need to respond very quickly and you know, within 15 minutes and so forth to the OR and be ready for surgery, 
Uh, they'll ask for it to have a sleep room nearby, and that has already been provided, as I understand it. Um, as well, we are also providing uh, some additional HR, human resources positions, to HCA so we can expedite uh, nurse staffing. And then approximately two dozen other uh, nurses in, in the specialty areas, such as ICU, have already been added in the last uh, few weeks. So uh, working very closely with Barry Fisher, uh, Kim Milstein, and, and Catherine Rodriguez uh, on these issues on uh, almost a daily basis. So. Uh, a lot of good uh, responses happening, a lot of good dialogue, uh, regular dialogue with the nurses. Uh, do, thanks for the comment on the state of the county. I did one in Thousand Oaks, but also did one for our county managers here uh, locally on Friday, and uh, really appreciate uh, a lot of information, as you said, uh, Supervisor uh, Foy and, and Parks. Really appreciate the department heads helping with that. And we've got 26 departments, so it's a lot of information to try to bring together, and also especially our uh, senior leadership, uh, Matt Carroll, Paul Dursey, and Catherine Rodriguez for helping put a lot of those uh, slides together. And then we also did some things, uh, a little bit of high tech, because we're, we're a high tech county, so we wanted to show that off a little bit. We had a drone fly in here as I shared that video with you, showing a camel with real time <coughs> images on the uh, screens right here. Uh, and uh, also did a demonstration on, for employment, employee wellness of, of a real time survey. And the program is called pollanywhere.com. Uh, and so folks could text in as they were sitting there. You could see the results of their answers on the screen real time. And that's pretty slick. So uh, if you're interested in that, you can just uh, contact our office and we'll give you the, the link to that. But that takes folks uh, to do that. And I really want to thank uh, Mike Pettit, Gabe Ramirez from Public Works, and some of our IT folks, some of the folks in the booth, Jim Sabo, Larry Bia, and Doug Cook. Uh, so a lot of folks to put that together. So that was with texting, not with like a special device, which you no, see sometimes. No, people oh. just with their phones. Just text right there. Yeah, even I could do it. It was <laughs> shocking. Yeah. I also had the pleasure of meeting last week with the State Director of Child Support Services. Uh, she's new. She's from New Jersey, very innovative and dynamic. And uh, she is visiting each of the 58 counties. I really commend her for doing that. So I met with her and Debbie Fromm, and she was very complimentary. I, I had the pleasure of sitting with her, but I want to share it <laughs> with all of you, too. Uh, she just was very complimentary about the, you know, we've heard it before, the collaborative effort of uh, county departments and your board with that, uh, with her department, the support that, that she gets, and also the innovative program that Child Support Services has and the very effective call center, which I think is ranked number one in the state. So it was just a very, very good uh, interaction with her. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. That concludes the comment times on the agenda. We'll move now to our regular agenda and see what we can get accomplished here in the next 15 minutes. Item 29, Supervisor Bennett. Thank you, Thank you very much. So, turned on here. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned um, a few minutes ago in my comments, uh, yes. with uh, the reports getting more and more uh, convincing or there, as scientists are becoming more and more convinced that we're going to have a strong El Nino and the temperatures are warmer than normal. Uh, it seems to make sense to uh, get this report and uh, good to hear that our planning agencies, our emergency planning agencies were meeting and already planning on doing this also. So this would just be direction for the CEO to coordinate that report. Uh, I think these reports are better when they're coordinated by the CEO's office in terms of them coming back. So uh, with the modification in terms of when, uh, just leave it to the CEO uh, whenever it is appropriate in October. Um, but I would point out that it's possible that uh, with the El Nino, things may come sooner than uh, um, sooner than, than than normal. So hopefully we'll get this before. I do have quite a few questions from people up in Ojai. What are we going to do if we get cut off? They traditionally get cut off when these big floods hit, um, and so I just want to make sure that we're prepared to be able to answer those questions. So um, that'd be my motion to direct the CEO to coordinate that report uh, when it comes back. You know, it'd be interesting um, is to see. If there's any water agencies out there that are going to be doing something to collect all that rainwater <laughs> that's anticipated, well, I would hope so. a report to hear back yeah. on too. <coughs> okay, we have a motion and a second on that. Uh, Super, Mr. CEO, anything? Uh, just to mention that I met with uh, just Kevin McGowan uh, last week and I've spoken to the sheriff, and they are well underway in terms of planning uh, for flood protection yeah. during uh, El Nino. So. Yeah. Uh, look forward to working with them and, and supporting. Thanks. And, and but the levees also are going to be very important over. The, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, over Oxnard and Del Rio and 
and up in Piru yeah. and I don't Yeah, I heard and also roads and everybody else is all looking at hard and all that. They've been doing that kind of yeah. stuff, so that's mm -hmm. good. It's kind of hard to imagine in the middle of this major drought. That's right. Yeah, it is. Okay, well, there, that's a motion, second, that was approved. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so item 30 moves to uh, 1030. So then we have item 31. Public hearing regarding adoption of the amended MOA with Venturi County Deputy Sheriff's Association. Ms. Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair Long, members of the board, CEO Powers. For the record, my name is Catherine Rodriguez, Assistant CEO and Labor Relations Director. The item before you today is a recommendation for your board to commence public hearings for the adoption of the amendment of the 2014-18 amended uh, memorandum of agreement between the County of Ventura and the Ventura County Deputy Sheriff's Association. The item will also be placed on next week on your August 11, uh, 2015 um, board meeting and for the second public hearing and the final adoption. For your background, there are uh, 211 deputy sheriffs that are actually assigned at the patrol services and about 235 uh, deputy sheriffs at the detention uh, services. Currently, newly hired deputies spend uh, seven to eight years at assignment at the de detention services, specifically at the custody. Prior to rotating to the patrol services, while other local jurisdictions have lesser or no uh, requirement for them uh, to, to be um, at the detention services. The longer waiting period uh, at uh, custody lessens the opportunities of performing uh, diverse assignments, thus creating a risk in uh, recruiting and retaining the deputies. During FY 2015, um, actually on May, there were three of them uh, that were lost to competitors and about seven uh, during 2015. Um, <clears throat> because to competitors and um, in order to mitigate these losses, um, the Ventura County Deputy Sheriff's Office plans to implement a new program to uh, rotate this uh, deputy sheriffs sooner to the um, patrol services. And that is by um, the reducing the time that they spend for other detention services from seven to eight years to four years, and as, as well as increasing the numbers of the deputies to be assigned or rotated out to the patrol services from uh, 25 uh, deputies to 50 annually. Currently, deputy sheriffs assigned to the patrol services receive a $60 um, payment for mail periods that are subject to calls. Their proposed amendment will allow the uh, deputy sheriffs that are directly assigned from patrol services to detention services for those 12-hour shift deputy sheriffs to continue to receive the $60. This will um, allow them to, again, go there sooner and uh, uh, to incentivize them for uh, to volunteer and participate into this new rotation plan. Uh, the approximate cost for this is approximately $50,000 annually. Uh, the item also was reviewed by a civil service commission and it was determined that there's no adverse impact on our uh, personal rules and regulation. Um, with that, I'd like to thank your board and uh, CEO Powers for your continued support and as well as uh, Jeff Berg himself and the county council and the labor team in coordinating this item. Uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, that be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Um, we do have some questions and I will also open the public hearing on this just so it is open now. Yes, yeah, Supervisor. Any questions? Just comments. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't have any public speaking request on this item, so I'll close the public hearing and now open the comments, Supervisor Foy. Well, thank you. I, I, this is great. I, you know, I appreciate the sheriff and everybody working together to get these guys rotating out and to make this work. And somebody said, "What's well, going to cost fifty thousand dollars?" First of all, these guys already had this money; it was what they're used to having. I think it's great. We spend a whole lot more money on that turnover, and these people leaving and losing really good officers that we've trained and learned. To, you know, so. I think it's a good thing to do. I'm glad it happened quickly and glad to see this happen because I'm, I know a lot of uh, those young guys around, you know, people around, you know, 21, 22. I'd love to do the sheriff. So it's, it's a great organization. I just don't want to spend, you know, 10, eight or 10 years in the jail. So I think you're doing the right thing and this is really good. So 
glad you guys all worked it out and, and Rick and everybody got it, got it done. So congratulations for making that happen. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to, wanted to compliment the sheriff uh, for the process. Uh, he explained the process that they followed to get to this point and um, the c collaborative work with the unions and everybody else. But they, 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 they had a problem. Too many, too many years in, in the jail, and I appreciated the process that they followed to come up with a recommendation so our team then had something, uh, when you went to negotiate, that uh, had already been vetted and, and through the process. So my compliments. Other comments? Supervisors? Um, I certainly agree. certainly agree with those comments. It's something I think we've heard years that the, the officers really, really, they want to get out there and do their community good service work and um, so it, this is an excellent uh, negotiated agreement so appreciate it um, mr. powers you keep pushing that button go ahead. yep <laughs> just just to let you know that I don't know if you saw it, but there was a very good article in the star today uh, about sort of the dynamics uh, of the situation the need for the change so, yeah. I saw the okay then it is before us and this is again to take our first action on it and set the Second public hearing for August 11th. So we have a motion and a second. Please vote. And that's approved <coughs> unanimously. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Set the Everybody. second public hearing. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you. All right, that completes item 31. Our correspondence agenda 32 and 33. Shall we act on those? receive and file we have a motion and a second please vote and that is approved now we have six minutes supervisor you wish to do the addendum item 34 happy to do the addendum item 34 okay. uh, this is a recommendation that uh, we go ahead and establish a board policy for notification regarding controversial agenda items and I think you might have a PowerPoint which uh, just establishes what I mean by the definition of what is a controversial agenda item. And then I thought, well, we probably also need a definition of, uh, uh, let, let's first do this one. The definition of a controversial agenda item, I uh, put down four points, a substantive change to our county policies, an issue that has generated considerable public input or outcry, an issue that Max or other advisory, Ventura County advisory boards have considered and sent recommendations to our board, and a demonstrable impact to a group of residents or businesses such as traffic, lights, noise, view shed, impacts uh, like uh, also increased uh, costs, for example, or new costs, and ooh, I'll have to hold off. I'll give a copy to our, uh, our county clerk. I do have some. Here you go. I'll pass this down. Oh. Board clerk, excuse me. Here's some more. Um, the reason why I'm putting this forward is because we have had situations where the public has wanted to provide input on something and uh, were caught unaware that it was coming forward. It also is a and kind of a, a courtesy heads up for our, our staff and supervisors uh, when uh, an item, a, a controversial item is coming forward. Uh, providing information or news that uh, something hits our agenda on Thursday and for the following Tuesday often is a pretty short notice when it is a controversial item. So um, when uh, is there another slide which I put together at the last minute? So, yes. I think we also need to define what is time sensitive because it's controversial items that are uh, otherwise would, come, would go within two weeks on our advanced calendar. If not, uh, if it's time sensitive, they'd be excused from that. And by time sensitive, I mean to meet a specific time frame or deadline, such as contractual, fiscal, legal, or legislative. And I know that this uh, is something that we've heard from, as I've mentioned, the public over uh, many different kinds of issues, but just the idea that we have the ability, we have a advanced calendar, 
There's a copy of it. It's the tentative board calendar, and it lists the items that are coming on following board meetings. And it's each board meeting is listed. Uh, we're in August 4th now, so this is this, but we also have August 11th. So this would be a, a requirement then, and I'd like to have it instituted immediately and then fold it into the um, administrative manual when we next do <coughs> an update of that. Now, open up to questions, and if there. Okay, board members, questions yeah. on this item? Um, uh, Supervisor, I appreciate uh, you bringing this. I think uh, we've talked about this before. This is a great opportunity. And at the, uh, the state of the county in uh, Thousand Oaks, we heard some people make this comment that it's hard sometimes if something comes out on a Thursday afternoon and for them to maybe catch that and cease Friday and then try to figure out what it's about and, and then Monday they're there, they can't get a hold of people at the county because things are, it, it, it just, I agree with you. And, and things that change policy, we're not talking, I think you're not talking about just our normal contracts to come up on our normal things. It's these things that have an impact on the community or changes of policy that, oh, we've been doing it this way, well, why, what, what do I have to understand? How's it gonna affect my, my, my home or where I live in my neighborhood or my business or something? Or I think that's, that's a great idea. Um, it would also be at the point of, if we even had the opportunity with some of these that are really big to schedule them at even in an evening sometime when people really could get there because they want to talk. I know so many people tell me, oh, I'd be grateful to heard about it. I'd be great if you could have done it at night when I could hear it, you know. I'm not talking about a lot of things, but, but I do appreciate what you're doing here, and I, I think it's the right thing to, to do is to get, we're supposed to serve the public, and the, a lot of things that affect them, they don't get an opportunity to talk on. So I think it's your, what you're, where you're going is, is right with this. So it's just defining what is um, that substantive change. Because we don't want to be in a position that we're trying to mm -hmm. take away, you know, our CEO's and his ability to manage his his business organization. We're not trying to do that. We're talking about really policy issues, right? right? Yeah, that's and if you could about. go back to that previous slide, because I'm am just talking about controversial items, and I think if we're making a substantive change to a county policy, that's that is something that the public needs to know about. It's not something just to push in on a, on a Thursday to find out about Tuesday. Or, uh, as I mentioned, sometimes we have Max or other, it doesn't say, but it would be Ventura County Advisory Boards that have written letters to us. I mean, that's, they've heard the case, um, and they need to know when it's going to be presented, and I think the public wants to know. The two-week advance notice also provides, you know, the ability for transparency, and I really think if more people know about items that they can weigh in on, we, as Board of Supervisors will make better decisions. It's really, to me, just a, a kind of a no-brainer, good government um, transparency uh, effort. And I'd like to be able to see that we can put this forward. Comment? Yes. Yeah, questions. Um, questions? Supervisor Long, under your definition of controversial items, does is it any one of these four things, or does it require that it's all four of these things? That's for Supervisor Parks. I mean, Supervisor Parks. It would be any of those items it, would qualify. Any of Sometimes those items. Sometimes you have an item that does all four. It's true. But if it, but if it's any one of these things, it qualifies as a controversial item. Correct. Right. Okay. And um, so, so this is something you believe strongly in that we should follow as policy. Oh yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So would 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 you say that the policy that you're bringing in front of us right now? Is a substantive change to county policy? No, I think it's. Oh, well, this isn't a substantive change to county policy. Do you think it is? Then yes. And I guess there, there we go. I mean, what, what is the, what is the definition of a substantive change in county policy? If, mm -hmm. if, you know, do you think this is not a substantive? Change? We've never had this as a policy mm -hmm. to do this two weeks in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, this has all kinds of implications. For example, does this mean that? the staff report of every item has to come out two weeks in advance because, for example, the sidewalk item that we have in front of us right mm -hmm. now, I received a, a report from staff last Monday. Now, in it, it had things that then were a concern for me. And are we saying that 
staff has to get the report to us two weeks in advance because yeah, that's, otherwise that's the, I can't make yeah. a I, I can't I can't make a public policy reaction mm -hmm. to this. The answer is no. I wouldn't expect the staff to have to put a report or you to put a report. This is just to put it on the agenda, and the staff item on sidewalks was on the agenda. That's why you knew about it and asked for it, right? Because well, it was. It's on the, um, I mean, tentative calendar. So it's not a report. It's just let people know about it. And do you think it is, um, you know, something that if you'd like, we could wait and see if the public wants to know about it, and we'll, you know, give it a, I'll put it on the, uh, happy to put it on the advanced calendar, and we'll wait for a couple of weeks. But to me, this is, you know, that's, um, this to me is not a major change in policy. Our policy for the county should be transparency. It should be openness, and this is something that is uh, administrative, but will allow for openness. But if you think it's well, substantive, I think that's definitely happy to put it on the, this again. But I, I see the most important feature here is that we're going to get transparency and not have people surprised by different agenda uh, items. You'll find no elected official that will argue against transparency or, or uh, uh, you know, having the public be able to, to be involved. There's, the question is, how do you accomplish that? And we already see just this first example. What is the definition of a controversial agenda item? And you say this change is not a substantive change to county policy. I, well, I, well, I, I can't. Sure I can't. Controversial, though. I don't, what's it, that? It wouldn't be controversial because it's not taking away anything from anybody. It's not changing anybody's life. All it's doing here is moving what we already do to just more more time, so it's not controversial. Well, here, I, I, I just love this discussion. Yeah. You're saying it's not controversial, even though you say it is a substantive change. Well, no, no, I, I agree. That's that, that's what you're saying. Remember, a controversial item. I mean, it, it's not controversial in the sense. It, is it a substantive change? It's a change. Is it a substantive change? Well, I, I, I guess <laughs> to me it wouldn't be substantive uh, at all I, to that. I it, mean, it, because it, right it, right it, now we, you could put something I, out. Right now, you can here, put a here, here's our here's our current policy. Okay. All right, um, so, 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 here, here's our current policy. If somebody says this item is not ripe to be heard by the board today, on any item and for any reason, whether it's because it's controversial, people haven't had time, um, whether it's the supervisor needs more time. Oftentimes, we have that happen. Supervisor says, "I need more time with this item." If for any reason. All, when, when we're at agenda review, somebody makes that request, and if three supervisors agree, then the item gets delayed. And that's, that is the policy we have to, to, to try to do that. We can do that with any item at this point in time. But for us to adopt a policy where we're going to argue constantly over what's substantive, what's controversial, um, you, we, 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 we will open ourselves up. Uh, and then it, then it leads to the next argument, which is how can somebody respond if the policy that like sidewalks, if the policy, if we don't get the policy proposal until less than two weeks before, right. how can we put a change to the policy right. because we don't like what is coming forward, right. forward? So then you have to have staff have the report two weeks in advance. And you're saying you don't want the staff to have the report two weeks in advance. You, I did you, not you, say you, that. Mr. Bennett, you asked me, am I saying that everyone has to have a report out? I'm doing this to see that the public has a heads up. And I'll be glad to strike the first bullet mark, and we'll just go ahead and say it's a controversial item that has generated considerable public outcry or input. It's an issue we've received letters from, from our advisory boards, or it's making a demonstrable impact to a group of residents or businesses, including environmental impacts or increased costs. So, just uh, I, I'd be happy. I'm not, to I'd even take out. Why did you add to the word you said that issue that has or would generate? Because there's a lot of things people don't know it's coming. How? But I, but I agree with you. I think that staff report should be out two weeks in advance for sure, because people should have time to understand what this is. And I mean, if you're going to change people's lives like that, they should have time to. Say, hey guys, what do you think? What do you think? I don't know. It just I guess I heard about it. it's going to happen tomorrow, and I mean okay. that's that's not right. For so people. so uh, if so if you think staff's report should come out two weeks in advance, yeah. is that a substantive change in our county I'm policy? I'm going to strike. Is that, that substantive? Is that, is, I know you're going to. We're having a conversation. Then, if that gives you so much is, concern, is, is that a substantive change? Yeah, I, I, if you, if you it, well, I don't. It I don't, is. It's, it's changed. I don't know if it's substantive because they're just putting the report out now. I don't even know when those reports come. Mm -hmm. I mean, the staff could have said we had this report. We're going to put it on the. In, in four weeks, so they already had the report, and we're just going to put it up. Well, 
because I know a lot of this stuff circulates through the whole county, and it can be circulated for weeks before, I think you, Brian, is that probably correct, or Mike, it recirculates for weeks before it gets to the board agenda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, weeks. So I mean, the reports are already done, so I'm not sure it changes much there. Well, I mean, there may be tweaks at the end that maybe get adjusted. So it would be a substantive change if we wanted the reports two weeks in advance. If we don't have the reports two weeks in advance, then I don't know how we can, as supervisors, respond um, to, to that. And I, and if I just we, don't understand if, why you would want, why you just have a hard time was telling the public, hey, we're going to make it it's so much more opportunity for you to see this I, stuff. I, I mean, I, I mean that's I, what I'm saying. I, I, I it don't, seems like you're arguing that I, issue, I, I, and oh, I don't I, think you're trying to I argue don't, that I don't argue that issue. I said everybody's in favor of more yeah. transparency. The question is, how do you accomplish what is appropriate uh, transparency and have county government function, et cetera? I'll, I'll tell you, how could you, if two weeks is good, why not four? Uh, uh, what, what is the definition? It, you just, we have a policy, and if any one of these three bullet points that are now remaining in in the in the policy that supervisor mm -hmm. parks yes. and any one of those three come up any any supervisor could sit there and say I would like this item delayed for two weeks so yeah. that the public can do this that etc yeah. and th two other board members agree and the item can be and the item well, can be delayed. Delayed. but under under what you're trying to say is it gets to us on a day like today and we have to vote to say oh, it's controversial we want to do that and then all the people, have, if whoever's tried to come, and then see people I've heard about, that be, that's what we're trying to get rid of. We're just trying to make it as forward out there as possible where the people have the opportunity to say, I hear this is coming, great. Let's ask the max, let's ask the locals. What's the farmer say? What's the business guy say? What's the homeowner say? And that's not a bad thing. The, the, I, and, I, I don't, I just, and I think we're only saying policy issues. We're not talking contractual issues. We're not talking, it's just policy issues. Or you could say all policy issues that have a substantive change, all policy issues. And I don't even know if controversial, it doesn't have to be controversial, maybe a policy issue that's, um, we would like to do whatever, it's not really controversial, it's gonna be really good, the whole people should know about what's changed. I mean, okay. I guess I'm just more open to, why can't the people have the opportunity to understand and don't, have it don't, as much don't, as don't object to that at all. I just think we have what, what, is, it, what, what, is, what is being proposed this for is, us, what is being proposed yeah. for us is, 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 I give you I give you all kinds of examples in terms of it at a minimum this is, this is, has not been you know has not been vetted properly which follows the the very issue you know that that is being raised what if we say hey we're going to put this item on but we don't know what it is that staff is going to have in terms of their policy we're not going to so say it because staff has to have it we don't we don't know whether it's controversial or not people still don't know until the staff report comes out whether hey do i want to show up for this item or not well right. it depends on what the staff report says 100% so agreed. then that would be the staff report needing to come out two weeks in advance for for everybody to do that we want we want to go with that policy but let's do it we, we need to find a way to do it across the board because it just shows how we had a definition of controversial agenda items, and already Supervisor Parks is saying, oh, yeah, we can change the first one. Substantive change is not, does not make it a controversial item. A minute ago, we were getting ready to vote, or she was proposing that we vote and say any substantive change of policy is a controversial agenda item. And now, within seconds, we've changed that. It, it is, it is, I just find a way to do it, and I'm happy to have, but it's well, got to apply across the board, if, if I or might else you're not going to be able to... Well, I, you know, I'd, I'd rather, if I'm going to err, I'd rather err on the public getting as much information as possible than us coming back and say, oh, we, maybe we can change it later, I, I, or adjust it. It's not going to be changed, it's made adjustments. I, I agree, but don't make it vague. And I'm just, my point is, this is vague. Right. Like, I agree, why, but don't I make agree. it vague. We'll take off the first bullet point, because we just had a discussion of what is substantive. <laughs> I think, you know, that we have have the uh, we have a policy of transparency and I don't think this is a substantive change by saying great let's go ahead and put it on our events calendar when something's controversial but because it is of discussion right now and and there's conflicting uh, opinions I would get rid of that let's be very specific so we have the other three bullet points and I would move for those because they are specific now we do have a um, an opportunity as members of the Board of Supervisors to say, hey, this is controversial. I think there's people that want to weigh in on it. Let's continue it, as you suggested. I've this been is, here eight years, but that really doesn't do happen now. much, though. But the problem with that is that if we don't hear from the public, how do we know that it is something that they, weigh, they want to weigh in on? You know, I, I feel like if they knew it was coming on the agenda, that gives them an opportunity to weigh in on it. 
uh, on the calendar, rather. So I, I'm surprised to see uh, such concern of putting something that, you know, we've received letters from our MACs, we've received from our advisory boards, we know this is going to make an impact, we're adding cost to residents. Uh, real specific, I think, and I think we can, you know, just ask that they be put on the advanced calendar. I don't see where that is something to object. Okay, I'm, um, okay, Supervisor Zaragoza, I'd like to ask that we um, hold this and we have further discussion after we do our time certain items because I, I think there's more discussion uh, that we should have on this. Um, okay. uh, it's, it's an example of how, um, uh, as, as a board, we often have things that come before us that sometimes from the dais we're amending, uh, even though it's been on the advanced calendar since, let's say, October. We have a calendar that is advanced, um, and, and yet at the board, and these are things that we as supervisors in our respective areas of serving the public with transparency and open um, government um, that we all track, that we all work issues, that we all are communicating with our constituency. And yet we know there have been times from the dais we will amend something. Is that a substantive change? Does that have a consequence to a particular group? And is it, um, and we know that we have the dynamics in our community of having uh, advocates who are passionate on all sides of issues. So is it um, an advocate on this side of an issue that, that then becomes a um, considerable public input and outcry or is it on the other side of an issue or a third side? That in itself has more discussion to be had. Supervisor Zaragoza. Yeah, I, I just want to share too that I'm very uh, transparent with my, with my constituency. For example, at the MAC, any time that we're going to have a big project that is going to impact the El Rio area, whether it's from offshore, whether it's from the county, I always bring those issues to the to the MAC. I've been working uh, very diligently too with the SICA people over at the Channel Islands Harbor on some of the projects that they, that are going up. In the, for example, Fisherman's Wharf, and um, I will notify the uh, the uh, residents there that the big items coming up so they can have input. I um, I believe. Um, what we ought to do here is probably uh, continue this item so we can talk for, for a future as opposed to trying to, to solve this. We just got this information today, you know, and maybe continue it and, and talk with more, uh, more time in, in the future whether to, we continue with this definition of, of a controversial agenda item. So I, I'm very transparent with my, the, my people that I represent, in fact, for the whole county for that matter. And I think it's important that Yes, you know, the residents need to have that information, and I try to provide that to information to to my, the residents that I represent. And I think it's uh, being transparent is extremely important, and letting the people know what's happening is extremely important. But I, that would be my recommendation is to continue this item because it's, there is um, a lot of controversy over this item. <laughs> I'm Thank sorry it, that it, it <laughs> would be considered controversial yeah. because to me it's just, uh, and I, I agree with you, my, my Macs, uh, they have taken positions on things and uh, they only meet once a month sometimes, right? So you can't tell them, uh, it's, you know, at least give them a two-week notice so they, if they want to, they could hold a meeting, for example. So it just, uh, it kind of uh, has the effect of, of Eliminating a voice. We had I one, I know the mayor pro tem is here, we had one big item, uh, the wagon wheel development that's going to impact El Rio tremendously. So we had that come up before the MAC board and we had representatives from the city and et cetera, et cetera, and, and that worked out, you know. That, and that's their role. It's yeah. there, there to advise us mm -hmm. on issues of land use. And I also yeah. think that the supervisors in our role, um, we work very closely with our constituency right. group. Mm -hmm. And we are probably um, uh, char charged with and challenged with making sure that mm -hmm. our public um, both sees, uh, engages, has the transparency of access to information and, um, and timeliness of acting on information. One of the biggest complaints that I hear is that, the, that, the, that government's too slow that these items don't get to the agenda fast mm -hmm. enough, that these items take too long, that we continue things too often, that we, you know, um, that we get bogged down in our own mm -hmm. process. And supervisor, mm -hmm. you, I know you've heard that because I've heard you say that. 
Um, when you said we have, one of the things this board does at the beginning of January is that we set our calendar. And we've reduced our meetings. So is that access? Is that providing good, strong public um, access to the board when we reduce meetings every year? And we have reduced our meeting calendar. And we also moved to having a meeting in, in the evening in our districts as requested by board members. Mm -hmm. You'll want to meet, set a meeting, put it on the calendar so we go out in the evening. We have, we have improved our technology to provide access to the public to every component of county government so that there's access. We have excellent PIO work coming out of the CEO's office that's putting even more information out there about what does county government do, which is all linked to mm -hmm. both our agendas, to our offices, to the other technology in areas of, of um, animal services, public health. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we always have at the dais three votes and it moves, it moves the item. So I don't think, I just have not seen where we have been disingenuous to the public. And I think by saying you're, you're saying we want more transparency, you're implying that we're not being transparent. And I think this is the most transparent board in the 19 years I've served that, that we have. And it is because of leadership of the CEO, all of the county managers, the fact that we continue to, um, to really hear items out and have I think some, in some cases, very um, healthy, most cases, very healthy board discussion. So we either have to act on this now. Here's, here's the thought. I, we either act on this now or we hold it off until 2.30 because we know this is tied to the 2.30 item or we continue it until we feel like we're up to hearing it again. Madam Chair, I just want to share one more thing. I really, I want to share this in public. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the MAC, Unel Rio because we want to be transparent, we want to give them as much time as possible. The seek over at the Channel Islands Harbor and also the lessees, you know, because they need all that information to, to give us an input on, on what's going to be uh, built and what's going to happen in their neighborhoods. But I, I want to share with you that I want to be as transparent as I can, and, and I will. So. Well, you just have to wonder, how is the public going to know if something that uh, on Thursday is going to add, a, for example, a cost to them, it's going to be voted on on Tuesday. Um, my Somas Mac, for example, um, they have no idea and they've got a whole sidewalk project coming forward. We, it just, to me, it, it gives people the opportunity to see something's coming down the line, something that's been contemplated, it's there. Uh, um, it, and well, Supervisor, we, was and, your... And, and there was, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. But I, you know, I'll I, interrupt I'll, you. I agree. You know, um, I, I would say let's go ahead and hear this with our 230 items. I, and I, 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 I disagree. It's tied to sidewalks. This to me wasn't no, sidewalk. It, it I thought it was doesn't. more of we hear it from people out here come, can't you give us more time? Then Mike goes out and does another thing and people are asking, hey, love all this stuff, but can you give us more time so we can understand that people ask? Us? I mean, we're saying this, but that's what the public is telling us. I mean, you know, it's not, right. that's it, what they're saying. We hear it all, all the time. We just heard about this thing. Can you give us more time to understand well, it? Supervisor, we yes. hear also all the time that, you know, you, you guys take too long to do well, things. Remember, the process does, but I'm just talking about once the process is done, it's just getting this to them. That, that's right. the key. I mean, think about how many things just happened instantly and how many people have come and complained in the last six months or eight months or done different things they didn't hear about. And that's all we're saying. It's not specific to sidewalks. I mean, one yeah, of my MAC to. members from Santa Rosa mm -hmm. Valley, um, you know, uh, just looking at the agenda, saw this item and said, heck yes, you know, let's let's have that. And uh, it's just... Uh, I will notify my consider my email if we have, a, a, we consider it a controversial yeah. item. Supervisor, People haven't seen a lot of stuff that comes before this board. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think we should, I don't think there's any chance that at 2.30 we're going to be uh, at a point where we're going to be ready to adopt this policy. Uh, we, you're, hearing, you know, you're hearing all kinds of things. Let me just offer uh, these observations. One, we're dropping the first bullet point, a substantive change in county policy, because it's too controversial. <laughs> you know, it's a definition of controversial ag agenda item, and it's and it's being dropped because it's it's it, it is it is too controversial. No, it's because the it's, second thing, it's not the second defined. thing, please, please, we don't interrupt you, and I, I don't interrupt you ever, and I, I'd like to not be interrupted. Second, um, we have the we what's being raised here is well, how are the MACs going to get this on their agenda, or uh, the issue of how's the public if it's if 
if it comes up on Thursday, going to know about the item on Tuesday. That applies to all kinds of items that a public that the public's going to ask that won't meet whatever definition we write there. So if we want to address the issue of the public needing more time, then we should address it across the board because we have no idea which items somebody's going to say, I needed more time for that. And if we wanted to say it's got to be ready for the MAC, we're not going to, uh, we're going to have to give them a lot more time because you're going to find Max saying, well, we couldn't pull a special meeting. It was the middle of the summertime, so we need a month's notice. So I'm happy to constantly look at how we can do more transparency. And I think that you find some of us resenting the implication that we don't care about transparency. We do. What I don't want to do is create vagueness. And there's no question that we don't have the approach so I don't think it makes sense for us to engage in a second conversation of this at 2.30. Uh, I think we should vote on this right now. Um, and um, I, I, I would make the motion to reject uh, this uh, recommended policy um, uh, at, at this point in time. So do you see any benefit of putting controversial items on our advanced calendar? I, I see a lot of benefit. I see. Do you want to find I a way to I, do that? I see benefits instead to, of rejecting this out of hand. I see benefits of, about lots of changes. This doesn't reject any changes, any other changes. But you put a specific policy with a specific definition up there, and uh, in, in, in you have the, and you want and your and your request was that it be, take effect immediately, which then would affect the two thirty item that, that we're doing today. Oh no, it wasn't If you intended. wanted, if you want to deal with, uh, uh, if, if you want to deal. With the that. Item. If, if, if you want to deal with, yeah. with that, that's fine. But you have a specific policy that I don't think we're ready to vote on uh, in terms of, uh, of any possibility that it passes then. So I think we should end that. And then I'm happy to have address the issue Supervisor Foy is talking about. He wants people to not be surprised, I mean, to, to, to get items and have more time. I'm for more time. That's fine. I just am not willing to commit us to having one supervisor go, oh, that's a, that meets the definition of controversial. You won't even be able to make an amendment to a motion because if the amendment is viewed as controversial, you would say, oh, no, you've got to hold that amendment for two. That's, the, this policy is not workable. I'm happy to have some other policy. So well, then I, I, I would ask that instead of just killing it, um, let's see how we can put controversial items, known controversial items, on our advanced calendar which you said you wouldn't have an objection to. I, I've, I've and made I think, my you know, motion. This, 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 me, this was not the appropriate way to bring this. So. The motion you made is not the motion that is up on there now. It's a, it's a motion to reject right? that motion. Are we allowed to do that? I mean, it's a I rejection. It's a motion, motion to reject to deny the, the action. To, to deny the action, the request. Here. Yes, that's that a proper motion, but I, is there, I haven't heard a second. Is there a second? Can I, There's a motion and a second to deny the recommended yeah, action. Yeah, we can, we can bring, a, we can bring another item later on that talks about, bring, about extending the time. We can time. bring any other items on this. For, it's just this weeks. specific policy. Is. And at all times, you, we, can, we as a board can ask the CEO to uh, delay something, to work on something that we need more time on it. Or That's continue. always been the process. I'm concerned that um, a government to be efficient and effective for the constituents and the and the residents and the community. Um, we we have done all things I've already noted. I think we need to move ahead here and um, take care of the rest of the business. And please vote on the motion to deny. That's a good opportunity to give the people an opportunity to know in advance on controversial that, items. That uh, right action now, passes three to two, so it fails. Um, the recommendation is denied at this time. Certainly can come back in any other fashion that supervisors wish to bring it back. Um, sorry for the delay. Um, we're going to go quickly Unless to you're our not with the majority vote, then you can't bring it back as you far know, as that using it for the, this. So it I mean, can come back we'll in another form. You. you will have to do it, though. <laughs> no, it. it can come back you could bring back. Form. You just can't bring that policy back that is clearly... You can put controversial items on the oh, board calendar. You can't bring your definition item. of controversial items back. Okay, then I can come back again without that definition. Is that right? 
work the item however you wish to, Supervisor. Okay. We, anybody, any supervisor can work this item any way they want in terms of okay. transparency. Thank you. Takes three votes. All right, item 930, we're going to try and do this, um, and I apologize for those who are here for the 10. Uh, let's do our 930, and we'll just move through it, because I know we've got the Mayor Pro Tem here, and Council Member, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, um, Carmen Ramirez, Council Member Jim Hensley here to speak on this item, and I'm going to kick it off. This is um, some great work that's been done by our um, Watershed Protection District, and um, uh, and it is uh, a, to rename the Oxnard Industrial Drain and the J Street Drain. And this really did come through efforts of um, advocates in the Ormond Beach uh, area and the, uh, certainly the city of Port Wainami and Oxnard to take a look at um, our, our drains and to see how we could make them, uh, in, a, in renaming them, to make them more... Um, uh, open to the public that they are significant uh, importance in our community, that they are drains to be respected and, and, and purposeful and not to become dumping grounds. And that really did come from the community. Peter Brand, who worked with us in the Ormond Beach um, from the Coastal Conservancy, Larry and Shirley Godwin, Bill Terry, Gloria Roman, and many others really asked us to um, look at doing this. Took the idea to Jeff Pratt, and he said, absolutely, this is very doable. It would be a, uh, um, a good move for the public to rename these drains. And it was to better reflect watershed protection district facilities, their impact to both the cultural, historical, ecological, hydrological significance in the community, sur surrounding areas, and ultimately the, the entire story of the Ormond Beach wetlands. Um, here is the... Uh, channel the name the channel campaign information is that uh, again participated with a watershed awareness campaign a stakeholder committee of representatives from the county watershed protection district city of Oxnard nature conservancy coastal conservancy Chumash representatives and central coast alliance united for a sustainable economy the uh, committee received input from the community on six name options for each facility that were included on a ballot for the public voting and the new uh, names proposed, as you can say, C for the J Street Jane is to rename that as the Chumash Creek. And that T-S-U-M-A-S is Chumash in its original uh, uh, name and lowercase, which is um, uh, indicative of the Chumash uh, practice and, and language. And, um, and then the Oxnard Industrial Drain uh, to rename it the Ormond Lagoon Waterway. Um, and our, I know our staff has additional information on all of this. And I'll turn this over to Supervisor Zaragoza, who yep. we work together on this with yep. the community, fully engaged. Yep. Supervisor? Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. I'd like to commend you know, the work of the Outreach uh, Watershed uh, District. You know, I, I, uh, it was a nice job. You know, the whole community participated and, uh, and shared their knowledge and the two drains and how significant the two drains are to the Oxnard area. I want to thank... Uh, uh, Clifford Tolley, and also uh, Zoe Carlson. Madam Chair, I'd also like to share a couple of points on the timeline, and I know that um, Tolley's going to talk about that. But an awareness campaign committee was formed by the stakeholders. Supervisor Long, you were there. Your staff member, Lauren, Bianchi was, was uh, one of your assistants. The city of Oxnard council member, Mayor Pro Tem Ramirez, was involved in that. Representatives from the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy representatives from the Coastal Conservancy, cause the watershed protection, and, and also significant representation from the Shumas community. The responsibilities, as you mentioned, were to solicit names from five names from each strain that were selected by for a public vote. During the month-long voting process, members were informed or informed the community and encouraged them to vote. The votes were tallied, and the two names, as you mentioned, were, were selected for J Street, the Shumash Creek, Oxford, the Oxford Industrial Drain, to name it Ormond Lagoon Waterway. So I want to thank again uh, Supervisor Long for your work and also the staff and, and all the representatives, and hopefully that the board will approve this item and hopefully we'll have a ribbon cutting out there in Oxnard. And I just want to commend everybody for their excellent work, and I'm going to call uh, Tolly up to for the additional information. Thank you, Tolly. Good morning, Mr. Clifford. Good morning, Chair Long, members of the board, Mr. Powers. Uh, this was a 
a very enjoyable project to work on. I'm normally up in front of you talking about our projects, our programs, and our activities, our functions for stuff that people don't always see. If their homes aren't flooding, they assume that we're doing our job. This is one where we reached out directly to the community to involve them in this process, to let them know about these facilities that, that drain to Ormond Beach and to let them know the cultural significance, the historical significance. We had the wonderful opportunity of working with the naming committee and the, the people of the Shumash to, to bring forward these names. It was an extremely enjoyable process. Uh, we took it out in uh, numerous ways, including Facebook. We used that one mainly as an informational item to direct people to the information. We also surveyed them. During public uh, works week, we had voting stations set up, and the children loved getting in there and voting. If you look at the <laughs> first one there, he's really pondering it. Yeah, they did. And so they thought about it, they looked at the information, and, then, and I think they provided an outstanding uh, result with the names that were selected. Uh, a tremendous amount of voting. This chart here shows the votes, and it shows that the voting is, in fact, uh, very close. So people did think about it. We had several names. They enjoyed voting on them. On J Street Drain, formerly J Street Drain, the, the voting wasn't quite as close. The name uh, selected was very much the runaway winner there. And what we're now asking is we're just asking uh, final approval from the Board of Supervisors to approve the new names and we would then come forward later this year and actually have an unveiling uh, of signs with the names on them as part of our awareness program and we will use this in numerous ways uh, regarding the cleanliness of the facilities, what those facilities do in the community, how they impact the community and how the names were selected. Uh, and with that I request your, uh, your approval. Thank you, yes. This is great because, excuse me, because the people in Oxnard you know, have a lot of pride in, in what happens in Oxnard. And this, I believe, would, renaming those two waterways, I think, is significant as far as having a, 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 a two creeks or two channels that really uh, go down Oxnard Boulevard over to Ormond. It's extremely important that, that we work with the communities and they have more pride in it. So I want to thank you for that. Madam Chair, I, I just want to relate when I first was elected to the Board of Supervisors and I had a briefing and I remember my staff even, we all kind of looked at each other when they said the Oxnard Industrial Drain and the J Street yeah. Drain and I mean the first vision in my head was, oh my gosh, what must this be, you know, <laughs> and stuff. So I, this is a great move on your guys' part. Yeah. Okay, we do have a public speaking request on this, and thank you, Mr. Clifford. And I'll invite up first Council Member Jim Hensley from the fine city of Port Wyneme. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, distinguished <laughs> county supervisors, staff, and the audience that showed up. <laughs> I have to compliment you guys. John Zaragoza, Kathy Long, it's about time we did something, and thank you for bringing this to the forefront. Like Supervisor Bennett, I mean, how gross. Oxnard Industrial Drain, come on, give me a break. That, that's gross. We think and name ourselves in frames of images, okay? Let me jump back here. I'm Jim Hensley, Ventura uh, resident, Ventura County resident. Um, Port Wyneme City Council person, Wishtoria Foundation member, Ormond Beach Task Force uh, member for a long time. And I like my community and I want Port Wyneme to be known well and these drains go right on by us. I mean, I went out with Wishtoria a few years ago and people, uh, images give a, a thought. There was trash in there, mattresses, baby diapers, paint cans. We had a hard time getting the watershed to clean it all up. So if there's signs put up, if there's a vision of what it should be, it helps process of what we can make it. So please vote for it, okay? And I would suggest we put up nice signs, and I suggest we also put up signs, Spanish and English, don't dump your trash here. It's not an industrial drain. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member. Mayor Pro Tem, Cameron Ramirez. 
who served on the committee with us. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Long, members of the Board of Supervisors, and staff, uh, audience. Really appreciate this opportunity to speak a few words of appreciation and support for the staff of uh, Watershed Protection and the committee. And um, I, too, like Supervisor Bennett, when I heard the, the name, uh, it is appalling, and it does reflect a lack of respect for our waterways in general. And I really appreciate appreciated that uh, we included the thinking and the respect for Native Americans of our area. So I'm very pleased with this. Um, it is the beginning of more responsible stewardship of our waterways, of our ocean, which we desperately need to protect. It's in trouble uh, locally and elsewhere. And um, just a fabulous effort. Community did get involved, as uh, you've heard, and more to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Madam Chair, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I'm very happy the work that you're doing in Oxnard protecting Ormond Beach and, and also the coastal areas there. It's a new day in Oxnard. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, board members, um, again, I would like to uh, thank, I'm, I'm going to publicly thank Zoe Carlson. She has done a great job in really steering this work and public outreach and, and going into the classrooms and getting the youth excited about uh, and getting them informed about that we have these facilities that are so important to us because they do run to through the community and to our, our wonderful ocean and our coastal and beaches area and the wetlands. So uh, great work by all of you. And the item is before us with the recommended action. Um, I think um, that covers okay. the item well enough. We have a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank Yay. you so much. Thank you for the good work. And I, I know we'll be uh, in communications um, as to what next steps for signs and ribbon cuttings. Thank you so much. Thank you much. for the good work. Excellent work. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right. That item is complete then. We'll go to our 10 o'clock, and I'm going to uh, suggest that we go right to item 18, which is the annual report of the Real Estate Fraud Prosecution Program. Um, this is something that we have been very, very fortunate to have in this county. Not all counties do. Um, and that is this uh, Real Estate Fraud uh, Program, uh, multi-jurisdictional and um, Mr. District Attorney, good to see you, Mr. Totten. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Long, members of the board, Mr. Powers. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, before you today is our annual report on the real estate fraud investigation and prosecution program, as well as a request from me to recognize a truly amazing multi-jurisdictional uh, effort that really was responsible for achieving justice in what I believe is the largest loan fraud scam in the history of Ventura County. Uh, while our report contains detailed information and largely speaks for itself, I did want to just offer a few brief observations and comments. Uh, first and foremost, I, I want to thank your board. Uh, it was about 10 years, not quite 10 years ago, that I first uh, appeared before you on the issue of real estate fraud and asked for your help in creating a new unit. And our fledgling unit at that time began with one prosecutor and one investigator. And we knew we had a monumental real estate fraud problem in the county that needed to be addressed. Uh, today, that unit has now grown into uh, seven members who are dedicated professionals fighting every day to protect uh, home buyers and home sellers in the county and protect really an industry that in Ventura County is largely very responsible, very ethical, very principled. And as you probably, if you saw the Sunday edition of the Star, there was a nice article about the unit. And one of the things it mentioned that we're very proud of is that we have secured well over $17 million in restitution for people who have been victims of these fraud schemes. Along the way, we've enjoyed great collaborations and partnerships with a number of organizations who are here today. Ventura County Coastal Association of Realtors, uh, they have a new uh, director of governmental affairs, 
Marta Golding Brown, who I think was going to try to make it uh, today. We uh, also have actively worked with NAREP, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, and their president, Armando Jaquez, is here. Armando, would you wave? Thank you. And then we've enjoyed a partnership with our county clerk, Mark Lund, and his very able staff uh, that provide expert resources for us and also regularly send out fraud alert uh, notices on transactions that we know from our experience are at risk for potential fraud. From the program's in inception, our, our goal has been to innovatively and aggressively deter, investigate, and prosecute real estate fraud crimes. And on the innovation side, our, our public-private partnership with a real estate industry, which is now known as the Real Estate Fraud Advisory Team, or REFAT, has been absolutely critical in our success. Um, we're joined today by President Jim Keith, who's been there literally from the beginning. Where's Jim? There he is. Uh, he's been there from the inception of this program and just a visionary leader who has done so much to make us better and more effective in dealing with this problem. As many of you know, REFAT has hosted numerous uh, public forums. In fact, we've got one coming up on September 16th uh, at the Marriott. And these forums have been to educate consumers, to educate home buyers, home sellers, and to educate the industry about the problem of fraud. Uh, they've also uh, referred numerous cases to the district attorney's office over the last decade, many of which have resulted in criminal prosecutions. And REFAT has really become a national model. Jim was telling me before we started, he gets calls all the time from all over California and maybe even outside of California asking about this model and how other jurisdictions can roll it out. And we know that at least nine counties uh, have either implemented a similar model or are about to implement a similar model. So it's been a great success. And as I mentioned, they... They refer cases to us, and shortly after we created the real estate fraud unit, we started receiving complaints. And this is the case that I really want to highlight that was a, a very much a multi-jurisdictional case. We began receiving complaints about a group of realtors and other professionals uh, that were doing business with a small number of offices called Century 21, Premier Realty. Century 21, Premier Heels and Estates, Platinum Power Mortgage, and Mortec Financial. And we received complaints that they were taking advantage of home buyers and sellers in a very profound way. And so we initiated an investigation and discovered a huge loan fraud scheme. Essentially, what these individuals were doing is they were qualifying people who were unqualified. Uh, for mortgages uh, by using a whole host of fraudulent representations and loan documents for lenders, uh, including everything up to tax letters that were completely fraudulent that stated fraudulent income. These false representations were bolstering the loan applications, resulting in their approval. The buyers that they were dealing with were typically unsophisticated uh, individuals, often monolingual Spanish-speaking residents, that were hoping to achieve what all of us want in that American dream, the dream of home ownership. Instead, these individuals were placed into absolutely impossible loans with terrible terms and conditions that were destined for default, foreclosure, and the ruination of their credit. Meanwhile, the perpetrators of this scheme were reaping hundreds of thousands, and in some case, millions of dollars in commissions on these very high risk and very damaging loans. After discovering the full scope of this uh, fraud, we, part we decided it was wise to partner with federal agencies. And we partnered with a number of them, including the United States Attorney, in an effort to bring these crooks to justice. After three federal indictments, a total of 22 defendants have been convicted. Many are already in prison, and the last two defendants have now pled guilty. We, I think we view them as ringleaders of the operation. They've pled guilty and are expected to receive a lengthy federal prison sentence later this fall. 
So given the magnitude uh, of this case and it really serving as kind of a hallmark of, of our effort, uh, I wanted to ask your indulgence to allow me to call the members of this multi-jurisdictional team forward for recognition. Uh, as I mentioned, we partnered with the U.S. Attorney's Office and joining us today are Edward Alon, a former United States attorney now in private practice. Edward, if you'd come forward. Mark Avis, who is a current United States attorney, and he got his training in the Ventura County DA's office, and we're most proud of Mark. Uh, also, Ezekiel Armanderas from the Department of Homeland Security. I know some of these individuals could not, could not make, and I think Ezekiel is, is one of them. We're also joined by Carolyn Broderick of the Internal Revenue uh, Service, Office of Inspector General. David Chaloha of the Social Security Administration, Office of Inspector General. Chantel Valentine of the United States Secret Service. William Mike Parker, also of the United States Secret Service. Wendell Josh Seat, also of the United States Secret Service. Maura Kelly couldn't be with us today. Some of you will remember that name. Maura Kelly is a retired FBI agent. She is also the widow of... Uh, Eugene, Deputy Eugene Kostachinko. James Shields of the Federal Housing and Finance Agency, Office of Inspector General. And great members of the DA's office that we're blessed to have. Frank Huber, Senior DA Investigator. And Lisa Simmons, Investigative Assistant. And then we're also joined by several supervisors. Waylon Kwan from the Social Security Administration. And Douglas Cohen from the Department of Homeland Security. So perhaps we could acknowledge and recognize these fine professionals. Absolutely. Madam Chair, yes. I want to thank the DA for your excellent work. I remember several years ago, we got together over in South Oxnard and we had the town hall meeting regarding um, fraud, you know, real estate fraud, and we had NARAP and we had REFAT and we had all your staff there and we actually, uh, shared information with Spanish-speaking community at the time, and it was just an excellent program. So I want to thank your office, and I want to thank, you know, the elections office. I want to thank REFAD, NARAP. I want to thank the, uh, the, the federal agency, the state agencies, the IRS, the Social Security. I mean, we got all the, the players here. It's really, I want to thank you so much for the excellent work that you've done for the community. I I'm also have my real estate license, and know what you were talking about, you know, some of those individuals over, especially Century 21, you know, over on, on C Street. But I better, you know, not say any more than that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just want to thank you for all the good work that you've done for, for the community, and especially the Spanish-speaking community. And I know we have NARAP representatives, and, and they're really important, the Board of Realtors here in Ventura County has done an excellent job for, for the community. So I want to thank you so much for your good work. Thank you. Supervisor Bennett. Uh, to district course. attorney and all the other men and women that, that you have there, the, you know, the, the great value of public service is that you get to do important things. And certainly it's an important thing to stop somebody from stealing $500,000 from somebody. But it's far more important and far more emotional and meaningful when it's somebody's home. You, you can just see it. I mean, it's, it's one thing to lose some money in a scam. It's another thing to lose your home and your sense of identity and, and all of that. So um, I just want to applaud you for making that a, a special focus of your office to our district attorney. I think it's really appropriate in, in a county like ours where we have these high property values and lots of opportunity and for assembling such a great team and having this team be willing to step forward from all these various agencies that don't necessarily have to cooperate, but do because it's simply good public service. So thank all of you for that. Really appreciate it. Other comments? Just yes. you really appreciate the teamwork and that you see all these different agencies having to come together to, to deal with this. Just really appreciate you all working together and helping our citizens. At the end of the day, you buy your home, you hope you do the right thing, something happens, but you have a team of this that's really going to make a difference in somebody's lives. And 17 million, whatever you said, recovered. I mean, that's, that's, that's impressive, and it, the idea that you're willing to share this with the rest of the, the, the state, too, I love that, because why not take this same example instead of start with you had all the pain you had to go through to get there, let's, let's take it, let's make it happen. So people know that buying a home in this state can be a, a wonderful thing, even with there's other people out there trying to make it not so wonderful. So thank you very much.
Mr. Powers. Uh, to that point, I think it's just a good reminder that CSAC handed out a, a CSAC Challenge Award to this program, which means that 57 right. other counties thought this was such an innovative, effective program they wanted to recognize it. So That's congratulations right. and thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Totten, all of you. you. You do the hard work of helping to protect our residents, those who have a dream of owning a home, and when that dream is stolen through fraud, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. And, 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 and recovering from it is just impossible at times, I'm sure, for some folks who've really suffered through this. So your, all of you, the multi-jurisdictional approach is just, it is, it is a model and, and should be recognized and thanked uh, every year for your good work of working together. And Miles, thank you. You've been the, the uh, leader along with our district attorney for having a, a real um, engaging um, face to this um, criminal act that impacts so many lives. So you're very much appreciated. Thank you so much. M Madam yes. Chair, I, I just uh, would negligent not uh, recognizing Miles Weiss because he's just an outstanding attorney and I, my office called you many, many times. Yeah. And thank you for your good yeah. work. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, we appreciate every year uh, when the report comes to us that we have an opportunity to read the success and um, appreciation for it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all for being here. We have a uh, motion to receive and file. Please vote. And that passes. Thank you again, everyone, for coming in. Um, and now. Look at there. You got five minutes to do item 19 and still be in that window. Then we're going to take a quick break after that. We'll so. see if we need the full five minutes or not. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair, Supervisors, Mr. Powers. I'm Todd McNamee, your Director of Airports. This goes back to the rent fee that was approved in June, took effect July 1, uh, an oversight on my part where uh, when we made some adjustments to the rates, the utility rate uh, from $9 to $11 was missed on the county hangers. Uh, it's one of those subparagraphs, and it was missed, and so we're looking to make that correction so we can actually charge uh, appropriate utility surcharge for the hangers. This is a public okay. hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Do I have any requests? I don't see any requests. I'll close the public hearing. And we have a motion and a second on the item. Please vote. All right, taken Thank care you. of. Thank you. All right, board members, we have a 1030, so we have... Five minutes for a break. Yay! Members of the board, CEO Powers, Auto Controller Berg. Uh, for the record, I'm Rosa Gonzalez, Senior Deputy Clerk of the Board. Oh, yes, and County Council Leroy Smith. Clerk of the Board, Brian Palmer. <laughs> Chief Varela. <laughs> Good morning. And Bill, Good morning. And Bill Nash over there in the audience. Yes. All right, all right, now. Come on now. The board letter before you today is a recommendation to hold a second hearing regarding the adoption of an ordinance establishing a second assessment appeals board to become effective and operational on October 5th. Additionally, we'd like to recommend the appointment to the second assessment appeals board of Mr. Brian Sis to a three-year term, Mr. Lee Hess to a two-year term, and Ms. Patricia Little to a one-year term. Also, reappoint Jim Crow to the assessment appeals board number one as a regular uh, board member to a two-year term, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, board members, any questions on this? I will open the uh, public hearing. Anyone in the public wish to speak to this item? Close the public hearing. Then no questions. It's before the board for action. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Excellent report. Thank you very much. And that passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you very much.
All right. Next up, we have a item 21, second public hearing, authorizing supervision fees for defendants, our probation agency, chief probation officer, Mr. Hello. Varela. Good morning, Chair Long, members of the board, Mr. Powers. Uh, Mark Varela, your chief probation officer here. The item before you today is the adoption of the ordinance to implement the amendments to Penal Code Section 1203.1b, which authorizes supervision fees for the mandatory supervision, pop mandatory supervision population and repeal local ordinance 3577. On July 1st, I was in front of your board introducing this ordinance, the mandatory Supervision population was newly created by the Public Safety Realignment Act of 2011. There was nothing statutorily in place that allowed counties and probation departments to collect monthly fees for supervision. Assembly Bill 2199 was passed and went into effect on January 1st of this year, which now allows four counties to collect these fees. So the amount of the fees authorized by the statute will be set by your board's annual resolution, uh, fees resolution, and the collected funds will go into the general fund and be allocated to the probation agency to help cover operating costs. So I'm ready to address any questions you may have. Okay, board members, again, this is a public hearing. The second one I'll open for public hearing. And any questions from the board? Close the public hearing. Any questions from the board? Okay. Action. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And that passes 5 0. Thank you very much. Thank have a you. Wonderful day. Okay, moving right on. We have item 22 that will be heard along with item 30. We'll hear item 22 first. And this is a public hearing to consider approval of the Upper Ojai Valley <coughs> Fire. So I will open the public hearing process side of this. And good morning. Good morning, Chair Long, members of the board, and Mr. Powers. I'm Herb Schwinn. I'm with the Public Works Agency in the Engineering Services Department. Uh, I'm here to review with you the status of the Fire Station 20 project, provide feedback to you on the issues you raised at the February 24th board meeting, and request your approval of the actions requested in the letter before you today. Uh, just to refresh, we're discussing a replacement for Fire Station 20, which is located off State Route 150 in the Upper Ojai Valley. The site proposed for the replacement fire station is located on the south side of Route 150 approximately a half mile west of the current inadequate fire station 20. <clears throat> the scope of the current project, which has been slightly modified since we last met with you in February, um, and which is addressed in the conditional use permit application, includes a fire station building of approximately 7,400 square feet, a standalone garage of about 1,100 square feet, staff and public parking spaces, and a 60-foot tall lattice tower topped with one 20-foot tall whip antenna. This antenna is a change from what was previously presented to you in February, and I'll describe what has transpired since we last briefed you. This is the site plan for the proposed project. The buildings include a main structure to accommodate, uh, trying to get this. Huh? Oh, yeah, it's not doing it either. Well, <laughs> it's the main building which is on the, uh, with, this is oriented with north towards the top. So it's the main building um, to accommodate the firefighters, their equipment, and provide a, provide a public access area located to the west or the left of the site, um, a standalone garage, and there are other improvements which include a hose drying rack and a sand storage area and an adjoining dumpster enclosure uh, to the right or to the um, east of the main building. 
Um, the traffic flow is such that um, the uh, fire apparatus will come in off of Route 50 uh, in the entrance to the east, and then they'll drive through and park in the apparatus bay, and then when called upon, they'll exit out of the west side of the apparatus bay and back onto Route 150. <clears throat> at, your, at your February 24th board hearing, you requested that we return and address three specific aspects of the project. That is nighttime lighting limitation, nighttime noise limitation, and alternatives to what was at that time an, an 80 foot high lattice antenna tower. The lighting plan is in compliance with the county's general plan policies and the conditions of approval of the CUP. The lighting plan was developed to minimize the amount of light on the site, minimize the amount of light trespassed beyond the borders of the parcel, and eliminate the amount of light escaping upward. The Ojai City Exterior Lighting Standards Ordinance does not govern in this area, or it doesn't apply to a county facility, but we thought it was a good benchmark to use and to compare our lighting plan to, and our lighting plan compares with those standards. Um, okay, this, this is, shows the lighting plan, and while it's a little bit difficult to see, the intent of this is to show that only the two pedestals, and this is where I was hoping my laser would work, but it, it's not looking. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, this is a lighting plan. It's a little bit difficult to see, but the intent is to show that only the two pedestal walkway lights, um, the architectural fixture near the front access door, and the monument sign lighting will be on at night. So um, these are public parking here. These are two little pedestal lights that are about 30 inches high from the ground. This is one mounted on the building, and then this is the monument sign here. Those are the only signs that will be on all night or the only lights, I'm sorry, that will be on all night. Um, the other fixtures will be motion activated. And it'll only come on when motion is detected and then they will shut down after a period that's adjustable. Okay, this slide shows uh, the types of the exterior lighting fixtures to be used. All of the fixtures or the lamps within the fixtures are full cutoff devices to ensure no light escapes above the horizontal and horizontal light is controlled so as not to result in any scatter or trespass of light beyond the property lines. Uh, fixture A is a wall-mounted fixture. I'm sorry, that's a parking lot light fixture. And there are only going to be two of those. Um, they're going to be approximately 20 feet high. And uh, in terms of parking lot lighting or pole lighting, that's actually fairly low um, in general in lighting. It, to economize on lighting, you generally like to have the poles higher and the lights brighter. Uh, that way you can economize and reduce. We've only got two of these and they're only 20 feet high. Uh, fixture B is a wall-mounted fixture to be used on the apparatus bay and at the sand and trash enclosure for a total of five of those. Fixture C is an architectural fixture to be mounted on the building exterior near the office and dorm areas and on the garage building. There will be a total of eight of those. Fixture D is the pedestal light I talked about. Those are about 30 inches above the ground. There are only two of those, and they'll light the walkway between the pu public parking area and the public entrance. And fixture E is the monument sign lighting. Uh, there'll be four of those on the monument sign located out near Route 150. Uh, most of these fixtures will be motion activated under normal conditions and would not normally be on. I this is what is referred to as an illumination plan, and it demonstrates that the illumination at the property lines is less than a tenth of a foot candle, which is the Ohio City Ordinance limit for their most, most restrictive residential area category. Uh, so this red line here is a, is a light profile um, that's registering a tenth of a foot candle, 
when it's all complete. Anything outside of that is even less than a foot candle. It's, it's registered as zero foot candles. And then the areas within are, are brighter. But uh, this profile here demonstrates that um, no light beyond there will be at more than a tenth of a foot candle. With respect to the noise... Hey, Herb, Herb, can I ask you real quick before you go on with that? Yes. I know we're trying to minimize lights and keep all that down. Do we, are we minimizing so much that we have a safety issue? I mean, is it still enough for, because you got people coming in and out at yes. night. Is there a safety issue at this or not? No, uh, we don't believe so. That's why these lights here, the, the purpose of the keeping these lights on, these green ones, the one on the monument sign is so when I'm driving down, up and down Route 150, I can see where the fire station is. Uh, so that'll be illuminated all the time. I'll par be parking in this area here. When, when I drive in, I'll motion activate a light so it'll come on. And then these are all our walkway lights that will illuminate my path from my car to the front door after hours. So uh, it's designed, the ones that are on 24, not 24, but all the time at night are designed to provide a pathway for people coming to this. Um, to okay. the well, as long as you're comfortable, I know you've minimized that. As yes. long as you're comfortable, that's great. Uh, the noise assessment that was prepared and included with the original CEQA analysis um, identified one mitigation measure for normal operations upon completion of the fire station, and that is to limit the use of the external emergency alert system to only daytime and early evening hours. Uh, the existing fire department policies further limit noise producing activities and are summarized in the fire chief's memo, which is included in your board letter. I forgot to mention, obviously, uh, the fire... Fire Chief is here also. If you have any questions, representatives of uh, resource management planning are here uh, related to the planning aspects of the project if you have any questions later on or now. Um, with respect to the 80-foot tower that was originally proposed, alternatives to the 80-foot antenna tower um, were evaluated to see if there was some other way to provide the high-speed data connectivity that the fire station needed. Verizon has indicated to the fire district that they can provide high-speed broadband connectivity via landlines. So the revised project includes a 60-foot antenna tower, uh, which will have several antennas mounted on it, and one that will be from the top of the 60 feet, another 20 feet. It's a single fiberglass type whip antenna that's 20 feet long, and it will uh, beyond extend from 60 feet up to 80 feet. That that 20-foot uh, antenna, what's the diameter on that? It's pretty narrow, isn't it? It's, it's approximately, I'm told it's approximately three inches at the base. Uh, this is a revised elevation of the proposed station number 20 showing the 60-foot tower with the standard antenna array, including the 20-foot whip antenna. So, um, it was previously located in this area, uh, the antenna, and um, this is, it's been moved farther to the west. Um, this would, this here is about, uh, the top of the station is about 29 feet. Um, and then this represents 60 feet approximately to there, and then this is the 20 foot single uh, whip antenna that will go on top of that. Regarding the uh, antenna, I know we asked that you look at placing it, for example, on the water tank, which I think is up the hill. Have you, did you look at alternative locations other than on the site? Yes, we did. The, the problem with the antenna is that um, the farther away you get from the building where you need to process the signal, the bigger the conductor needs to be to transmit the signal from the antenna to the building. And it's, it's almost geometric in that... Um, they determined that beyond about 40 or 50 feet removed from the building, the size of the conductor you would need starts to get prohibitively large and expensive. So uh, there was a need to keep the antenna that receives the signal within about 50 feet of the building. Otherwise, um, 
there's a lot of expense in providing the connectivity, and, and you end up, we wanted to keep it on the property, for starters, because we didn't want to have to um, arrange to bring that type of uh, facility through other people's property. And then there was a um, communications limitation on how far you could get away from the building without having a very large conductor. A public outreach session was hosted at the current fire station 20 the evening of June 16th. The fire district notified all residents in the vicinity of the pro proposed station as well as any others that had attended previous public sessions or had provided comments previously. Representatives of the fire department, uh, Supervis Supervisor Bennett's office, the CEO's office, and public works agency attended. The fire chief Lorenzen addressed approximately 20 citizens that showed up, uh, providing them all the information I'm pre presenting you here, as well as additional detail. Subsequently, Chief Lorenzen also conducted some one-on-one -on -one sessions with selected residents who requested to meet with him after that and individually. So, in summary, the proposed Fire Station 20 is consistent with all applicable general plan policies. It conforms to the non-coastal zoning ordinance um, standard with, res with the requested variance that we've requested for you to approve, and it includes all the required findings to grant the conditional use permit. Uh, therefore, we request that you take the actions recommended in the board letter to adopt the MND, grant the CUP subject to the conditions of approval, grant the proposed variance, and approve the project so that we can, con can continue on and complete the design. Uh, that concludes my presentation. And um, as I mentioned, the representatives of the fire department are here, the fire chief himself, and folks from uh, RMA planning. Okay, board members, we have one public speaking request. Are there any questions at this, this time for staff? Okay, we'll invite up the public speaker, Jennifer Sage. Good morning. Good morning, board supervisors <clears throat> for the County of Ventura. Um, I am not opposed to this project at all. It's a beautiful project, and I don't think anyone in the Upper Ojai Valley is. <clears throat> I am only here because I do uh, want to reiterate uh, our concerns, which we uh, verbalized at the meeting that you held for us in the Upper Ojai Valley at Fire Station Number 20. And that is that um, uh, what will be done with the old fire station number 20. Um, I got a great letter from Brian Brennan, and I would just like it to go on record that we are here and we are concerned about uh, what will happen to the abandoned fire station number 20. Uh, Brian had sent me that it would typically go to... Um, uh, public works or something with the County of Ventura. Um, uh, and if not, then it would be <clears throat> declared as surplus property. And just be advised, just be aware that in the Upper Ojai, Ojai Valley, we do not have any commercial buildings and um, we only have for the whole entire community just a small little uh, um, market, the school, and, um, and um, a uh, hamburger stand. And it is the uh, fire station number 20 is right next to that. We have nothing else. We are 20 minutes from the town of Ohio and 20 minutes from Santa Paula. So because you're putting now another utility building up, um, whatever you do with this, I am requesting that you do, I do go on record that you alert us and ask us to be in some kind of decision process on what goes on uh, with the old fire station, that there, it, maybe you consider something for the entire community so that it's not, doesn't look more utility up there. We would like that whole drive to be a scenic route uh, from Ojai to Upper Ojai Valley, to Santa Paula, and just really be aware that we would like it 
to increase the value of a property up there. I'm a homeowner. I have a 10-acre horse ranch up there, and I come right down onto it. And um, whatever you do, that you uh, just uh, send notices out to us and recruit us in whatever um, whatever policies you have or whatever your considerations are that you engage the community in that. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sage. Any comment yes. there? You, you may want to stay for the next item that we're going to hear, which is what are we going to do with the fire station? We're going to just a preliminary you. thing, so I you may want to listen to that discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for coming in. Okay, no further public request on this, so we'll close the public hearing before the board. Any questions of staff? I think it's, it's the right thing to do, and okay, I'll we second have a that motion. Motion and a second. Please vote. And that is approved 5 0. Thank you, Mr. Schwinn. Are you carrying the item 20? I'm sorry, item 30. Item 30, you're carrying it. Right. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, this item. Appreciate Thank you very much. I appreciate you hearing item 30 uh, right after this item. It should be very brief in, in my mind. Um, as you've heard, the community uh, has great interest in what's going to happen with the other fire station. Um, it, when we've had other properties come available, uh, in the Ojai Valley, if you remember with the Honor Farm, we had over 200 different people come forward with different suggestions. We had this long list. Everybody was asking for the property. I think it's appropriate for us. Um, the search and rescue uh, have indicated their interest in the property. I think it's appropriate for us to simply have the CEO check and see whether that's doable. So this is a sort of a feasibility study. Is it feasible to get it to search and rescue? We're not making the decision to get it to search and rescue. We'd find out is it feasible. We'd talk with the community. We'd talk with the public safety professionals and everybody else, uh, and then go from there. Uh, so that's a request is for the CEO to do this report and check it out. We were trying to check some of these things out, and there's legal things about whether how you do it and, and all that stuff, and just makes makes sense for the CEO to to coordinate that. So I know we. We have a public speaker uh, and love to give him an opportunity to talk about this also and then I'd be happy to make a motion uh, with regard to this uh, feasibility study okay um, any questions at this time well then I'll invite, invite up Kevin Harrigan Hardigan to speak to this item and just to I'll Mr. help but since he won't but, but Kevin is the head of the Ventura County search and rescue the upper Ohio Ventura okay. County search and rescue for everybody to know that uh, good morning, good Madam morning. Chair, members of the board, Mr. Powers. Um, I'd like to express our appreciation for you to consider this possibility for us, and I'd like to express the need in the context of what it's like to run a modern rescue team these days. And I think that the best segue into that is from the media's presentation of what a search and rescue team does. They tend to portray us as... 12 or 14 guys that miraculously show up with backpacks on in the middle of the night and hike around in circles until they find your loved one. <laughs> and we do a very good job of that. But to do that these days takes a lot of equipment and a lot of training. We have three different rescue trucks these days. We have a state-of-the-art command post with the ability to communicate via satellite, to print maps, to gather media information for lost victims, etc. We have two trailers with quads. We have off-road motorcycles. We have a winter alpine trailer, and we have a Connex box full of additional equipment should we participate in helping with swift water rescue in the community. That is a lot of equipment. Currently, it is scattered throughout the Upper Ojai and Ojai Valley area from help of Ojai to the Ojai Police Department to behind the station, current Station 20, to a private residence or ranch in Santa Paula. This greatly increases the difficulty and the time for us to respond to rescues. In the last six weeks, we've had eight call-outs alone and one out-of-town call-out. So we've been very active, and we would greatly appreciate a place to have all of our equipment in one, in one area. And we can have our meetings there. Currently, our meetings are outside on a school bench because we have no building to operate in. Every meeting requires a training to keep all the members up to speed with 
you know, current life safety training using AEDs, equipment, high-tech equipment, all that. We have no classroom to do that in. And so we would be very excited if the board and the public could support such a use. We're a very quiet operation, and we don't exit the any facility with sirens on, and we do our best to help the community when in need. So thank you very much for listening. Kevin, thank you. Kevin could you share with us... Uh, the vast amounts your 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 folks get paid when they get up at two o'clock in the morning to go do this work. Uh, occasionally, it's a thank you. Other than that, um, it's a zero. So these are yeah these are these are all volunteers and and they're they're not just volunteering to get up at two o'clock in the morning. They're volunteering to maintain all this equipment to get themselves trained. It's it's a it's a remarkable uh, service for the residents of Ventura County and a great extension of public safety, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the public safety services. I, I, I'm going to talk about just one thing. When I was at La Conchita, uh, when the slide came down in, in 2005 in La Conchita, uh, and I was there in the middle of the night, and they had decided that they needed to tunnel in under the toe of the slide that was still moving. They tunneled in to get to the house to see if perhaps the house had protected some people, right? Who was it that tunneled in? It was volunteer search and rescue people. And I remember watching Kevin Hardigan drag himself out of that, all covered in mud. And I went, that's a great organization. Right? So um, anyway, uh, thank you very thank much, you very Kevin. Much. And, 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 and Pastor, thanks. And so I think it's appropriate for us to at least do this. And it may help send the message that we do have a, a potential priority use if it, if it happens to work out. So I was going to say, uh, Supervisor, <clears throat> what he, he made a pretty good argument right there. It's, uh, it's right for this place and, and for what's happening and who knows what's going to happen with El Nino and all this stuff. To have your place, you can react quickly. So hopefully the residents will agree with that and the CEO's office can make something like that happen. So that'd be great. Okay, there's a motion and a second to support the recommended action. Please vote. And thank you for your service, Mr. Hardigan. Thank you very much. All of the search and rescue team, thank you. Thanks that for taking, taking off work today to be here. Thank right. you. Yeah, thanks. And thank you to 100 our speaker. 100% raise on those thank yous. So. Jennifer, thanks. Okay. Now. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Okay, board members, we now have our 11 o'clock time certain items, um, of which there are two. So we will proceed to hear them. And that starts with item 23, resolution to pro approve proposed water allocation. All right. Good, Good morning, morning, Chair Long, Supervisors, Mr. Powers. I'm Dave Sasek of the, public, of the um, County of Ventura Public Works Agency. And the Director of Water and Sanitation, and this is a public hearing uh, regarding proposed rate allocation reductions, or excuse me, water allocation reductions, uh, water rate increases and pass-through and refund of surcharges and revisions to the rules and regulations for a Ventura County uh, Water Works District 17 and 38. District 38 is the district formerly known as the Lake Sherwood Community Services District that was recently stood up. Um, I have a short, actually, um, presentation that covers both of them. Um, and for the record, Prop Proposition 218 notices were sent out to all the ratepayers in both of the districts on June 19th. And to my knowledge, um, there have been um, no letters of protest from, from the districts. Additionally, our office has only received about a dozen phone calls, mostly asking for clarification um, to help understand the, the Prop 218 notices. We haven't received um, any complaints or any uh, negative feedback from that, uh, those notices. And then just for context, Waterworks District 17 uh, provides uh, water to about 2,000 customers in Bell Canyon uh, with 100% imported water, and Waterworks District 38 serves uh, approximately the same number um, in and around Lake Sherwood, again, with... Uh, 100% imported water. The, the PowerPoint I'd like to walk through gives a brief background on the drought, um, how we got here today. I'm going to step through the process that we follow to get to these recommendations, and I'll summarize the recommendations for each of the districts for the board. Um, and I want to close by giving you a, a short um, presentation of, of a website that we stood up a few weeks ago as a public outreach to our ratepayers. 
So Thank up, you. Okay, it's up there. All right, so um, there we go. Um, the drought. Again, most of this should not be news to you. Um, 2013 was the driest, um, 14 was the hottest, and 15 we had the lowest snowpack. So these are some of the pressures on us, uh, on the system within the state that we're, we're wrestled with. Uh, Okay, so this is overall statewide uh, precipitation through 2014. Again, you see the numbers are just incredibly down. Um, typical average year is uh, close to 20 inches. So you can see even, even going back, you know, eight years, we've had a number of dry years. They say the drought's been four years long, but some would say it, it predates even beyond that. Uh, so this is just a long-running problem that the state faces. Um, Lake Oroville is one of the major reservoirs in the state that provides water for the um, California Water Project. Um, so I'm going to show you just a couple of pictures that um, help put context to the problem we're facing. Um, this was taken last year, and it's not looking much better this year. The next round of photos I want to show you is, are taken from the same place a year apart uh, in Yosemite looking at Half Dome. So 2011, 2012. 13, 14, uh, and this year, all taken in April. So when someone says the drought is not real, um, I just like to show them these pictures, and it really puts things into context with the kind of problem that we're wrestling with here. Um, again, looking at the snowpack, this is this year's snowpack. Um, never really got off the ground. It started to pick up in December. We got a lot of rain. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the rain was not snow, and, and therefore just ran out to the ocean. Um, we weren't able to capture a lot of that, and... Um, ergo the problem we're facing within the state. A little bit of background on the timeline. Um, again, some of this is review, some of this may be news to, to folks in the room. Um, January 2014, the, the governor called for voluntary reductions of 20 percent statewide. Um, also around that time frame, the state water project announced the allocations were really, uh, really down at, at uh, first zero and then they upped it to 5 percent. Um, that really put a lot of pressure on the uh, Southern California wholesalers. Um, also at that time, affecting us here in Ventura County, Fox Canyon GMA um, put out their uh, uh, imposing water reductions on allowable pumping. So we're getting pinched on both of our sources of water, not necessarily for this district, but for the districts I'll be coming to you next week. Um, they rely on groundwater. These districts are 100% imported water. So for the remainder of the year, what happened was um, the Southern California uh, water wholesalers pulled upon the reservoirs and storage that they had in place to make up for the reductions in state water project. Additionally, in the Central Valley, we saw hundreds of thousands of acres of um, farmland um, go fallow. We saw subsidence, which is um, a disaster you can't really recover from. Once that ground settles uh, from the aquifers being over pumped, uh, they don't, it doesn't come back up. So that's what we saw across the state. So the problem continued to worsen um, going forward. Okay, so looking at, at 2015, you see that graph up in the corner. Um, that's the results of the governor's call for a 20% reduction. The only month where we actually even came close to that statewide was in December, and that's when we got a lot of rain. So as we, as we looked early in the year, uh, we weren't seeing, you know, statewide the results that the governor was looking for to try to safeguard um, this very, very important resource to us. So on April 1st, uh, as you're all aware, he um, uh, put out an emergency executive order. He, where he's standing typically is below six or eight feet of snow. Um, so it, it's, a great, it's a great photo to put things in context, and he directed... Uh, statewide mandate of 25 percent reduction on all urban water use. Um, shortly thereafter, the uh, State Water Board uh, adopted emergency regulations that implemented that reduction, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Um, in the interim of that, uh, Metropolitan, who's our wholesale water provider, um, announced a mandatory 15 percent reduction in allocations with very, very steep fines going to um, those uh, d those people that uh, exceed those allocations. And again, I have a couple slides later on that will talk through that in a little bit more detail. 
Okay, so this is one of the one of the points that the state put out, and you've seen this in the paper. Um, large urban water suppliers have mandatory targets based upon per capita consumption. Um, these two districts are not in that category. Um, they're they're considered small non-urban water suppliers, and they're required to achieve either a 20 percent reduction and or reduce outdoor irrigation to no more than two days per week. So the districts have the option of attacking this problem one of two ways. So here's some of the other reductions that the, the statewide mandatory restrictions put in place. And some of these are familiar to you because they're in our rules and regulations already. Um, I'm not going to read them all. Uh, no irrigation on public uh, turf on the medians. That's a new one. So you, you probably notice as you drive around town, you see the grass is turning brown. Um, um, no irrigation 48 hours after rainfall. Again, that's another new one that wasn't in place prior to this. Um, and um, no irrigation on um, medians. We talked about that. Again, new construction would have micro drip nozzles. Uh, and then these are uh, restaurants and hotels. This was in our, our standard um, permanent conservation measures within our district, so these aren't new to us. So our response, how we attack this problem, you know, we had some parameters that kind of guided our, our efforts. Um, first one is we wanted to comply with the governor's order because we felt it was important to safeguard the resource. Um, following that, obviously, the emergency regulation, we want to comply with that as well because the intent of that is to, to achieve that, that savings. Uh, we also wanted to avoid surcharges that, that, are gonna, that could possibly come down from our wholesalers. Um, so we, part of what we wanted to do was, in, in the event that we did get surcharges, was institute a process to pass those surcharges on to those high water users who have essentially been responsible for driving the district to those surcharges. Um, we also wanted to minimize the impact on uh, low volume users and early conservers. And, and I think we did that in the plan that we put forward. Uh, we also obviously need to maintain the system the cost of operations and maintenance goes on. Um, and so that was another driver that we had to work within. And then finally, throughout all this process, we realized that we need to do a much better job of outreach to our ratepayers and our customers. And we've made a, a number of significant changes in the last few months uh, to try to do that. So this is the timeline. And there's a lot of information up here. Um, on May 5th, the uh, Water Board adopted the regulation, and your board also um, declared a level two water shortage. Not long after that, um, we had our first uh, decision-making advisory committee meeting in, in Waterworks District 17, where our advisory committee unanimously adopted the, the uh, recommendation to go for a 25 percent reduction in allocations. Now, this was the first decision-making meeting, but we had many meetings leading up to this. As soon as we got wind of this, we started talking to our advisory committee meetings. And we actually had, um, uh, within pretty much every district, double the number of meetings that we normally have because we just had to enable to get this in front of your board. It took a lot of work and a lot of outreach to the community. Uh, about a week um, after that, the actual emergency ordinance went into effect on May 18th. Um, and then on May 28th, the Lake Sherwood Community Services D District also unanimously recommended 25% uh, reduction in allocations within their district. Um, you know, meanwhile, we're continuing to work and trying to figure out some of the other challenges facing the district. So we had another meeting with Lake Sherwood on June 12th, uh, and their advisory committee unanimously recommended um, a 6% rate increase for the commodity, uh, both in August, which is due to the loss of revenue that we're expecting within that district based upon conservation, and then on January 1st, which is directly related to um, a known rate increase that we're, we've been noticed from Cayugas. Cayugas is going to increase our wholesale water price by 5.4%. And then on June 16th, um, uh, Bell Canyon's uh, advisory committee uh, unanimously recommended a 6% water rate increase effective January 1st. Again, that's the uh, essentially passing on the increase that we saw from Cayugas. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about the um, allocation surcharge, and, and this is a pretty complicated um, problem. I'll try to boil it down. Um, it, at the end of the day, 15% uh, reduction in wholesale water from our from Cayugas. Uh, if we exceed that amount, 
uh, we will be subject to a $1,480 and, $1 surcharge up to the first 15 percent of excess. Anything beyond a 15 percent excess, we will be subject to a 2960 surcharge. Um, and that was, that was voted in on the 14th by Metropolitan, on the 15th by, by Cahagas. Um, and on top of trying to figure out how to deal with the state allocation challenges and the reductions and everything else, this got thrown in our plate. So you see we had a couple of other advisory committee meetings with the district where we addressed this. And, and, and we really put it in the context of there's really only three options on how to deal with the surcharge. The first option is we can do nothing. Um, we can run the risk of being subject to these surcharges uh, and then write it off as an oper operational loss to the district, in which case every rate payer in the district would be subject to higher rates to offset that loss in the out years. Um, the other option would be to try to create a, a formula where we calculated uh, where we expected based upon the allocations that we were getting from Cayagas, based upon the allocations that we have to our people and historical usage, what level of usage within each um, class of customer would drive the, the district into surcharge and then hold those individuals responsible for their usage, essentially billing them for the surcharge as it's accrued. Um, the other option would be um, to wait and then try to ret retroactively um, uh, get those uh, surcharges out of the ratepayers later because we won't see that bill from Cayagas until August or September of 2016. So it's a little bit of a challenge to the district on how to manage that. And so what what we're recommending as a board, uh, as our advisory committees, what we're recommending to your board is um, based upon the um, the analysis that we did, what we, we uh, would like to um, collect those surcharges in advance, keep track of them, and then should we not be subject to the surcharge, we'd end up refunding those to the ratepayers. To give you a little bit of, was there a question? Okay. Uh, to give you a little bit of context, this is what those surcharges would look like for the district. Um, if we exceeded our, our allocation by 10%, Bell Canyon would be subject to about $160,000 worth of surcharges. Um, if we use the same rate as last year, it would be um, double that. It would be 324000 And you can see the numbers um, for Lake Sherwood. So there, these are not insignificant numbers to the bottom line of these districts who, who really don't um, do a huge volume of work. So on, we briefed this in detail to our advisory committees um, June 6th and June 12th, and, and they both unanimously uh, recommended this uh, going forward to your board. So um, this is a summary of the rates that we're recommending. Uh, as again, you can see Waterworks District 17, a 6% rate increase. Um, the impact on this, um, based upon the average per capita use, it's about 62 units per month. It's about a $13.50 rate increase for this, this district. Um, keeping in mind that the average um, bill in this district is um, probably about $230, $240 a month. So that's what the 6% equates to to give you a little bit of a context. Um, in terms of the uh, proposed allocation reduction, um, I'll spend a minute or two on this slide because I, I think it's, it's pretty important. You can see the current allocation uh, based upon your tier and then you see the proposed. And this is where we, we believe that we're doing the best to um, protect the early conservers and the low volume users. Because if somebody, this is the predominant um, grouping. Most of our customers are in band three. So band three, tier one, is currently zero to 80 units. So somebody who's already in that tier who's conserved, they've pulled out some grass or whatever, and now they're only using 50, th there will be no impact on this because they're already down below the reduced proposed band number. Um, you know, if they, were, if they were using up in tier two and they drove themselves down, into a lower band again. The minim it's minimizing the impact on those on those early conservers. And if somebody's already a low volume user, this is transparent to them. This really um, has the bigger impact on the people that are using the higher volumes of water. Um, and then this this shows where the surcharge would kick in for these users. And again, that's based upon the total amount of water that Cayugas has given us. Um, 
divided by the amount of water that each user um, is allocated. So this is where, um, and th it just so happens in this district, the line is anything above tier one uh, essentially pushes them into the uh, possibility of a surcharge. I appreciate that photo too. You know, what we're really seeing a lot of trees starting to die, you just really see the effect. Right. All right, so this is um, District 38. It's, it's got an extra line because, again, they recommended a mid-year rate increase um, to help cover um, lost operational um, O&M dollars. Uh, again, the impact on this district is um, the first rate increase would be less than $20 a month. The second rate increase would be a little bit more than that. Um, their average monthly bill is over $350. Uh, again, put, it's about, you, know, you can do the math, 6%. Um, so that's that's where they boil down, and then in terms of what um, the surcharge and the allocation reductions will do, it's the same principle here. Uh, only the numbers are just a little bit different. Um, the 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 kick in just again so happens to be um, at the same tier. You'll see when we come back next week, um, the calculation was a little more complicated, um, and and the same principle applies. Their tiers are, are totally structured different um, than um, District 17, but it's the same idea. Somebody that's been an early, early conserver that's already drove their water use down to a small number uh, would be less impacted by this than somebody who's a high volume user who has not conserved. Okay, so some of the things we've done with outreach, and I'm not going to read all this to you. Um, this is a. Let me just ask you real quick before yes, you get into that part since you're done with them. So when you <clears throat> were talking about adding that um, additional because you want to collect it up front and do it. How are you going to refund that, though? How, what's your plan? Do you have a plan how to refund Well, we're, we have our, we're, we're working with our billing system, and we can account and track that, and we have two options. We can either, uh, because we're going to have the, I mean, we, we're going to have the money. We so can either give them like a direct a, refund or, or we can credit. give them a credit to their account. Okay, I was just, just curious. Part of that may be an option for somebody because if all of a sudden right. I sold my house and I'm going to get this back, I might want to sure. get that versus a credit my new bill. Right. If I'm going to have it to make difference. Okay, yeah. I just curious how you do it. Yeah, we could do it. We would do it either way. Okay, this is a flyer we sent out to all our rate payers. I'm not going to read it to you, but the, you know the one bolded bullet doesn't really show up too too well here. But one of the things we've been really um, the drumbeat we've been working within our districts is outdoor water use. You see the volumes of water that these two districts consume. It's extremely high. Most of that water is outside the house on irrigation. So we've been saying, look, if you just tell your gardener to cut your sprinkler time down from 15 minutes to 10 or 15 minutes to 7 and a half, you're going to achieve these reductions without really having a huge impact on your life and, and uh, you know, keep an eye on your landscaping. And if you need to tweak it a little bit, you can do that. Uh, but that's that's one of the main takeaways. That's, that's, that's a big deal because I've heard a lot of landscapers, they had some cities that said you only get – 15 minutes twice a, day, twice a week versus and it, a total of 30 minutes or it's 20 versus a lot of landscapers say it after eight or 10 minutes it's just running off right you'd rather go to three times a week at five or six minutes and these and you still use a lot less water or something but so we're not putting those mandatory uh, no not on, on these particular districts yeah. it's there there um, that was one of the major discussion points that we had at the yeah. advisory committees um, they wanted to have the flexibility which is why they went after the 25 percent reduction right. I think that's better yeah. So they're, they're, we're not restricting the days of week watering. Um, but just get the water down and figure out how to do it within that type of work, which I think is better. Right, yeah. absolutely. If I, if I could, I, I really agree with that. And the, the idea of just you, you can water all you want two days a week, it just it doesn't, doesn't make any, any common sense. And that's what people do. They'll flood, you know, when it's much better to say, we've got to get a 25% reduction. Go, you know, go five minutes, three days a week is uh, better than, you know, better than 15 minutes two days a week you know? right and, and the other alternative is to run multiple multiple passes through your your cycles i talked to one of the one of the ratepayers in one of these districts and he said you know i live on the hill the only way i can get the water to soak in is to just keep running until it runs off and and i said well that's that's really not being very effective why don't you why don't you run it until it doesn't run off let it sit for a while and then run it run through the cycle again so you don't have the water running off your property, but you're still putting a lot more water on your on your real estate. So um, we're not restricting the number of times people can run through, but what we want to do is make sure that the water is not running off the property. So this is one of the flyers we sent out. Um, 
Um, these are the these are the standing rules and regulations. Just for your information, no, no, uh, this is a repeat a lot from what the state has put out. One one change it, that one thing that we call out within these districts is limiting irrigation during these time periods. So you can't water during the day is essentially what we're saying in these in these districts. Maybe you have those facts. When you water between that time, I guess you're getting the heat and everything else, more evaporation. How much more water is it used? Is there some number that we can tell people why we can't do that? You know, it depends upon the weather, the wind. But I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's significant. I don't, I don't have a some number. I don't have a thumbnail number okay. to throw out there. But obviously, on a hot, windy day, hot, you're yeah, going to yeah. lose a lot of that water to evaporation. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if it's a cold, moist day, not so much. So. It seems like it would be easy to enforce too when you see people watering at the wrong times or days. Right. Absolutely. Okay, so these, this is one of the graphics that we've put up on our webpage, and I'll show you the webpage in just a minute. Um, this is the data for Bell Canyon. Uh, we got the June information. Uh, we actually have, I got the July information last night, so it's not in this slide. But it looks like um, so far they're tracking, um, they're at about, uh, they're below the target line. So that, that lower line, the 25% reduction goal, that's the goal for the district. And right now this district is tracking um, a little bit below that, which is good. We had some rain last month, uh, which, which is helping us. Um, as far as Lake Sherwood goes, I don't have the information for July, and I can't get to the slide. Here we go. Um, but um, through, uh, through June, they came down. They were a little bit above the goal, but right in the ballpark. So I think some of the outreach that we're, we're having, some of the things you're seeing in the newspaper are indeed starting to have an effect. So we're seeing that conservation, which, again, puts some pressure on us because if we don't adjust our bands and tiers, we're going to lose a tremendous amount of revenue. It's going to impact the bottom line, which one of the reasons why we're tightening up those, those bands and tiers is to offset lost revenue from the conservation. Um, now what I'd like to do is... Um, Go ahead and uh, if you can open up that slow your H two O webpage. Okay, so this is a this is a website that we just started out. When you land on this page, if you scroll down just a little bit, you can see um, it's not it's not on the whole screen, but you can see there's general information talks about the stage two water supply shortage. Then there's an opportunity to go to each of the districts. So if you can just click on the districts tab at the top, and then go ahead and click on Bell Canyon. So this is what, you know, all of our Bell Canyon ratepayers can go to. They can see this. They can go to the rules and regulations. Um, they can go to the brief that I gave to the Homeowners Association. I was out there uh, in June, talked through a lot of things. They can even scroll down and they can see um, where, where we're at. We're going to be updating this graph every month in terms of our water conservation. Um, and we have the same thing for all of the districts. Um, we also have a, um, a section on tips. I won't go to that section the last thing I'd ask you to do is if you can click on the contact page. Um, this is an opportunity for any of our rate payers or anybody within any of our districts are aware of this. They can go in and if they see somebody watering during the day, they can let us know. If they see water runoff or if they see, um, you know, a broken sprinkler that's doing a geyser, um, there's a way that they can communicate and get back to us so that we can reach out to those rate payers and, and make sure that everybody's um, – doing the right thing to try to save water. So um, that concludes uh, my brief. I'm ready to take any questions. <coughs> Good information. Thank you. I really uh, appreciate questions. your outreach, too. We had probably somewhere between 40 and 50 people at the combined SOMAS MAC and um, water district meeting, and I think that really helped. And I think also meeting with the Homer Association as well as the advisory committee out in Lake Sherwood. Uh, and then also having these advisory committees make it so helpful to to be able to get their input and then they can also let people know about it. So I think that's one of the reasons why you haven't received any um, people um, upset about this item because I think people understand the need. And I think also getting the advice of the residents there, it seems like a very fair way to do it and be able to do this kind of reduction. So appreciate the, the extra work. Dave, you know, over in Oxnard, you know, on the government channel, they have it running all the time about drought and what to do. Don't water your, your uh, the, the sidewalks. You know, put the nozzle on the, on the, on the um, hose, water hose, and so forth. So they're continually running that in the government channel in Oxnard. So I'm not sure what capability we have for 
other cities in Ojai, I mean, excuse me, in Thousand Oaks and in Moore Park and so forth. Yeah, we've been coordinating with the city of Moore Park, and we're working to get our information up on their webpage. We haven't done that yet, but that's definitely mm -hmm. something we're working on. And we, we can only water twice a week, you know, so in Oxnard, so just right. for information. Mm -hmm. After what you heard today, you should go back and just get a reduction. You can water what you want. So right, you right. Sorry. <laughs> I am. <laughs> this is a public hearing, and the public hearing is open. Uh, I don't have any speaker request. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. So the item before us on for action is 23, unless there are other questions from board members on item 23. Good job. Yep, yep, very good. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. That passes unanimously. Okay, then item 24, uh, as was uh, prepared in the presentation, um, information provided to us, it is a public hearing. Open the public hearing. No speaker request on that. Close the public hearing. Questions from the board? Seeing no questions, it's before us for action. This is item 24. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And note this is the new Waterworks District, number 38. That's right. That's right. Okay, and that passes unanimously also. Thank you. I know lots of work, but that was uh, excellent information and good to have it available to the public, as always. Thank you, and it's really my staff that really burned the midnight oil doing a lot of this. <laughs> and so uh, if, if I can just indulge and just publicly thank them for what they've done. Sure. They made this possible, so no. thank you. Thank you. No, you got a lot going on on this stuff, so thanks. Good job. Okay, board members, that completes our time. Certain items now until 1.30. Could we, could we kind of just make up some closed session items for old time's sake? So <laughs> we can, really. go in. Maybe we'll go in. Or maybe we can just rehear some yeah, items. <laughs> All right, we'll, uh, we'll be on break until 1.30. Good afternoon, Chair Long, members of the board. My name is Susan Curtis, and I'm here today to present the privately initiated general plan amendment from Ralph and Mary Hagel. My presentation is going to cover the general plan amendment process, the project background, the proposed general plan, plan amendment, and the related rezone, uh, our planning division analysis, the SOAR voter approval requirements, and the planning division recommendation and next steps. We're in the screening stage of the GPA process. Screening allows your board to screen out applications that are not in the public interest or are inconsistent with adopted land use goals and policies. Screening out GPAs that do not meet these criteria or are otherwise determined by your board to not be in the public interest avoids needless processing time and expense. Your board can authorize the planning division to proceed with the GPA and the related rezone processing or deny further processing in the GPA. If your board does authorize staff to proceed, this does not guarantee ultimate approval of the general plan amendment and related rezone. The subject parcel is located within the Los Posas Valley area of interest at 3100 Somas Road, Somas. Oh, sorry about that. There's my map. Now this slide looks busy, but I'm going to walk you through it to make sense of it. The subject parcel has an existing split land use designation and zoning. So in this upper white area, all of this area, it's actually 3.08 acres with a general plan land use designation of existing community and an industrial zoning of M2. This green area, all of this here, this 39.15 acres, has a general plan land use designation of agriculture and zoning of AE40, or agricultural exclusive. The area with the black dotted line here 
represents the current Hagel Lumber Development Permit boundary where they operate a wholesale lumber operation. Now, wholesale lumber operations are an allowed use within the Non-Coastal Zoning Ordinance, or NCZO, M2 Zone District, and with general plan land use designations of existing community or urban. This hatched green area here represents where between 1992 and 2005, the applicant incrementally paved and expanded their wholesale lumber operation on approximately 11.54 acres of land designated agriculture and zoned AC40, with soils designated prime in the 1984 farmlands inventory map. The work was conducted without required county permits or land use approvals, and wholesale lumber operations are not allowed use within the general plan agricultural land use designation or the NCZO AE40 zone district. In 2010, the planning division issued a notice of violation on the subject parcel for the unpermitted expansion of lumber operations outside the permit boundaries of Hegel lumber operations and onto the AE zone land in violation of the NCZO. Hegel Lumber is now subject to an amended compliance agreement whereby they've ceased any operations on the 11.54 acres of land and they're attempting to remedy the zoning and land use entitlement violations through the proposed GPA, which, if ultimately approved, would allow wholesale lumber operations on the industrially zoned land. This slide shows an aerial view of the subject parcel. You can see up in the paved area here are the areas where all the lumber operations are currently occurring. This is, was the paved area that was done without county approvals. The remainder of the parcel has a, a tree farm, riparian corridor, and habitat wetlands areas. The proposed general plan amendment. This slide depicts the existing general plan and zoning patterns that surround the Hegel lumber operations. The subject parcel is within this black thick line. As you can see, the property is uh, clustered amongst a, an area of M2 zoned properties, which are now surrounded by agricultural and open space designated lands. Hegel Lumber has been operating in this area uh, adjacent to these uh, predominantly agricultural and open space areas for approximately 30 years. Now, the proposed GPA would change approximately 13.5 acres of land designated agricultural to existing community, and the rezone would change the same 13.5 acres from agricultural exclusive, or AE40, to limited industrial, M2. This area highlighted in yellow right here, all that area there, is the area that's subject of the GPA. The dotted red line represents the permit boundary for the wholesale operations uh, development permit. If the GPA is approved for further processing by your board, the applicant will submit an application to modify their development permit boundary to include all of this expanded area. This will be processed concurrently with the GPA request. This table shows that the proposed GPA and rezone would decrease the parcel's agricultural land use designation and zoning from 39.15 acres to 25.65 acres. And it would increase the parcel's existing community designation and industrial zoning from 3.08 acres to 16.58 acres. The applicant is also proposing an agricultural conservation easement, or ACE, as potential mitigation measure for the loss of the agricultural soils on that 13.5 acres of land. The ACE will be placed on the area of the subject parcel that's going to retain the agricultural designation and zoning. County staff will work with the applicant to further refine the ACE to ensure that the mitigation is appropriate for the loss of prime soils, to restrict the ACE to agricultural production, and to establish an ACE which is long-term in duration. Additional mitigation measures for the loss of agricultural soils associated with the GPA may also be identified during the CEQA process. Two, two questions for you. What, what's a long-term duration mean for the ACE will be further refined for long-term duration? Can you bracket that for me at least? And yes. At least how long? And you know, What's the minimum length that's considered long-term duration? The, 
the minimum length of the, I'd, I'd say the best example is um, the, uh, the California State um, Department of Conservation has an agricultural um, resource protection program, and, and so they, they issue ACEs. And so there's a state statute that puts a minimum, at least for that program, at 25 years. And then there's pretty stringent requirements in terms of getting rid of the ACE even after 25 years. Okay. And so that's kind of the the benchmark, if you will, that we're looking at. So will the restriction to agricultural use in the zoning ordinance be just a long-term duration? Just be just consistent with that, potentially, just for the 25 years? Or it's, will the agricultural... Well, you'll basically have both. You'll have the, um, you'll have the conservation easement uh, on top of the agricultural zoning. And so they'll, they'll, they'll go hand in hand. And so as long as the ACE is, um, is a active and, and on the land, then, then it's restricted to whatever agricultural uses are stated in the ACE. And, the, and then that's on top of the agricultural exclusive zoning, which is also limits the uses. So as long as agricultural zoning doesn't change, this would stay in agriculture. Uh, right, but w when you have an ACE on that, that's separate. That's a, a separate extra, contract, right. so that's extra. Right. And so even if you did, you basically couldn't change the zoning while the so ACE the was extra, on there. So the extra contract could be as short as 25 years. Right. The, the, way the, extra, in, the extra protection. The, the extra protection would be at a minimum of 25, 25 years, years, but Thank you. it would probably be longer. Could it uh, be in perpetuity and then only uh, changed with a Board of Supervisors vote? That, that's what we're contemplating. We haven't discussed it with the okay. applicant, but that's basically how the, the, the state model that I was referring right. to works, except that in those models, you, you need the state <coughs> approval, but here we're contemplating board approval. Yes. Okay. So now I'd like to give you some statistics about the Hagel Lumber operations. Um, an integral component of their operations is the reliance on a rail spur adjacent to the subject parcel, which is connected to the uh, coast main rail line and used to transport inbound shipments of lumber products by rail car. That's actually right there. There's the rail line, and then that's the spur that comes in off that line onto their property. In 2014, approximately two-thirds of all rail products received at Hagel Lumber arrived by rail, and rail deliveries that year required 302 rail cars. Since each rail car can transport the equivalent of four truckloads of lumber products, approximately 1,208 truck trips would have been required to deliver lumber to the Hagel site in 2014 had they not used the rail system. Use of the railroad in lieu of rail trucks resulted in an emission savings of 2,470 metric tons of carbon dioxide in the community. The applicant's proposal to expand the area available for lumber operations would allow the applicant to increase rail deliveries to the site since the 11.54 acre area would be used for lumber storage. Your board may amend the general plan if it deems it to be in the public interest. Staff evaluated several factors that could allow such a finding to be made. These included, is there an adequate supply of industrial land adjacent to the railroad? Would the GPA create a spot of urbanized land? And does potential GHG emission reduction contribute to the findings? Your board may also amend the general plan if it deems the proposed GPA is consistent with the general plan goals and policies. Staff analysis found that the unincorporated area of the county has limited areas designated and zoned for industrial use adjacent to an active regional rail network. Such areas are largely limited to Somas, Satakoy, and Piru, and there's a need for additional areas zoned for industrial use that are adjacent to the railroad. The Hagel Lumber Yard and the adjacent land subject to the GPA and rezone are connected to the rail line with the rail spur to offload cargo. The combination of a railroad connection to a large parcel of industrial land is essentially unique to the Hagel Lumber site. The area of agriculturally designated land proposed to be redesignated is located at the edge of a block of agricultural land adjacent to existing industrial uses. Thus, the GPA and rezone would expand an existing cluster of industrial land and would not constitute a spot change that would disrupt the continuity or use of other nearby agricultural properties. Finally, 
the expansion of industrial land adjacent to an active rail line may respond to state mandates to reduce greenhouse gas emissions pursuant to the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, or AB 32, by utilizing railroad transportation for the Hegel Lumberyard expansion. Can I ask, I should, one, other, oh, can I sure. ask one other question for you? Mm -hmm. Is it anticipated there will be, or are there now, any provisions that if something happens to the rail line that um, an equivalent amount of trucks are not going to be moving through the community? Is, does, is, there, is there any kind of provision that the, you know, with, with this going forward, the mm -hmm. expanded um, the expanded permitted area needs to be serviced by the rail line or some limit on the amount of trucks that can come? Is, is any of that anticipated? Um, well, I, I think in terms of the modified development permit, that's where we would have to look at potential conditions of approval that might address truck trips and Great. and the volume related to that. So nobody's talked about that up to this point in time, but we that's when it would be talked about as during um, the modified, modified. For this particular operation, and I should note that even though this is a rail-dependent use, the general plan uh, amendment would create opportunities that are not rail-dependent. Mm -hmm. So it would not require a rail-dependent use by any anyone who could use the M2 zone land. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Next, we looked at general plan and um, zoning maps, which should result in adequate be it an adequate amount of land for important uses, such as wholesale lumber yards served by a regional rail network. Under current general plan and zoning maps, there's a very limited opportunity to develop wholesale lumber yard adjacent to an active rail line. Wholesale lumber yards are permitted only in the M1, M2, and M3 industrial zones. As shown in this table, approximately 52.47 acres of industrial land is potentially accessible by rail in the Soma, Satakoy, and Piru areas. Although all parcels could potentially be used for lumber yard uses, the conversion of land already developed with other uses of to a lumber yard is considered speculative. This map shows the three geographic locations with the appropriately zoned land for possible wholesale lumber yard operations. Staff analyzed seven parcels in the SOMAS area and identified 1.3 acres, which are currently owned by the applicant, which may be a viable option for Humber, Hagel Lumber Company expansion. Staff analyzed 21 parcels in the Satakoy area and found that it is doubtful that any could be considered viable sites for wholesale lumber operations due to the size and current development of the parcels. Finally, staff analyzed one parcel in the Piru area that was determined not viable due to rail line infrastructure limitations. Again, we want to emphasize that once the property is rezoned, there's no requirement that a rail dependent use be developed at the site. So as discussed earlier, use of the regional rail network by Hagel Lumber reduces the number of vehicles and frequency of trips needed to transport lumber products on local roadways. Consequently, the GPA and rezone could further state mandates to reduce GHG emissions pursuant to AB 32, which require a reduction of California GHG emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. If I can comment, um, when they do their environmental impact report, it won't be looked at as a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions because of the rail spur, because the baseline condition would be the agriculture land or that was there before it got paved over, right? That one. Supervisor Parks, I believe that um, what would be looked at in the CEQA document would be what the delta. In other words, if the ex you're correct, the existing operation would be considered a base condition. However, if they're planning to expand the lumber yard, you might presume that that expansion could cut down on truck trips to another location, another lumber yard. I think that the baseline, though, isn't the existing operation. I think the baseline has to be the agriculture land before the existing operation moved on top of it. That's correct. That would be the delta. Okay, thanks. I, um, we've had that question recently, and I would just ask that that, that be um, certainly one of the questions that's fully fleshed out. 
Yeah, certainly the environmental document will do that. There, the, you'll, there'll be two levels of analysis. There's the project-specific impacts, which will, will I think, uh, be probably characterized as described by Supervisor Parks. The cumulative impacts, where we take a look at lumber demands and how they're distributed across the county, we may at that time look at uh, the replacement of truck trips by rail trips at this site if it were to expand. So there's, there's, there's varying levels of analysis that would be done. So those will be addressed at that time. So in terms of general plan consistency, staff made preliminary determination that the proposed GPA would be consistent with farmland resources compatibility policy depicted on this slide, as Hagel Lumber has been operating in a manner compatible with, neighbor, with neighboring agricultural uses for approximately 30 years, and the use does not involve sensitive receptors which may be affected by agricultural operations adjacent to the land. Staff also found that the subject parcel would be consistent with the agricultural land use designation goal depicted here regarding viable farming units as it would retain 25.65 acres designated agriculture which would continue to be used by the applicant as a viable tree farm riparian habitat and wetlands area. In terms of potential inconsistencies, the GPA would permanently remove 13.5 acres of prime and statewide important farmland from agricultural production contrary to farmland resource and agricultural designation goals and policies cited on this slide, which identify such soils as non-renewable resource that should be preserved for agricultural production. Additionally, the GPA would reduce the area of the subject parcel from 39.15 to 25.65 acres, which is smaller than the 40-acre minimum agricultural parcel size identified in the agricultural land use designations policy. However, a combination of the applicant proposed ACE, other CEQA mitigation measures, and project conditions of approval may facilitate a general plan consistency finding. The GPA is potentially consistent with air quality and energy resource goals based on Hagel Lumber's use of the regional rail network to transport lumber products. These goals promote attainment of state and federal ambient air quality standards and promote land use patterns which minimize energy consumption and encourage decreased number and length of vehicle trips. The GPA is also potentially consistent with employment and commerce and industry goals by encouraging industrial development adjacent to a cluster of six parcels designated existing community and zoned M2, and by ensuring that the continued operation of Hagel Lumber is conducted in a manner with neighboring, a compatible manner with neighboring agricultural land uses. Public outreach for the GPA included a presentation to the Agricultural Preserve Advisory Committee on June 10th. The APAC found that the subject parcel to be a unique property which merits conversion to industrial use. On July 8th, the APAC submitted a letter to your board to this effect, which is included as Exhibit 9 of your staff report. The APAC also recommended your board continue processing of the GPA and related rezone. Public notice of the screening hearing was also published in the Ventura County Star. Because the GPA would change the agricultural land use designation of the subject parcel, it must be approved by a majority countywide vote pursuant to the Save Open Space and Agricultural Resources or SOAR ordinance, which is part of the general plan. The applicant will attempt to comply with this voter approval requirement by requesting that your board place the GPA on the ballot. This step would only occur after the GPA, along with the rezone and the modified plan development permit required for the proposed lumberyard expansion, underwent CEQA review and were considered and approved by your board in accordance with the NCZO and other applicable law. Staff recommends that your board approve the proposed privately initiated general plan amendment request for further processing by the planning division. If the proposed GPA and related rezone is screened through by your board, we will complete the GPA and rezone analysis, including environmental or CEQA review. We'll concurrently process the modified development permit. We'll present to APAC, present to the Planning Commission, and your board for the decision on the GPA, the rezone, and the modified development permit. Finally, there will be a SOAR ballot measure um, uh, identified as November 2016 for this item placed in front of the voters. This concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions that you may have. Board members, are there questions at this time? Yes, we're going to do that. 
Um, we will be going to uh, public speakers and uh, and the applicant if he wishes to speak. But we have a disclosure requirement, County Council. Thank you, Chair Long. The purpose of uh, your board's disclosures is to um, disclose any information or evidence that you may have received prior to this public hearing um, that's not already in the record. And the purpose of the disclosure is to let everyone here know what substantive information and evidence you may have heard and you may base your decision on so everyone here has a chance to ask you about that and to address the evidence and information. And so the um, disclosures that you make should be as detailed as possible. Board members, any disclosures? On August 4th, 2011, I got a tour. And were you on a tour too? Oh, you were with me. With you, yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, that's how much I remember of the tour. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's good. Okay, I, so we both we both were on a tour. I did not. No. Supervisor. Um, I've 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 had no meeting with the applicant. I have not been on site. Um, I the only thing that I think could have any relevancy is all I've had some general conversations with the public about the fact that this problem is out there. Some general conversations with staff about what are they doing about it and some general conversations with everybody from county council on down about whether you could do this i don't know what you call it the you know rechange the zone so the lumber was going to be okay so uh, but that's all that um, that i've had nothing specific about this general plan amendment coming forward okay um can i ask can I ask her one real quick question sure yeah i was just kind of asking them over here too is we're talking about this be able to get on a sort vote by 2016. So the process we can go through, we can do this quick enough to make sure all that happens is, I mean, they're hoping to, I mean, are you, I don't know if you're as a planner different or what, Are you want to answer that? She was, I was asking those questions and I want to hear it publicly. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Foy, I don't think anyone has yet actually done a real analysis to make sure that we could in fact get on the ballot by 2016. Uh, but I suspect it will depend on how quickly um, a proposal is submitted and whether the application is complete. Um, the processing of the CUP modification, I think, can be done within that time frame. So the outstanding question is whether we can process the general plan amendment within that time frame. And the EIR. Yeah, okay. Yes, the, so the CEQA document. They can help you as quick as they can get their stuff, it helps you get yours done there? That's exactly correct. <laughs> Good. All right. And just for the record, to be clear, um, in November 2016 is the goal, but it, there's, it's not a requirement. No, I, I was just curious because I saw it up there at 16. I was just wondering if we get through that. So, okay. Um, disclosures. Um, I have not met with, uh, in, certainly in this consideration before us, with the applicant. Um, I. Uh, uh, did receive an email um, offering if there was any uh, additional information or would like a meeting, I could uh, certainly do that, and I chose not to. Um, and uh, I bought a Christmas tree from Hegel for the last 20 years. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> it's a great Christmas tree farm. Okay. Anything else from staff? No. Any other questions of staff at this time? We can always come back once we hear from the public. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, like, uh, appreciate PowerPoints and the walkthrough, Ms. Curtis. Um, so uh, under the request to speak, uh, Patrick Lohman, are you representing Lockman. the? Lockman. Thank you, sorry. Uh, I think 15, typically. 15 minutes, yes. Good afternoon. As the applicant, yes. Chair Long and uh, members of the board. And my name is Patrick Lofman. I'm an attorney representing the Hagel Lumber in connection with this application. So the Hagels have brought this application for a general plan amendment, which will require a SOAR vote, of course, uh, to resolve an ongoing land use dispute um, pertaining to lumber storage at the applicant's property in, in the Somas area. We appreciate the planning department's analysis and recommendations. Uh, I think the staff report 
provides a very thorough narrative of the history, the procedural background, the zone text effort, the equivalency determination issue. So I'm not going to repeat all that except to note that at every level we had some support that this is a problem that should be resolved. Okay, and at the last Planning Commission hearing back in 2013, we, I think we had a substantial um, understanding of what our situation was. We didn't get the equivalency determination appeal, but we had people that voted against saying do it this way, which is a general plan amendment. So we've worked with the county planning department towards that end, and that's why we're here. Um, We're here today to answer any questions the board might have. The Hagel family is here. Our planner, Tom Figg, is here. Um, but given the completeness of the staff report that you've just heard and gone through, our only presentation will involve some supplemental information on what we're talking about, which is the ag property. We've heard a lot of things about the public benefit of doing this and so forth. But fundamentally, this is a, uh, we understand very deeply the county's policy on the protection of ag land. That's the root of this. And um, so I think it would be helpful to you to hear something about the nature of this property. It was designated prime soils and AE40 after the Hagel property, the op Hagel lumber operation was in existence. Um, fine. But I do think it's important when they define, when you define what a prime ag land is and it's uh, ag land of statewide importance that it be ag land. And frankly, um, I tell the story about Min Nishimori who was a farmer that farmed the Bell Ranch, which I'm sure you know where that is, mm -hmm. in the Somos area. He farmed this area for Mr. Hagel for one year, turned it back as unfarmable, re rejected an offer to farm it for free just to keep the weeds down. There's water issues. Um, it's just not, by, by allowing this to process, you're not losing any viable productive ag land. And I think that's the centerpiece of the county policies is protect that ag land. Uh, I'm trying to get through, at least at this preliminary stages, it's not productive good ag land. There won't be any loss of it. And I've asked Mr. Edgar Terry, who is a local farmer, to give, he's seen the property, knows the property, to give some input um, regarding uh, the status of the property. So we appreciate the staff's report. They do note some potential inconsistencies. The bulk of them show likely consistent and all that public benefit about the environmental um, benefits of the rail, well, that's absolutely true and I think justifies, will justify the project. But on the potential inconsistency, that's on the ag issue. And I do think it's a consideration and we're open to other suggestions on the mitigation. We've proposed a pretty strong ACE. That'll be part of the process. But in the back of this, it has to be recognized that this is not productive, viable farmland that's being um, dealt with. So, of course, you have the, the guidelines on processing. Uh, we feel that uh, the staff report, which recommends further processing, meets uh, states' material facts that meet that criteria. Um, there's a great potential, uh, at a minimum, in my opinion, to find not only the public benefit of this project, but also its consistency with the county's ag policies. I think at the end of the day, uh, you'll ultimately be able to make that finding and clearly, given the things we have in the report today and you have before you, um, we believe that threshold has been met to allow this to be further processed. There's been a lot of work done today to show that this is a unique property, that it's beneficial to the existing lumber operation, there's no question. 
and its lack of potential for ag production. We believe that there's a basis for finding a consistency, as I've said, with the county policies. Um, if you agree with the staff that there are potential inconsistencies on those two areas, those two policies, uh, one of which is protect ag land, we understand that, but it has to be ag land. And then it's to remove as little as possible. We think that given this project, you're removing, you're not, that policy doesn't say never allow any development, right? It says eliminate, and with the condition of the Hegel property and its characteristics, we don't think that, we think this is consistent with that policy as well. On the minimum acre size, we're already under the minimum acreage, even without this proposal. So I don't think that's a difficult um, consistency issue to address. But So we believe that all these factors taken together, as well as our proposed ACE, um, meet the requirements that the county has as far as um, this threshold finding to proceed, and um, we appreciate your your consideration. If you have any questions of me, I'm happy to address them either now or later. But at this time, I'd ask uh, Mr. Edgar Terry to address the board. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Terry submitted a card. Please come on up. Were there any questions first? Oh, no? Okay. Mr. Terry. Uh, Chair Long, Supervisors, my name is Edgar Terry, and I'm a longtime grower here in the county. And I was asked recently to go out and tour the property, and uh, quite frankly, I was surprised that it was designated prime agricultural ground. Uh, you know, we farm a lot of parcels around the county, and uh, this parcel is certainly, and I agree with the APAC decision, that uh, this parcel is certainly not prime agricultural ground. It's uh, inconsistent with agriculture nowadays on a number of different levels. And not the least being that you've got an existing uh, business operating right adjacent to it. And uh, I see Henry Gonzalez sitting behind me, and I'm sure he would have questions when I tried to uh, farm a par parcel like that, apply for a pest control permit or a fumigation permit, and I'd have to ask the Hagels to evacuate their entire business before we did any job because of the buffer zone restrictions. Top of that, you've got uh, water quality issues out there. You've got very high chloride levels in that area now, which limits to the limits the type of crops that you can grow profitably. And I think uh, Mr. Lofman is saying that when Minda Shimori farmed it for refused to farm it for free, I think that speaks volume because none of us will turn down property for free. It's just nowadays with the type of farming we do, the uh, uh, we when we do our calculus and, and survey the surrounding areas. We look for the uh, ability to farm without uh, uh, impacting the people around us and them impacting us. You've got all of those issues out there right now. It just, it, the, I, again, I was surprised that the property was still designated agricultural property. And uh, I think that um, when you look at this, uh, logically, it makes a, a lot of sense to go ahead and, and staff the recommendation and, and uh, not keep this under some prime agricultural designation because I don't know, and I certainly wouldn't do it, anybody would want to go out there and farm and have to deal with the issues that we deal with now from uh, neighbors and food safety and all the attendant things that go along with that. So I'm here in supporting the, uh, the uh, plan change, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Do you feel that way about the acreage that's going to go into the easement also? So that I'm Do you feel the same way about the acreage that's going to go into the easement? Yeah, I, I, th I think that's a great great swap. Uh, you know, it, the ACE on top of that, and that's the first time I've heard of the term ACE. I, I like the way that was presented. And you're looking at keeping property in there for 25 years or greater, and then the property up on top, put it for what it should be used for, for the expansion of the lumber yard, and keep the bottom part in there. But the bottom part, you feel, is... Oh, well, certainly. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, I used to farm out in that area many, 25 years ago, and, and that makes a lot of sense. I agree. Madam Chair, this is probably for the Ag Commissioner. Does the Ag Commissioner look at it to make sure that it's not prime uh, property, or ag property and so forth, or how do we determine that? I mean, you're the farmer, you know, but... But does it I, I'm not sure what the state definition of prime agricultural property is anymore. Mm -hmm. However, I do know operating 
in impacted areas, that ag urban interface that we're all concerned about, is something we take very seriously. And not too recently, you had Director Leahy down here talking about those very same issues to your board. And I, I take them very seriously because they, they are tough to deal with. So th there's water problems there and other problems with that property? Yeah, you got chloride issues in the water, which the kind of crops we grow, you know, they, they, they're not productive enough. And the pesticide issues too. Is too you got pesticide issues. You've also got um, the impact of a, uh, uh, a non-ag business working there and whatever flows from that onto an adjacent farm field. And then when we have to, whether you farm it organically or, or, or conventionally, you still have to spray the field. And consequently, we have to worry about the impact in a, in a buffer zone next door on a business and people working inside that office. And I was looking at the map of the prevailing wind blows into the property, into the occupied property. It looks like the property is on the west side of the, of the building and the wind blows that in that direction. Uh, Supervisor Zergos, uh, at this point in time, we really don't worry about which way the prevailing wind's blowing. We just worry about how many feet we are away from an office building. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be close to it. And even if this were somehow designated prime agricultural ground, who would want to take that risk? Nobody wants to take that risk. It doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions of no other speaker request? The applicant, any other information? Okay. All right. We'll close the uh, public hearing then. Um, and any questions of staff? this time okay yeah I think this is the right process and um, I appreciate that they're willing to come forward and we have set up a, a process for situations like this and uh, right now it requires going to a SOAR vote but I think that's the way it has to be done and um, I do look forward to having it come back to us getting more information on it and then letting the voters have a say too so I, I definitely support staff recommendation yeah so do I, I think we should move forward then move forward with this Okay, you're going to put a motion forward and a second. There's a motion and a second. Please vote. Okay, you have a 5 0 vote to go forward and uh, wish you the best. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, staff. Good work. I put on the dais a board letter that Supervisor Long and I have uh, uh, signed uh, that will be, uh, I'll read the title, Recommendation of Supervisor Bennett and Long to direct the CEO to review policies for placing items on the board agenda and lead to a review of county transparency and input policies and report back to the board with options. Um, and that'll be for next week's uh, board hearing. Um, so um, I wanted to make sure that uh, I was clearer in public about that. Um, the um, first, um, uh, I think the first thing we have to do here is to make a motion to reconsider um, a board vote that we had that was three to two. Um, I um, struggled with the vote that day um, and uh, made uh, a decision, uh, I think based uh, to a great extent on the thought that um, the notification costs would uh, uh, be used to pay for uh, uh, the grinding, um, and um, I think it's. A, I think I think that uh, looking at all the facts now, I don't think I made the proper vote, and so I'm asking for a board. Uh, uh, I'm asking. I'm making a motion for reconsideration of that vote uh, that we had last October. There's a motion to take the. First action, and that's to well, that's the action to reconsider. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Mr. Zaragoza, second. Okay, please vote on the motion to reconsider. That passed.
passes four to one. Okay, so now um, I um, would like us to rehear motion number one of item number 40 of October 28th, 2014 at 2.30. Um, had an opportunity to look uh, and watch that whole debate again. It was a uh, difficult uh, even discussion and debate of uh, a lot uh, out there, um, but uh, uh, repeatedly um, uh, the statement was made that uh, we could just take the money that's going to be used for the grinding, the, the hundred dollars that's going to be used for the grinding and I mean used for the notification and pay that for the grinding and why would we uh, why would we pay more to notify when we could just grind? And um, because of that, uh, we ended up with three. Uh, I ended up uh, supporting that motion, and now I'm uh, recommending that we repeal that motion um, based on the information I received. And I received this information for the benefit of the public. I, I was asking for this information. I received this information a week ago, Monday, uh, and that was uh, in briefing for the other board item that's coming on sidewalks. And I verbally asked for uh, that information because in the PowerPoint that they're going to do, they talk about the whole notification process. So it seemed to, to me when I heard that, I went, that notification process is not a notification process that I support any longer because a notification process includes notifying people that they're not responsible for the cost of the grinding. And uh, we have not done any grinding since the October hearing. And so uh, I was faced with the decision when, how do I communicate that I don't support this decision any longer? It seemed that I should do it as we are creating our notification process. It would be, um, it, I think people would say, wait a minute, you, you let this vote go forward with the notification process uh, that said we're going to notify people that they don't have to pay and then turn around and say you don't support that process. So it seemed appropriate, uh, which is why then on Wednesday I filed the letter that I filed. I didn't have that information until Monday uh, about that. And uh, so anyway, that's an example of what we were talking about earlier. Until you know what the staff's report says, sometimes you don't know what motion you may want to be making, and I didn't have that staff information until Monday. So with that, I know we have a number of speakers, and I'd be happy to hear from the speakers. And I have a couple of questions of you, because I don't understand. You didn't want people, you don't want the county, you didn't think the county would notify people that they didn't have to pay for grinding when you voted for not paying for grinding? I, I think what was what was presented at the board hearing was that the cost of notification was going to, that we could use the money for the cost of notification. And I have repeated statements that, uh, that were made that the cost of notification, why spend that money for notification when we could just grind? Correct. And the implication is that we weren't going to spend the money for notification. That it, Now I find we're going to be spending the money for the notification and we're going to be spending additional money for grinding. Well, I, That's I, not I thought how you it was brought presented. that up because our next agenda item was is our staff coming forward to us to make sure they don't get crosswise with us that this is the process we want. So you know, I think uh, that deserves some discussion because uh, when cities grind and counties grind and some 90% of them do grinding for sidewalks, they don't go and ask the residents, uh, is it okay if we grind your sidewalk for free? They just do it. I mean. Uh, where I live, City of Thousand Oaks, I've got gr grinding in front of my sidewalk. The mayor's got grinding in front of his sidewalk. The City of Oxnard, they'll go grind the sidewalk. They're not checking with Supervisor Zaragoza and saying, mind if I grind your sidewalk to fix it. They got a little lip, they fix it. So I think that does, that is a worthy conversation to have. It's on the following board letter. I think our county has never uh, done this process to the extent that everyone else is doing it, so it's new. And their desire to go and, you know, make sure everybody signs off. Now, what happens if they grind that little corner of your sidewalk and you didn't want it done? You can go replace it, and that's where you would be anyway in the situation. So I think that is a definitely worthy of discussion, if that's your concern, that we're going to spend some money notifying residents uh, that we're going to grind their sidewalk, make sure that's okay with them, because they don't do that else other places. 
And secondly, if your concern is that you were given wrong information uh, regarding the cost of notification being more than the cost of grinding, I think that that isn't wrong information. And even if you, uh, you throw in the cost of notification, uh, it's, going, it's, it's still going to cost more than the grinding. And we have never required residents to pay for that notification. So it sounds to me like you're thinking that is something residents should pay for, the cost of notification, because we don't do that when we replace slabs. That's just something the county eats. You know, we have to uh, replace slabs and we're charging residents to replace slabs. We don't charge residents for the cost of the billing. We eat that. So you're still in the exact same situation you were in when you voted for this and other times, I think three different times you have voted for sidewalk funding. Uh, but no, no changes of information are there that I understand would warrant you wanting to all of a sudden make residents pay. It's the exact same situation. It's going to cost more to notify something the county eats, that's a policy, than it is to do the actual work. So are you under the impression that it's different than that? You finished so I can respond? Are you finished so I can respond? Question mark? <laughs> yes, that That's was a I'm, question. Yeah, and I'm asking, are you finished so I can respond? I just don't want to be interrupted in the middle of the response because I'm responding. Mm -hmm. So am I? Go. Okay. Please respond. Thank you. The um, I, f I find that a very uh, I find that a very odd take in terms of what I'm saying or or anything else. Um, I'm, I'm not at all suggesting that the residents should pay for notification. Um, and I watched that testimony last time that we had very clearly, and I remember Supervisor Foy, and he, he was on there very clearly saying, look, at, if it is still their responsibility to pay for the repair, the, if we have to do a full repair, then we have to notify them that we're going to grind, because as we had the conversation, some of them, as Mr. Um, uh, well, Fleisch. Fleisch, yeah, as Mr. Fleisch said, Mr. Fleisch said, some people might say, hey, do I want to pay $50 to grind right now, or do I want to pay $1,200 to replace, you, I think was the exact example you used, to pay $1,200 to replace in five years? I think I'll pay the $50 to replace now. We have to give them that option, which means we have to notify them. I'm not at all saying they, we should ever say they have to pay for the notification. But um, So, no, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is because we say other cities don't notify, other places don't notify. You're right. Other places are not the unincorporated county that have the policy we have. If the county took on full liability for the repair of the sidewalks and for the grinding of the sidewalks, in the replacement of the sidewalks or the grinding, then yes, the county would not have to notify. The county could simply do it. But that's not outside of just a quick courtesy notification. We're doing the streets and the sidewalks here, right? But they wouldn't have to do all of this other uh, stuff. But because the count, because we voted very clearly, four to one, that we, or I should say there was a motion to say, we still kept that policy on a four to one vote, saying we are going to pay, we, we are not going to take on the full responsibility for the replacement of the sidewalks. We have said we have to, we have to notify. So if we have to notify, the argument was made that the cost of the, the, that we would save by not having to notify would be enough to pay for the grinding. So why shouldn't we do that? And I specifically asked after the meeting, I said, are we really going to be able to save enough money by decreasing you know, notification to do that? And staff said, We'll have to look at, see how the process works out, and we'll get back with you. I've been waiting since October for that get back with me. And what they got back to me with is the statement that, no, there's almost no difference between the cost that they have for, for if we pay for the grinding versus if the residents pay for the grinding. So if, as you allege, it's $100 for notification, we're going to be paying the $100 notification and we're going to be paying the $50 for the grinding. Whereas what was, uh, what was in 
certainly stated before was we could save the hundred dollars on the on the notification and use that money for grinding. That made some sense to me that day when we were in the boardroom. I went, well, you're right. If we can, if it costs more to notify than to grind, we could grind and not notify. But that's not what we have in front of us. We have a situation where we have to notify and we have to grind it. And I'm not going to support a policy where we don't notify because that starts us completely down the road of we're going to take responsibility for the sidewalks. And it's, it's, it reminds me of, uh, of, the, of the many conversations. And just interesting, I talked to Johnny Johnson today, and he reminded me of how you know, this is a slippery slope, and his whole time when he was here as CEO, he kept saying, "You start down this road on sidewalks, you, you, you're not going to you're not going to come back, and you're going to have the full responsibility." And it, it reinforced that I think I'm, I'm I think it, I made the wrong vote last time, and I'm trying to to be upfront about it and say I, th I think we should reconsider it. So that's my response. And then I, I would just say too that there's notifying, so people have a choice. And then there's billing them for this 15, 20, 25, 50 dollars for the grind. And then it's billing them again, and then it's collecting their payment for that 15, 25, 50 dollar grind. And then it's recording the payment, and then it's acknowledging it with them. So there is a cost associated with charging. Right. And that is de minimis. Uh, it is, it's a wash. If not, it is actually more expensive if we are going to charge residents because we have to do all of this staff work and billing and collecting. And the amount of money for fixing that grind is so small. I mean, bids as low as $15, and yet you want to charge because it doesn't affect liability. We heard that last time. Well, hang on a second. I, I think you're on two different points. One is, I think he knows it costs more to do this, but he doesn't want to get into a process of being having to take total responsibility. I think that's where it is. Right. So let me let me just ask, though, Leroy, where you got, if we if, right now, if somebody walks down a, a sidewalk in the county, somebody trips because there's a quarter inch up and does, are they suing us? I guess they can sue us for anything, but I mean, is that a big deal that we deal with? I think they'd sue us and, and the landowner. And, that, and that's how some attorney would say, because, you know, you're, you're landowner responsible, it's part of a county deal. And, but, I mean, are we ever, are we responsible? We, we could be liable, but for the county to be liable, it's more of a, we'd have to have notice of the dangerous condition in advance and have ignored the problem. And, and but is that, ignoring that problem is not going to, Dave and said, Dave's sending notice out to those people and making sure that they take care of it, is that... If, is that what you mean by that? Well, I mean, no. I mean, if we have notice of a dangerous condition, then we have a duty to fix it or warn. But okay, so I mean, at what point, going back to where we don't want to be responsible, would we fix it, or we'd be contacting the homeowner and say, "You got well, to fix that." Under the ordinance, we give notice to the homeowner that he has to fix it, and if they don't, then we fix it and put the lien on. I mean, that's the underlying rationale of the whole. Ordinance. So if if we give notice and they don't respond, then we fix. Then we're, we're we've we've done our li we've taken care of our liability right. issue for correct on top of it. Okay, so I, I guess in that in that sense, I, I mean at the end of the day, so we don't have a lot of cost. I mean I know where Supervisor um, Parks is coming. This whole process costs a thousand bucks to go through all these things. I can grind it and it costs less. But I think going back to where Supervisor Bennett was going, well if we get into it, then we start the slippery slope of oh that's bad. The tree pulled that up. You guys have been taking care of it. You've been grinding these, you should take care of them. Then we get into this whole deal about taking care of sidewalks with David Gold. Well, that, that is certainly another part, but if I could get on to just one specific sure. point with Mr. Fleisch, could you come up, please? All right. And I, I want to try to recognize the staff when supervisors are disagreeing, we're going to try to minimize the amount of time that staff gets caught in the middle of it, all right? But um, when we send out an invoice, what percentage of the people pay their invoice? A fairly large percentage. What I'm bringing to you in the next item is 25 properties to lien out of several hundred, five, six hundred. But but so the vast majority of people get the invoice and they pay it. Correct. Right. Okay. So so in the cost in those situations is the cost of mailing out one invoice for the vast majority. Yes, sir. Right. So that's not a hundred dollars. No, sir. Right. 
Okay. And so the number that kept getting thrown around last time and has been thrown around all the way up until uh, today's hearing is that it's $100 to notify and uh, it could be as low as $15, but it might be more than 15 to 75. I think you're saying 15 to $75 for the grinding, right? Is what I've heard. But so thank you. You can take a seat, right? Okay. So the point is the difference between the two notifications is there's an invoice with one and there's not with the other. The invoice is not $100. And sending out the invoice that the vast majority of people pay is not doesn't justify us saying, well, it's, so we, since we have to send out an invoice, we ought to go ahead and grind. That's the argument, and the argument that you're still making today. That's the argument that you made last time, and it's not an accurate argument. It does not cost, uh, we don't save money. Basically, the argument was made, we would actually save money if we did the grinding. Uh, we won't save money if we do the grinding. We will be doing the cost of notification minus the cost of an invoice, and paid for the grinding. And the grinding is going to cost more than one letter invoice in whatever staff time is, is involved in that. That's why I believe that it's appropriate for me to um, change yep. my vote. Okay, and I've been told that I'm not accurate in my statement, correct? Um, I have a PowerPoint. If we can get it up and just go to the last slide, I think it will help clarify where I got this information. While that PowerPoint's that coming is. up, uh, I just while you're waiting to get that up, I would still say even if it costs the same or costs a little more, we still got the issue of going down the slippery slope of taking that, care of sidewalks. And that's true. That, that we, Which is something I expressed last, before. Yes, I agree, right. But, yeah. I, but I modified because of that. Yeah. And the, there are, again, uh, the suggestion that there's liability. I think if we can keep this running, it talks about that too. So it's just contractor could grind the sidewalk and then the question is do you want to charge the resident fifty dollars when it costs the county a hundred dollars to charge them so that I mean that my my suggestion is we do grinding that should just be a service that is provided for the sidewalks that aren't you know have big problems can it be made louder so we can hear it grind, and that will take care of it yeah, that's, the hundred dollar that's what they're going to do with the new system yeah. Yeah. pictures I, I just that that whole idea of spending more to charge people than it costs to do the work it really rubs me the wrong way. I heard that line spending more to to notify people than it costs to do the work. I did hear that just now. In yeah, that statement. It, um, it, I think we'll have to hear what David Flash says too. Um, but again, you were talking about the slippery slope that if we pay for one and we may pay for another, but also after the conversation that's on here was the discussion about liability and it was stated by our county council quite clearly that the liability is not an issue because we do the we hire a contractor that does the work and whether the residents pay for it or they don't pay for it we're in the same situation we're taking that responsibility of, of hiring the contractor and the liability issue is if someone um, injures themselves uh, because of shoddy work, you know, that's something to do with the, the contractor. Manager. But if, we, if you could get it so that we could actually hear the tape, and I just asked for that because it is confirmation um, from Mr. Fleisch about the $100. And again, this, is, no. this item I, seems I, to I, be I out of order, or oh, we could try it again. We're just saying it's out of order because we haven't had the discussion about how we're going to do the billing and to make sure that it is a, certainly a much more extensive process if we want to um, notify instead of just fixing it. But it's also expensive to bill and, and the cost of grinding is pretty slight. Are you able to get it so we can hear the sound? contractor could grind the sidewalk and then the question is do you want to charge the resident fifty dollars when it costs the county a hundred dollars to charge them so that I mean that my my suggestion is we do grinding that should just be a service that is provided for the sidewalks that aren't you know have big problems with the ones that you can easily grind and that will take care of it yeah, the, the hundred dollar number was when we were doing three letters and pictures and we're 
I, I just, that, that whole idea of spending more to charge people than it costs to do the work, it really rubs me the wrong way. And so the, it was $100 when this was brought forward because they would send photos to the residents. They'd say, this is the work that needs to be done. They would document it, and um, then they would bill them, tell them what they thought it would cost. Then they sent them another one with the actual amount, and then um, if they don't pay, then they'd send them another one. And now we've established another process on top of that, which is going to uh, lean, doing liens on people's properties. And I know that we had received a report, too. This is all about a report we received that led to the vote. Um, and uh, it very clearly pointed out the most aggressive way that we can go, uh, referring to the, the direct staff to more aggressively pursue repair by property owners. <clears throat> and while we're talking about this being a, a streamlined thing, I think this is probably the, the most aggressive, most expensive way of going. And that's why the next item we were going to discuss is the process for billing. And that's why I feel like this is, you're assuming that, or I guess you're supporting the fact that we should go ahead and bill people uh, for sidewalks and we should notify them about grinding. But I don't think we've heard from staff how much it costs to bill. You know, and I, that, that I think would be helpful to have. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I just wonder, the reason I voted against it last time is because the cost of the entire unincorporated area of the county, what's it going to cost us? And we're going to add more liability from the entire county, from one end of the county to the other. This is not just one side of the county. So that was my biggest concern okay. is the additional cost that, uh, that we, it's going to be borne uh, by the county for for doing all that work. And, okay. and, and, and again, I, I'll be glad to put it to our county councils, that meeting right after I spoke and they have it on tape. Mm -hmm. very clearly pointing out the liability doesn't change. There's no difference in liability whether they pay or they don't pay. And that, that's all. I mean, just if we can just base it. But, an, but an, if an, we repair, we add more. Pardon? If, well, we, if, if we repair, if we do repairs, we could, add more could liability. You, maybe county council, could you okay. just respond? Is there any difference in the liability on, as to whether we pay or not? It doesn't hinge on whether we pay. It hinges on whether we have notice of a, of a dangerous condition. That's right. So, you know, we could run around all day with this kind of a thing. If, if you're talking, we talk about cities. Cities have some type of a assessment or something on a lot parcel that does this. If we wanted to have a policy discussion about re-putting a parcel tax or a per foot on people who have sidewalks in front of their house, I'm sure Dave could tell you which people have that, that would be different, but it's pretty hard for somebody in Ojai that doesn't have any sidewalks to pay for somebody in Oak Park for their sidewalks. But if we wanted to do something like that, where it's, you know, you pay, I don't know, a dollar a foot for your 20 feet, pay $20 a year, and it's all part of this thing, and we go and repair, and, and, the, and the county has the authority to say what needs repaired, and then they're paying for it. In the sense, they're still paying for it, but it's not coming out of this whole thing because we're trying to compare a city which has assessments to pay for this to a uh, county, it doesn't. This is a general fund issue that's going to come out of, of, of his budget. So if we wanted to do that, I don't mind coming back later and having a policy talk on that where people pay for their own sidewalks and we collect it, we repair it, we do all that for them when we think it's worthwhile. That'd be a different policy issue. But as it is right now, this is general fund. It's all, it, it, you're asking people in different parts of the county to pay for other people who don't have sidewalks. And I, I just don't see how we, how we could ask them to do that. But I, I just have to say they don't have assessments in these cities. Well, it comes yeah, from the general fund. Part of their, they use part, road funds. Yes, I mean, but it's and part of their, their stuff. they use general funds. Yeah, just from like the gas do. tax and general funds in the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I'm just saying, we, we could do that kind of thing. And so, to me, I'd rather that, just that move us along yeah. and be done with this, because that's a different thing you could bring up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, we, I, we do have some public comments. One last comment. Yeah, if I could do this. The question that Supervisor Parks is bringing up is the $100 and that it costs $100 to notify. And that I've watched that video very clearly. I've talked a lot about this whole question and stuff. So uh, all the board members received this yesterday. It's part of the question that I asked a week ago Monday, but everybody received this. I just want to read this, you know, um, into the record. It says, uh, I asked David Fleisch about the $50 cost of noticing. Now that was $50. And the $50 estimate did not come from the Transportation Department. We're not sure where the number came from. It's possible that it came from Supervisor Parks' board letter that was heard at the same time as the PWA item, which was last October. In her board letter, she states the county incurs a $100 cost per household when it fixes the sidewalks adjacent to the house. 
This cost to the county results from documenting damage to a sidewalk slab, photographing the damage, sending letters and photos of the property owner, detailing the need to repair, billing, collecting payment, and answering phone calls, which can exceed $100 per calls per household. The $100 cost may have come from a discussion with Dave in which he asked how much time cost the notification process took. It was explained that PWA does not track these costs independently, but if one took the total hours in the notification and invoicing process used, as the, used at that time and considered the number of properties, the time spent could be as much as two to three hours per property. So then this is the key point. So what is the difference in the notifying procedures that they're recommending in the case that the property owners pay for the grinding rather than the transportation department? In other words, if we do the grinding, which we, we have, this policy doesn't say we're not going to do grinding, but it's just a question of who pays for it. And it says all the notification task, and it makes sense. The documenting of the damage, going out, assessing the sidewalk, documenting the damage, taking the picture, all that stuff's got to happen whether they're paying for it or we're paying for it, right? With one exception. That exception is when the property owner pays, we must send an invoice that would otherwise not be required. So transportation never provided the $100 as the cost of just invoicing or the cost of just collecting. Transportation has come up with, it might be $100, which we have to the to the benefit of the property owners that have the sidewalks, have absorbed in the past. We haven't charged them for that, and I'm not at all suggesting we should charge them for that. But the $100 is, is, uh, is not something that, that has come from them. I think that that's important, and the cost of invoicing is, it's hard for me to imagine, the cost of just invoicing is $100. So. Okay, and the first sentence reads, I talked with Dave Fleisch about $50 cost of noticing. The $50 estimate did not come from the Transportation Department. Um, I never said 50 I was saying $100 is the process, and I explained in there, as you read, what the process is. Mr. Fleisch reiterated that's what the process cost was $100. My figures came from Mr. Fleisch. The $50 was the cost that I used of his for grinding. I mentioned $50, right? Even though the city of Thousand Oaks grinding is only $25, and now we've even got less bids than that. And when he sums up, Mr. Pratt's memo sums up, the difference is the cost to invoice, and that is a cost. And so if we could ask our department how much is that cost to invoice, that will help too. If the issue is that the cost for administering it is more than the cost of grinding. Wow. But if it isn't the issue, which I think truly is the case, Mr. Bennett, I think you just philosophically don't want to see the county paying for sidewalk repair. Is that correct? Wow. You I mean, are, you, you've you, said that, you've said you, that you, to you, me you, several times. You don't like the idea of the county paying for sidewalk repair. And if that's the issue, then let's, this other stuff to me is just details. You're, it's a philosophical question. I and have, well, and I don't I, think that, um, I'm going to jump in here because I yes. think that this board's had this discussion multiple times, and at least four of us have said our policy stands with the ordinance that says the sidewalk repairs the responsibility of the property owner. So uh, we've said it repeatedly. We've taken action repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And I have already asked Mr. Fleisch the question, does it cost $100 invoice, and he has said no. So. We, you, you keep revisiting this and coming at it a different way. It's time for us, I think, to uh, hear from the public. But I, I, I guess you don't want to answer my question. That's okay. All right, we're going to now um, open up. This is uh, for always for the public to speak, and I will invite up first Edward Villa. And we have, hold on, how many do we have? We have five, three minutes, please. Okay, move along. But it says five on here. <laughs> Anyways, hi, my, my name is Edward Villa. I've lived in the canal, Casa Canal, for over 33 years. Um, in that 33, in the first 20 years, we had nobody to go to. The guy, uh, Joe Shalilo, wouldn't answer our calls. Um, Kathy Wright, I guess it was, would answer you four months later. But anyways, the reason why I'm here is <clears throat> I can't believe it took you nine months to figure out that, that you don't like paying for grinding. I know we must take baby steps to accomplish our goals of getting our sidewalks fixed. My main want 
is to have grinding done at no cost for our residents. Most of our residents are young families just coming into our neighborhood and old people like me that are retired on a fixed income. I know someday you will get money out of us to fix our sidewalks. That's a given because I know you won't fix them for free. However, other parts of the county, uh, and I'm not going to name any names, but have got their sidewalks fixed on county budget many years ago. And we have not yet had that done. Anyways, so anyways, to make this short, I just want to say that, wow, this is great. I went to all the neighbors, since I'm part of the MAC Council, and told them, guess what? You're not going to have to pay because we're going to grind your sidewalks. And they thought that was great. Now, all of a sudden, I have to come back to them and tell them, I lied to you because Mr. Bennett decided nine months later he doesn't like this idea of having us not pay for something that we should have done anyways. And I'm just curious, if you have a problem with, with Supervisor Parks or you have an issue with her, please leave that out and try to make it fair for all of us. I'm just curious. I'd ask you to I got 59 um, seconds. I'm just curious no applause, please. if two of your other supervisors here took you out to dinner and said, hey, dude, you really got this wrong. We don't want to pay for Costco Nail sidewalks. We, have, we want them to pay for Ojai, Simi Valley, Moor Park, but we never get anything done. In the last eight years, we've had more done than I've seen in the last 33. All I ask is that I don't want to leave here disillusioned like I did nine months ago, thinking that we were going to get our sidewalks ground. And by the way, I'd like to know that if your company fixes my sidewalks and, uh, and they take the permits and they do the work, am I going to be liable for what they, they did? Or is, it your, or is the county going to be liable? Because it sounds like to me we're going to get stuck into a, to one of these situations where we're just going to get, get screwed every time. But anyways, I do want to thank you for giving me a chance to talk to you. And by the way, our taxes don't just pay Coscaneo. We pay all of Ventura County. If we could pay our taxes for just Coscaneo, we'd get our sidewalks fixed. I don't know what you were thinking, but it took you nine months to tell us no. That's going to be hard for me to go back to my uh, residence. Thank you for giving me this chance to talk to you today. Thank you, Mr. Villa. Uh, Barry Gabrielson. Hello, I'm Barry Gabrielson from Newbury Park. I'd like to uh, object for the, all the unincorporated areas in Ventura County. I'd, ask, I'd like to request to ask a board qu two questions and see if I can finally get an answer after a year and a half. Please provide me the state law, the state code, the state streets and highways code that allows a general law county to charge a residential property order in an unincorporated area for parkway trees. Streets and Highways Code, it doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Number two, give me one state law, one state law, one state court that decided that a general law county, a general law county can charge an adjacent property owner in the unincorporated area for parkway trees. One, it doesn't exist. I want to go to the federal government. The federal government. Name one federal government case that allows a general law county like Ventura to charge the adjacent property owner in an unincorporated area for parkway trees and sidewalk repair. The answer is none. Zero. The answer is zero. I'd like to go to the packet here that I gave you or... or Brian Palmer. Do I click on here? The first one? Do I? You have three minutes, Mr. Gabrielson, just a reminder. I'd, I'd, I'd like to go to your packet. I'd like to show you the track number. Can you go to the track number? Just click it. Right click. What's wrong? What's wrong? Let me go to the packet. Let me go pack it. To track number 1116-1. The map shows that we own six inches before the sidewalk. 
six inches before the sidewalk. The county owns the sidewalk, the parkway, the parkway trees, and the streets. Second map. The second map is Peak Land Surveyor. They also say that the county owns the parkway, the parkway trees, the sidewalks, and the streets. I'm going to go to quickly to ordinance number 2041. This is your ordinance, 2061. Let's read page, let's read section 12535. Let's read the last sentence. Upon planting the trees or other plants in the right of ways, they become the property of who? The adjacent property owner? That's according to Mr. Fleisch. That's according to county council. It's the county's tree. It's a county's tree. It's the county's tree roots that have destroyed our sidewalks. And it's on the parkway, which is also owned by the county. Next slide, please. Oops. Streets and Highways Code 22060. State law. Not county law. State law. The board may remove any tree or a part thereof which appears to be dead, is liable to fall, is dangerous, or is an obstruction to travel, excuse me, public travel, whether or not the tree is on any private property. The responsibility to remove the tree is not the adjacent property owner, it's U5. Mr. Sorry. Gabrielson, your time is up, sir. I have three or four charts. You did can give, I do it in you, the next you presentation? You did give us, yes, you can. Okay. And you did provide that to the board. We, uh, we all have it, too. Thank you. Pardon me? We have your packet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. William Hayes. Thank you, Chairman Long and Supervisors. I just found out about this meeting, I think, yesterday via an email. So my comment is that uh, this is very short notice. I've lived in the Cascanale area for 22 years, coming up in November, and it's uh, very short notice in coming here and trying to get things together, read stuff, so it's difficult. I know other people had more time. I haven't. I had about four hours. You missed um, our earlier conversation today. Yes, I did. Uh, but uh, as was just stated, the parkways are county maintained. The trees are county trees. I know I had to remove mine, and I had to come down here, get a permit, and then go, you know, take the trees out and all that. And then I had to, then somebody came and double-checked on it to make sure that I had a permit for it which I thought was kind of ironic. So the damage to these sidewalks, at least in my neighborhood, are primarily from roots of the trees that the county put in. And so now they're coming back and saying, hey, guys, uh, we, put the, we put the trees in, and we damaged your sidewalk, and now we're going to have you guys pay for it. That just doesn't seem fair just in general. So that's why I'd, vote, I'd urge you all to vote against it. Okay? And that's about all I really had to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Catherine Hogue. Hi, I'm Catherine Hogue. I live in the Casa Caneo tract. I've lived in the Caneo Valley for 35 years, the last 20 in Casa Caneo. I am against charging residents for sidewalk grinding. First of all, let's address who uses these sidewalks. When I go for my walks, I cover a small portion of sidewalk in front of my house. The rest of it is all the other sidewalks in front of other property owners' homes. So the public uses these, and not just our residents, but now that we have bike lanes, we have more residents coming in from other areas of the county and some of them stop and use our sidewalks. Um, secondly, I saw in this article last Sunday in the County Star that you have collected half a million more in property taxes this past year, and um, also that property owners are happily paying their taxes. More are paying than in the past. You're not having to send default notices to as many. So you're certainly getting in plenty of money. And I want to know, really, what are you doing with all that money you're getting? I understand that 8% of these taxes went to cities. 20% went 
went to your general fund with which you can adequately pay for the sidewalk grinding. Um, your minor points about the cost of notifying and knowing where the dangerous conditions are. Um, it costs very little to send out postcards notifying property owners that you're going to be grinding in front of their property, just like when you're going to sweep the streets or resurface. Um, I don't know what the, if I'm correct, if it's 29 cents per postcard or, or if it's gone up, but how many people do you really need to notify in Casa Caneo? And um, is that going to take an hour of your staffer's time? How much does that staffer earn per hour? Okay. Um, you know where the dangerous conditions are. You've gone around and marked them all on our street. So you are now aware where they are. By California law, you are responsibility, responsible for the safety of the sidewalks. Um, finally, Many of the Casa Caneo residents are seniors or young families. The seniors have lived here for many years, been paying their property taxes all along, been paying for other infrastructure, parks, park and rec centers, etc. cetera. Um, some community groups to which I belong have actually support, uh, they actually donated money for the building of the Caneo Community Center in Thousand Oaks. I urge you to please not charge us for the grinding of the sidewalks. It is not fair. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Jenny Clark. I'm going to apologize in advance for my speed reading. I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase a letter I sent to all of you earlier regarding the demographics of the Casa Conejo. Um, on my street, Lewis Drive, about 50% of our neighbors have lived there for 20 years or, or longer, a lifetime. Some of us looking at second and third generations uh, growing up there. Half of the street have raised their families there. Some, including my husband, lived on another street and popped over a couple blocks when it was time for us to raise our family. 10% are Amgen uh, flippers, they leave. Next 40% are us 20 years ago, young families who um, moved into homes selling under market because they were vacated by original or second owners, uh, not especially modernized since they were built in 1964. Families could get in for less if they were willing to roll up their sleeves. Um, I expect for the most part those 40 percenters will replace us 50 percenters um, just as we've done prior. Less than 30 percent of the homeowners on my street have college degrees. Many are retired on fixed incomes. More are just starting out in the early stages of their income potential. Many driveways are filled with trucks of trade. What we lack in brand new cars we make up for in fishing boats and camping trailers. Part of the nice uh, thing about living in unincorporated. Um, none of us care about sidewalks. Uh, the kids like them for their skateboards and their scooters to do their kick flips. Um, we can see where we're walking. We can step over cracks. We spend our time thinking about when to work new tires into our budget, when the Boy Scout meetings are, how to pay for summer camp at the Y, or when to add air conditioning to our archaic homes that we love. We eat at the Alamo more than Mastro's, so that's where you're going to find us. Um, I'm going to come back to my closing comments because I want to address a couple of the new ones that came up. Notification. By all means, notify me. Um, alleviate your liability. Send me an affidavit, a waiver. I'll sign it in blood because I don't trust you anymore. There's been a lot of shenanigans the past 20 years, very shady things going on. I personally wouldn't want to look outside and see anyone touching anything because I'm afraid I'm going to get a bill for it that's going to exceed my income for the year. Um, administrative costs. I guarantee you, Supervisor Bennett, you'll well exceed $100 in chasing my money down. I'll make it very painful in, in proving that point. Um, additional process will be in place, liens, uh, invoicing. You'll have to chase me down. The reason people are paying those bills for the most part is because the level of education and caliber of people you're dealing with in the Casa Conejos would rather pay you than get chased down. So it's really a hostage and tyranny situation. Liability of the county, um, my son had a pebble fall in his eye from a tree when he was five, and we're the kind of people that don't sue for that type of thing, so that, that was a done deal. Um, took him inside, washed his eye, he was fine. A couple weeks later, same tree fell in the neighbor's car. Uh, we went ahead and went through insurance and paid for that. So again, we're not the type of people who are going to come up to the county for acts of God. 
Um, if you're worried about safety, then maybe you should start looking at trees falling over. There was a tree that fell over at Walnut School a couple years ago. Would have taken out probably 20 kids had it been during school hours. A lot more dangerous than the sidewalks. Um, loopholes. Don't even get me started. I had a 1964 protected Monterey pine in my backyard um, that I was happy the county was protecting until Southern California Edison came in, hacked it half to death, made it fall over, and no one here returned a call to me. So it seems to me that Supervisor Parks is a little generous with you when it comes to her feeling that your philosophy is just about sidewalks. I think it's about getting into our neighborhood to find out how you can make more than 100 bucks. Um, I appreciate Supervisor Foy's suggestion that maybe this needs to be talked about a little bit further. So I'm going to close with my closing remarks in my letter that I sent earlier. Before any further sidewalk decision is made, why don't we respectfully request a sidewalk repair committee, including cost Canal homeowners, so that we can understand the process in full and discuss things that fix us, that affect us, competitive bidding, what types of people will we see in our neighborhoods to avoid scams, homeowner options for a compliant self-repair so we don't get a bill later that we didn't do it the right way and you have to redo the work, homeowner options for other types of services, ensuring open communication paths between the county and homeowners. Such a committee could begin with establishing a clear understanding of who legally owns these parkways and why they have become such a popular focus of the board. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, board members, that uh, concludes the comments on this item. This is again item 26. Can I just, Any uh, questions? Yeah, yes. I did have a question for staff. Okay. And Mr. Pratt, or. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Fly, it, it, your res Mr. Pratt um, pointed out that uh, invoicing process uh, time spent would be about two to th three hours per property. That's to uh, notice and invoice a, pri a property is two to three hours of staff time. Um, how much is it in that two to three hours is spent in invoicing and how much in noticing? Again, that statement was based upon what we were doing previously, not what we're proposing to do. And we, we don't track hours of all of those things. You, you can't tell us how much it costs to invoice the whole procurement, I mean, um, billing, getting the money, charting it. Uh, yeah, I have no you way to track you don't know that. How it's, much a, money. it's an overhead cost. We don't track by item, by individual thing like that. But when he wrote two to three hours per property, how much does that individual make approximately? The, the two to Trees, $100 an hour blended rate when we're doing these kind of off-the-top uh, estimates. Uh, my own opinion is that the cost of the invoicing is small because most of that's automated. The other costs, the bigger costs, are associated with uh, those things listed in that email. So how, how much do you think small? I don't know. I'd have okay. to ask our county people. But because right. it's invoiced and it's, a big, it's part of a big package, right. okay. um, it's negligible compared I, to that. I, it seems to be that's kind of what I'm understanding of being part of the... The, the issue here. Thank you, Mr. Pratt. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, Excuse me, Mr. Pratt, while you're up, if you oh, would, if whenever you're, if you're finished. Go ahead. You say it's negligible. Is, is, it, a, is it anywhere near $100? No, no. It, I don't even think it would be near 10 because the process is automated. It goes out as a package. It's Thank you. And, and again, the, as I wrote and I stated, the county incurs a $100 cost per household when it fixes the sidewalk adjacent to the house. The cost of the county results from documenting damage to a sidewalk slab, photographing the damage, sending letters and photos to the property owner detailing the need to repair, billing, collecting payment, answering phone calls from residents, which can exceed 100 calls per neighborhood. And as I, we showed on the tape, Mr. Fleisch did say that's what that $100 was for. So I don't think um, that is an issue. And, and to try to uh, make that your argument that that 100 came out of nowhere is, is wrong. It, it was confirmed by Mr. Fleisch. We also know that liability um, stated by our county council um, is not an issue. So uh, uh, that to me is a, a red herring because it doesn't impact whether residents pay or not. And uh, I'll go ahead, and if I can go to the PowerPoint, because um, this is something that is such a positive thing it started off with, and you see these residents' expectations. There are those who have pink dots in front of their homes that are very excited. 
the pink dots mean they get grinding and the county is going to do it for free. Um, and so it's, it, to me, it's just uh, taking something very positive. Uh, we've had, from my understanding, bids as low as $15 to grind for a household. Do it, you know? How, but let, this is just to, to look at the numbers. So um, this was the slide that I showed on February 2014. And I'm just putting it here because, uh, again, this called for, I think, another motion to reconsider. But the, the cost to homeowners, $50. The cost to county to bill homeowners, $100. And that was reiterated in that tape we just played, which was from October 2014. Just take Casa Conejo. Approximately 400 homes there need sidewalk repair. Approximately 75% can be fixed by grinding, and those are the guys with the pink dots. They've already done all the work. They've already analyzed it and figured out all the sidewalks that need to be done. To repair, again, $15 to grind, or could be $50 each. That's the number that we used last time. City of Thousand Oaks, $25. So to repair with grinding, those 300 sidewalks will cost about, four, if you take the low bid, $4,500 for the 300 sidewalks, or 15,000 um, if you use the $50 number. To administer, that's when they went out there and they've already done that work, as was pointed out. They've already gone out there and found which sidewalks need grinding and which need replacing. And uh, to do that, including the billing, if we're going to bill, will be $100 each. That equals $30,000 for those 300 sidewalks. In this case, because this is what they did, they went out there and did all that work, the cost to bill is at least twice if it's to up to six times the cost of the repair. So it's twice as much. Um, if you go with the 15000 or the $50 each to grind. So the billing is going to cost twice as much. So how do you take a $15,000 sidewalk project, that was if you grind all 300 sidewalks, and turn it into a $45,000 project? You make the residents pay the 15000 and you spend 30000 getting the payment. Residents have weighed in, and unfortunately we did hear about this on Thursdays when I found out about it, to be heard on Tuesday. Casa Caneo Mac has written two letters over the past year. The Oak Park Mac has written letters on this. There's been articles in the newspaper on this. So people had, you know, this very positive feel. They've been notified this is going to happen, and to pull the rug out and actually wait until after this agenda item to do the work, which I think was deliberately the case, it is a loss of goodwill. And being able to not, not being able to know about this item in advance, there's communities out there that didn't get notified because it was kind of a surprise. There's a loss of trust in government. And finally, if it, it does cost more, it's wasting tax dollars. So to me, there, the real question is, is, you know, do you want to have the government pay for sidewalks repair? And even when it costs the government more, do you still want the residents to pay for it? Even when it costs more to the government, you still want to make the residents pay for it if the residents don't pay for it, it will be less to the government. And I, that, the reason why I'm going to this point is because this is the point that was made that caused the three to vote to approve the free grinding. And now we know that grinding is even going to be less. So um, I, I just, you know, the idea that you were led to believe something different, I don't believe that's the case. The information has not changed. And if you want to make it uh, the way everybody else does it, probably in the state of California, I wouldn't be surprised if we're the only one, <laughs> and just you know, do the work. And if the residents didn't want the grinding, well, they can replace the slab themselves. But if you do want to notice, you're still going to end up having it be cheaper in the long run to grind and 
not have the residents pay. Does that conclude your PowerPoint? That concludes my PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, board members, I've had a request by a constituent to um, public member to speak. So if there's no objection, I'll open it up for uh, one last speaker um, and, and three minutes, Mr. Toomey. And, um, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richard Toomey. I'm the chair of the Casa Conejo MAC, and I want to echo the sentiments of my fellow residents, also the vice chair of the MAC, Ed V. Jr. Uh, I'm quite disappointed, quite honestly. Uh, without advance notice, uh, Supervisor Bennett put an item on the agenda today to reverse his vote from October 2014, which approved for the county paying for sidewalk repairs. To me, this is a violation of our trust. Uh, I'd like to ask that the Board of Supervisors reject Supervisor Bennett's effort. I'd like the board to vote no on Supervisor Bennett's motion to reconsider the October 2014 approval of the grinding of public sidewalks at no cost. I'd like you to stick to your decision. It's the less costly way to proceed. It's what the residents want. It's what we were promised. The board has set expectations with us. Ultimately, this is about integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, it's back to the board. Um, no more public comments on this item. Back to the board. Any questions for staff? I don't have questions. But I do have comments, uh, okay. obviously. Right. Um, and since it's been introduced into the record, um, I would like to call Supervisor Park's PowerPoint back up, please. And while that's coming up, uh, let me just say this, that uh, I can understand completely why the residents uh, would be here and be feeling the way they feel based on the information, for example, that is included in, the, in, in this PowerPoint. Consistently, we've had the MACs in the unincorporated area that have communicated to us on this, and most residents that have communicated to us, consistently, the residents have said they want the county to pay for all of the side rock repair. I think that uh, that's, that's been the consistent message when we had this item come before us at that point in time. The question in front of us today, right now, is, who will pay the 15, and Mr. Fleisch has said it's 15 to $75, I believe, for the grinding cost um, uh, that we have. And um, I want to be uh, very clear while we're, while we're waiting, for, uh, before I go to this, I want to be very clear that what s stimulated me, who I was reluctant to, for us to start down this road, but it was the implication, not just the implication, but the statement that we would actually save money if we did this, and I heard the gentleman, the last gentleman to just speak, the president of the MAC say, it, it saves money, why would you not do this? And that's sort of what I said, right? And, uh, and, uh, I, and I would offer to you, that's what's still being presented to you with this PowerPoint. So if we go, why don't you give it, there I've got the slides here, let's go here. All right, so first of all, th th this slide, right? Cost $100 to collect payment, right? And we just heard, our staff say it doesn't cost $100 to invoice. The invoicing is the least expensive part of this. The, the more expensive stuff is the stuff you do whether you're going to bill the residents or whether we're going to pay for it or not. So, but it keeps being, being presented as cost to county to bill the homeowner. We heard Mr. Pratt say it's probably, they don't know for sure, but he would be surprised if it was $10, right? It's it. A few minutes ago, he, he, he said it was de minimis. He said it was de minimis, the cost of the invoice relative to the $100. He actually said that, but, if you, and, and, but that's not what you still were communicating to the residents as you did this I PowerPoint. I heard two to three hours of staff time at that, $100 that, that is hour. true. That's not to invoice. That's to do everything. Mm -hmm. And that is where your math does not add up. And that's where these residents are be thinking that there's a cost savings here. If you take a look at this example here, right, to repair the 300 slabs is 15 to 50. It really should be 15 to 75, which would make it, you know, between 4,500 and probably closer to $20,000. But let's say it's somewhere in between those two, right? Administered billing and collections for 300 homes is not 
I repeat, is not $100 each and $30,000. If we go to the next agenda item... I have this. I did not interrupt you once while you were on. All right? It is not $100. And it has been clearly stated by staff. I asked them that multiple times on Monday. Let when they, when, and that's why I brought this item. I know the residents are going, why did I change? I changed because I got new information. It is not $100 to administer the billing. It is $100 total. That's to go out, to mark the sidewalks, to do all of that. And staff, please, if I'm saying that wrong, I, I don't want to even have to call you up and say that. But it's to do all everything. It's not just to send an invoice. Staff has said it is either de minimis or whatever. And the vast majority of people pay their invoice. So now where it's 300 homes and the vast majority of them pay them, for example, today we only have 25 people that we are collecting on, and that was over far more than 300 people, all right, that we had. So let's say it's 25 people, and let's say it is a $100. That's $2,500, not $30,000. It is just factually wrong to say that. And so it is not a cost of $30,000 plus $15,000. We are paying nearly the whole $30,000 anyway, and we've been absorbing that for as long as we've had this policy. We've been paying the cost of going out, checking the sidewalks, sending the notification. We've been doing that anyway, and we will do that whether we bill the residents or whether we pay for the grinding ourselves. That $30,000 is a sunk cost. Let's subtract two or 3,000 from it and call it $27,000, right? It is a sunk cost that we already have. Now the question is, and what was implied to us, was we could save the $30,000 if we would pay the $15,000 to grind the sidewalks, and there would be a net savings there. And that savings evaporated a week ago Monday when staff pointed out, and I believe they're right, that we still have to do all the notification except for invoicing. So there is not a savings as I thought there was going to be. And it's my responsibility to own up to that to the taxpayers and say there is not a savings. So when Supervisor Parks keeps trying to say there's some other reason, that is the reason. And I hope the public, you're understandably upset because this is all you've heard. And you're hearing inaccurate factual information. It may cost twice as much, as she says, for the whole enchilada, but those are sunk costs that we have whether we charge you or whether we don't charge you. So in reality, if we're just looking at taxpayer dollars, if we charge the residents $15,000, then we don't have, then we have the $30,000 cost, but we don't have the $15,000 cost, and you have a, 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 a $30,000 charge here, not a $45,000 charge. The only way is a $45,000 charge is to follow the policy that Supervisor Parks is recommending, which is we pay for the grinding and we pay this $30,000 in sunk cost. Could I have my PowerPoint up, please, now? And I'm sorry to, to, I mean, I would like to, 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 to not have to do it this way, but that is, I mean, when you get the factually inaccurate information, residents come, and the same thing happened to us uh, with the Santa Rosa. People didn't have accurate information about the parking fee, and so they were, they, they, they understandably have this kind you of want reaction. You Santa Rosa Park? When, com when compared to the $100 cost to, this is from Supervisor Parks, this is in a message that she sent, I don't know how the message, but residents contacted me with this message. So this is what Supervisor Parks sent us, and it says, when compared to the $100 cost to bill homeowners and collect payment, estimates are the grinding can be done for as little as $15. This is in a Facebook post of Supervisor Parks this past weekend also. It will actually cost taxpayers mo more if we charge. That is not true. It will cost taxpayers more if we don't charge because we're going to pay the sunk cost as well as this. The only thing we'll save is an invoice cost of a de minimis amount. This is the other thing that her Facebook page said. Do you, and she, if, if this question is posed to any average taxpayer in Ventura County, they would be here like you good people are. Do you think the county... The ta that is the taxpayer should incur a hundred dollars in billing costs just to get homeowners to pay fifteen dollars sidewalk repair bill. That is not a fair or accurate 
representation of the decision in front of the board. It and it's not accurate information being given to the public. This is accurate information from our staff. I asked the question and it, the answer from Mr. Pratt that I would give in last Monday and I have in writing here for us, I asked, what's the, he asked, he said, what's the difference in noticing procedures in the case that the property owners pay for grinding rather than the transportation department? So if, in other words, if we do, what is the cost if we charge you versus if we charge ourselves? This is the answer. All the notification tasks, that's documenting the damage to the sidewalk slabs, sending the letters to the property owners, detailing the need to repair, billing, answering phone, are the same with one exception, the invoice. All of them are the same with one exception, the invoice. It's just, there is not a cost savings here. So I ask myself, now I do go to the philosophical thing, was I willing to do sidewalks if it was going to save us money? With the, it was, was I willing to grind the sidewalks if it was going to save us money? The answer was yes. Huh. Am I willing to grind sidewalks if it's not going to save us money, but it's actually going to cost us more? The answer is no. And I'll tell you why no. Because I have consistently said to this board, as we've had multiple conversations about the sidewalk issue, that my philosophy is that we should make sure we get sidewalks to people who need sidewalks before we start spending the limited funds that we have repairing existing sidewalks. And this is the point that I would like to make. This is Sadequa, and not everybody agrees with this. I mean, it's fine for us to disagree, um, but, but we shouldn't take it to this other level, I, I believe at all. This is Sadequa, right? Those residents, if we have funds, I would spend road funds or general funds, if we're going to devote them to sidewalks, I would spend them to get these people sidewalks who have kids that need to get to school and to ride, etc. Those properties will go up in value if they have a sidewalk, which is part of the justification for saying having sidewalks Making the and, and 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 I would say to those property owners, hey, you're going to get a sidewalk, but you're going to eventually have to pay to repair it. This is Nylon Acres. These kids in Nylon Acres walk in the street because they can't walk down here with all of those obstacles. Nobody logically walks between these parked vehicles and that narrow area. But if we turn that into a sidewalk, those mailboxes would be gone, those other obstacles would be gone, and they would have a sidewalk. If we have extra money, the extra property tax that was referred to, or if we're going to spend more money for grinding, I would prefer to put sidewalks into Nyland Acres or El Rio or for this kid getting off the bus onto this, which in some of our neighborhoods, they would not tolerate at all having this. They would insist on sidewalks. So I'm sorry to uh, uh, bring it to this, but that is, what the, I think, the only way to try to respond to people who think we are wasting we're spending extra money for the grinding in, in, in this situation. We will be spending extra money if we both grind and uh, do the notification. And I think to keep portraying the $100 cost as the billing cost when you keep hearing that the invoice cost is much less than $100, it's de minimis, is exactly what is in causing the real problem with this issue. Not everybody will agree. Um, thank you very much, but that's why I... Learn your integrity with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, back to the board. We have um, keep your comments. Um, you know, we have added so much to the notification process. Um, as I was reading in the 2001 report, um, we had an option to get aggressive with sidewalks. And board members, we've gotten aggressive with sidewalks. The next item is about doing liens. We've never done a lien before on sidewalks, and don't think that is free to do. How many times does that lien come to our Board of Supervisors? That's three times. The way we described getting aggressive, we had different options to choose from, is to direct staff to more aggressively pursue repair by property owners. This would require staff to survey each area, mark areas of need of repair, issue numerous notices to repair each affected property owner. Property owner failed to commence repair. PWA must not less than 10 days after the first notice issue a second notice of repair. Should the property owner still fail to commence and we complete the necessary repairs, PWA would cause repairs to be made by contract or in-house forces at the construction of work 
Each such property owner would be sent in an invoice. If the invoice were not paid, the board would be requested to approve placement of a lien on each such property. This alternative requires the PDWA to front the initial cost of repair. Appeals to the board for the amount of the lien may be anticipated. The administrative and record keeping requirements are extensive and beyond the resources of the current staffing levels in PWA. Unless staff is supplement or diverted the current projects to increase the workload, we have become more aggressive. And yes, in order to build a residence, you have to go and document it and send that. They were sending photos. I don't know if they're still sending the photo, but they're doing the documentation all the way into October 2014. That was the process we were doing. The next item on our agenda is to look at it. Do we want to have that kind of aggressive board action requiring residents to pay for grinding to me um, will cause an extensive amount of documentation that's not necessary. The mayor of Thousand Oaks has grinded sidewalks. The supervisor <laughs> for District 2 has grinded sidewalks. We've never been asked. They just go in and fix them. And you know, that saves at least $100 because they don't have to document it, send several notices. Now going to the part of doing liens, it is expensive. And you are fooling yourself if you think that hasn't been done. In Casa Caneo, how do you, we know that every sidewalk has been checked? Because they've got marks on them. They've already spent that money. And it wasn't de minimis $10. And it includes the work of finding out which sidewalks need to be done. And now it will require the billing if you're going to go ahead and charge it. And then after they don't pay, going back at them and then going back at them for liens. So I think it's, um, for one, we've asked over and over how much of those three hours that you are spending per property to deal with it because they have to be charged now. Um, I'm not getting that information. You're saying it costs $10. Yeah, it probably does cost 49 cents to send a notification in the mail. It's the collecting of the money. It's the documenting, and that's the issue. We don't need to do that. And if you want to, if you want to be unlike everybody else, we were because we didn't allow grinding. Now we're going to do grinding and do this, you know, welcome wagon. <laughs> here's your bill, and here, here's the, the lift and all that. Um, that is going to be more expensive. But overall, we're talking 15 $25 to grind a sidewalk, we certainly um, are going to lose money in the long run. And you can say Supervisor Parks is wrong, but you don't know, and we're not going to know until we have the information afterwards. But I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going after you personally, <coughs> Mr. Bennett. Um, you want to start talking about Santa Rosa Park, um, and you're telling people I'm misinformed on that. Um, I think you're going over the top here because what we're just talking about right now are sidewalks and whether it's going to cost more or not. And you have your opinion, I have mine, and um, I don't think we're going to actually know until the work is done. But I'll tell you right now, they've already spent a considerable amount of money already determining what needs to be grinded and what doesn't. Okay. Madam Chair, I'm not sure it's going to help a lot, but I just want one thing for the record, and that is if we want to be like Thousand Oaks, you're right, we don't have to do all of the notification of all, all of that other stuff. This board has clearly said that's not what we're willing to do. And we, were in, we, we said, so it means we are going to notify because we are going to keep charging the residents. And so if that is the case, you, 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 we're, 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 that, this comparison, you say, is just not an accurate. We we, if the board is going to keep charging, then we're going to have to keep notifying. And if we're going to have to keep notifying, then you can't turn around and say the notification costs will be saved if we don't charge the residents. Because it, they, they will, it, they, it won't be saved. That's what is, is just another example of not presenting the information in a way that uh, that accurately portrays the, the the question in front of us i believe but okay, i don't I, think we'll ever get any 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 resolution to that so i will fight no more forever as they say i'm done with my speaking on this I'm, thank you. I'm, I'll, I'll be happy and i vote. would just say that i will be voting against the item on the next agenda item 27 i guess it is if we're going to go through all this rigmarole for a 20 dollar $15 grind. And I think that's why we should have heard that item first, because it makes a lot more sense to decide what is the process we want in billing before we make the decision that we're going to charge people because of the process. We haven't determined the process yet until the next item. Any other questions? 
Okay. This item is before the board. Um, I, when this was uh, placed on the agenda, I asked to meet with public works staff so I could understand it. And, and Mr. Um, Pratt's memo out to the board that has been talked about a couple, couple times now from the dais um, said the same thing to me, that the board erred in, um, in looking at a, a, a process that was going to, quote, save money. Um, and, and I'll say back when we had a very lengthy discussion and we moved down a 3-2 vote, to touch this process, we all knew it was risky because so you touch it, you own it. And um, the reason this is on the agenda ahead of the next agenda item is because if we stay with the policy that was put in place in October, then, then it changes the discussion on the next agenda item. Um, we asked the staff to do a report out. That's what's coming to us. And the staff, as I understand it, what the markings are in Casa Caneo is really their due diligence in starting to do the work to assess what needs to be done. Um, and, and, and we asked them to do that. So um, that's, I think, although you, you, this, this seems um, well, costs were going to be incurred one way or the other. The assessment needed to be done. And this board has held strong. Again, we've had numerous... Um, items before us over the years on sidewalks and the board has not changed its position. We are not a city. Um, we, we have different revenue streams and we don't always have. Uh, we are fortunate in the last few years for a variety of reasons, good management, good leadership by the CEO and, and the board to have um, be in a different fiscal condition. But that fiscal condition always relies on on um, not committing to something that is non-sustainable or has a uh, long-term commitment that um, will continue to be uh, an expense to the county and all of the taxpayers. Um, and hence, that's why that, that ordinance has been upheld all these years. Um, so it's before us for, for action, this right. item 26. I'd like to move the recommended action. Just note the county used to pay for sidewalks when uh, they had money, and then they didn't have money, and now they have money again. And there's a. Uh, Can I just clarify for the record? Yeah, yes. tens of millions in our no, refunds. Well, because the board's already there's four recommended actions. The board's already really approved one and two, which was the okay motion to reconsider, so, and you've reheard it. So it'd be recommendations rec three, and three and four. Three and four, yeah. So I move right. move recommendations three and four of the of the board letter. And specifically, that's to charge for grinding, but to allow for grinding. Correct? Supervisor Parks, you can read this right here. Well, I'm, I'm just, for the public just, record and transparency. Please. The motion is, is to continue to allow for grinding, but have the residents pay for it. Correct? You want to have Mr. our clerk read, read the motion, please, uh, clerk? It's to deny motion number one and the recommendation to authorize staff to perform sidewalk grinding as a temporary repair measure in situations where staff concludes that grinding is the appropriate remedy and where grinding is performed, the cost shall be borne by the property owner in the manner of other sidewalk repairs. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. <coughs> That passes four to one. Then we, now we, we will, now we sidewalks. will, you pardon me? Okay, um, please, um, the item, the item is, is, is done. We've heard from you. We have heard on this item many times um, regarding, and we're going on now to the next item, which is a continued discussion on um, the sidewalks. And you have an opportunity to speak again. It's on item 27. And it's the updated report that we asked staff to bring back to us on the out of repair sidewalk process. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Long, members of the board, Mr. Powers, for the record. I'm Dave Fleisch with the Public Works Agency Transportation Department. 
The item before you this morning actually is to provide you an update on actions directed by your board at the March 10th meeting regarding the report of sidewalk repairs and costs and the lien process and to conduct a public hearing in the attached report on the attached report of sidewalk repairs and costs. In addition, I will present the proposed notification and a payment process for the future projects for your consideration. Uh, first, I'll take the, the two items uh, to update you on where we are from the March 10th item. On March 10th, uh, your board directed or uh, approved the report of costs with the exception of two properties, but directed a 90-day grace period that we notice property owners one more time and offer a five-year payment plan. This was accomplished. For the 33 properties on the March 10 report of repairs and costs, letters were sent on March 18th with the following response. No one responses. No one requested a, re a payment plan. Eight property owners paid in full, and 25 we received no responses. So notices of lien were sent in, in uh, late June, or in early July, I'm sorry. Um, and note that of those, uh, those eight payments I mentioned, two of those came after the notices of, notices of lien were sent, and one of them came last Thursday. So you'll notice a discrepancy of one number in the board letter from what I just told you. We received a payment on Thursday. Um, so those, those 25 have been turned over to the auditor controller for processing and then will be uh, transferred to the tax collector to be put on the next regular tax bill. <clears throat> with respect to the two properties that you directed that we work with the property owners, the status is as follows. For Mr. Riggs, we had multiple conversations via email and phone and um, offered what the options available to him were. Um, as of this date, he indicated no preference for, uh, uh, for any of those property or any of those off options, nor did he request a payment plan, um, and he also did not make any payments. For Mr. Ritter, his concern was that the ADA ramp that was installed by the Public Works Agency under contract caused the damage. I personally met with Mr. Ritter, walked him through uh, th what the issue was and what, what caused the damage, and at the end of that, we concluded that that the ramp was not the cause, that it was normal uh, issues with the sidewalk. Uh, he requested an invoice. We invoiced them again, and uh, they've made a partial payment, but to date, oh, what's remaining on that report of cost. In addition, in our review, uh, we determined that there was an, a property that we had inadvertently left off the report of cost in March. Um, it was an old uh, contract that was missed in 2007, and so there are three properties um, on the report of costs. So the request is to confirm that report and direct and direct us to transfer that to the um, auditor controller uh, for to the tax collector. So if you'd like me to move on, I can go through the process, and then you you can address all of the issues at once. Could you tell us how it's different, how it's streamlined? Yes, ma'am. I hope to do that in the presentation. Okay. Um, in a, to preface this, to, to, to start to answer that question, we had several different processes that we covered um, in the, or that were used in the period from 2008 to 2013 um, in the different projects that were done. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we started out noticing nine months ahead, and then we told them three months, and then we sent pictures. We did a lot of extra notification uh, in the, in the um, idea that the more notice we gave, the better it was. Um, what we didn't do very well in that process is to identify what is required through the State Street and Highway Code and our ordinance and follow that process. And so this process very closely mirrors what the State Code directs us to do and doesn't add a whole bunch of extra steps in the process, which is what we had done previously. And that, that's so that we can do liens, correct? So the county can do liens? Well, the, the goal is that we notice the property owners and they pay. The only reason there would be a lien is if for some reason the property owner doesn't pay. We have no other remedy um, to collect other than to do that, unless your board chooses to give us a different uh, process. But when we brought this in March, the direction was to lien. So, um, so these are basically the process steps. Um, as I said previously, we had multiple different ways we did this. Um, we did, a, as, we, as we've done with numerous things in the Public Works Agency, we did a process improvement analysis on this, looked at what the requirements were, looked at what we were doing, uh, looked at how we could use technology to, uh, to make this process as simple as we possibly can. These are the basic steps, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, 
because the uh, current ordinance requires the uh, that the the, pro the property owners have responsibility for sidewalk maintenance, we, we have to go out and do an evaluation. When we're out there and, and we look, we go out and do that evaluation, and we determine whether or not there's repair uh, capability um, based upon how much the lift is or whether it requires replacement based on the county standards, which we published earlier this year. Uh, in addition, um, most sidewalk um, damage is, doesn't show up uh, from a um, mystery sort of perspective. It's generally caused by something, and in the majority of the cases, and you heard that from several folks earlier, it has to do with trees. And so at the time we hire an arborist, we go out, we, we look at the trees and make a determination whether the street trees, again, that are the property owner's responsibility, um, it, it, can we uh, trim and prune the roots to, to fix the problem? If we do that, does it make the tree unstable? And we get arborist reports on those trees before we go through that process. What One of the things we need to do that for is if we're going to have the contractor do the work, I have to be able to give them quantities. How many lineal feet of grinding? How many square feet of replacement? How many trees need to be removed or root, uh, roots need to be pruned? So that is all necessary to make the determination what work, if any, needs to be done. What we were doing previously was sending a letter three to six months before the contract went out to bid, and then once we got the, the bid, then we sent another letter. That first letter is essentially not necessary, and in fact is sort of counter to what the Street and Highway Code requires, which is a fairly short notification. So what we're proposing here is we send the first letter out um, after the project bid opening, because we will then know what the actual costs are, the dollars per uh, square foot and the cost for tree removal are, um, so that we can put an accurate cost for the property owners in the letter that we send. Those will go out after the bid opening, which is about 45 days before the construction would begin. Uh, residents at this point will receive one of three notices. We have these set up as template letters. We have a database that we've est established. It's a spreadsheet that put, has the CITUS address, all of the appropriate information that we've collected in the pre-evaluation process. And it becomes a matter of once this is done, we put in the um, we, we put in what the unit costs are, and and run the mail merge, and out come all the letters. And the residents will get one of three letters based upon what is going on. If it's just grinding, uh, they would get a letter that says th that it's a temporary repair that the county will do at our expense. Be advised that you're probably going to have to replace it in the near future. Uh, if you don't want to do anything, just don't say anything, and we'll do the grinding. If you would like it replaced for a more permanent solution, please let us know, and then we can make that adjustment to, uh, to, to the work in front of that given house. Um, if it's a replacement only, a letter that states that, there are some cases where there could be some replacement requirements and some grinding in front of the same property, so we've got a template letter for that, and all of them include tree removal if necessary. Mr. Fleisch, if, if the board... Um decides to adopt the proposal that you have here, I assume based on a previous action that we just took, this, the one thing that would change it would be grinding with the option to replace and under, instead of it, the bracket saying county expense, it would be their expense, both of those, right? For, for the letters, yes, yeah. sir. Great, thank you. Once the project's been done and, and completed, so approximately two weeks after the project is complete, we would send a first payment due notice in an invoice, and again, that's that's uh, something that we pull right out of that existing spreadsheet. We've got a template in a letter and an invoice, and so it's a matter of printing those and putting them in an envelope and mailing them. We actually are working this through our central services, who are our fiscal folks who do this all the time for lots of things anyway, instead of my staff doing something that we don't normally do. And we, re we allow 60 days from the date of notice for the property owners to pay. At the end of that 60-day period, we want a reconciliation report. Anybody who hasn't paid, we send out a second notice, give them 30 days. At the end of that, another reconciliation report is done, and a notice of hearing, much like was sent for this meeting today, is sent out. So, and Dave, they basically have 90 days to pay the, the bill? Technically, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, so, but that would require two letters. <laughs> And, and part of that's we want to give people the benefit of the doubt that, you know, maybe they didn't understand or so forth. Uh, so that's the notification to get it to your board. And then there's the board hearing process, which is pretty much what we did on March 10th and what, we've, what we're doing today for the previous items. Uh, if your board approves the report of uh, repairs and costs, then we, we forward those to the, uh, 
to the auditor controller, and then those go to the tax collector. It is important to note in these that if the public hearing that we have is before the 1st of June, they'll go on the November tax bill. If it's after the 1st of June, it would go on the following November tax bill. So it could be anywhere from 5 to 15 to 17 months before they get the bill for it for the lien if they didn't pay. And just very simply, this is a, a, a timeline that shows from the time they first um, receive a notice to, uh, to the time that it would come to your board for, um, for a lien, should that be necessary. It would be about 200 days or so, um, about seven months, and about half of that is from the construction beginning to when the first notice sent, and then, and then the rest of it is, you know, the follow-on. So the streamlining is shortening the window in which all this occurs, but it's basically the same system without the photographs and adding liens at the end. In the sense that you are going ahead and documenting it, you're sending out a letter, and then you're sending out a, that they're going to have to pay, and then doing the work, and then collecting the payment. We've eliminated several notification steps. The other thing that we used to do, which we didn't have any authority to do, was offer payment plans, and then we had to chase people who didn't make payments. And right. so we stopped all of that process. We, we before didn't do what the Street and Highway Code directed us to do, which is after a notice of payment, bring it to your board for further action. So we were a lot of our we were chasing a lot of things that we really didn't need to do. So we've taken all of that out. The other thing that we've done is connected the invoicing process, the front end process, and the notification process all in one database where before we had that in two or three different places. So now once the noticing or once the original um, assessments are done, all of the all the information and data is put together, and then the rest of the noticing becomes a very simple process. We weren't and, doing and that I before. think I heard you say we're eliminating the payment plan option. Um, the board has the option to offer that as part of the lien process. I don't have any authority to offer, or the Street and Highway Code does not give us the authority to offer a payment plan outside of the lien okay. process. So that's, that's part of the streamlining. We've gotten rid of that uh, payment plan option, but we do have the lien potential at the end. Correct. We always had the lien potential. We just never uh, did. Of being able to pay your lien and, op, you know, to have an Correct. option before you have to get a lien on your property. I think that's what the board did before. So that's our proposed process. Um, we have used a couple of similar versions of, of this as we've winnowed it down for a couple of uh, projects within the last year or so, but not really with, um, you know, with, with it all laid out this way. And we have a, a fairly significant project coming up in the Casa Caneo area that we should go out to bid in the late fall that we plan to use this on. That'll be the first project that we would use this process. But Madam Chair, Dave, yes. you're going to have this process in any, whether it's construction, grinding, or it could be any other uh, county billing for that matter. Could you're be talking a, about with, with respect to sidewalks? Yeah, well, no, just in anything. In respect to sidewalks, you, you have a percentage of people that are not going to pay, whether it's trees, grinding, whether it's whatever, or whether it's a, a, a lien for a code compliance issue or whatever, but we still have people that are not going to pay regardless. I, I would presume that's true, yes, sir. Like yeah. anything else, people don't, some people don't pay, but I don't have any knowledge of that specifically. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea how much it costs to do that? To do this process? Yes. Um, no, ma'am. Again, we don't collect our administrative costs, and part of the challenge I have is there's about six or seven different people involved in this, the engineer and the, or the technician that goes out on the front end. Um, I can tell you that, you know, to, to produce 100 letters and mail them is, you know, not much time now. Mm -hmm. We electronically sign them. It's not like i got to sit there and sign 100 letters by hand. It's all done electronically, so it's fairly quick. Um, you know, we're trying to, trying to maximize use of technology and do this in, in the least costly way that we can. And uh, it's something that we weren't able to do probably and the, 10 years ago. And the uh, lien process, does it require two board hearings to put liens on people's properties? Just one, ma'am. One? Yes, ma'am. And do you, I guess that's a separate notice on the liens, too, would be a separate notice. Um, it's the notice gets after the second payment due and we give the 30 days, we send a notice of intent to lien. That comes to your board. Uh, should you choose to allow us to lien the property, um, then that report of cost goes to the auditor controller, and there's actually a formal lien notice that the property owner gets. But again, it's 
it's a form that we fill out and send very quickly. Is that it? That's it, ma'am. We've covered it. Any other questions? We do have public speakers. And this is a public hearing. Okay, I'll open up the public hearing on item 27 um, and invite Barry Gabrielson up first. And we have three minutes. The current California Streets and Highways Code written in 1955 and 1957, was 941A and 1806. That was written for housing tracks. The boards using Streets and Highways Codes 5600, to 5600 and 5630 was written in 1911. It was written in 1911 because the municipality didn't collect taxes. What was it written for? It was written for businesses and towns. It was never written for housing tracks, because housing tracks did not happen until 1947. So using Streets and Highways Code 5600 and 5630 in 1911, and ignoring 941A in 1806, written specifically for housing tracks, is illegal. Is illegal. So you're not following state law. A general law county has to follow a state law. It can't ignore it. It cannot ignore it. In your packet, acceptance of subdivision map, it is the responsibility on 941A and 1806 for the county is obligated on the county to accept, approve, maintain, repair, and control any cost over the streets. 941 and 1806, just ignore it. Pretend it doesn't exist. Go back to 1911, 104 years ago. Let me talk briefly about the state law, the state of California that you're supposed to follow. Dieter versus Jones, or Jones versus Dieter, in 1984, the court in Long, in Long Beach ordered Long Beach, the municipality, was responsible to take out the parkway tree, responsible to take out the parkway tree routes, and responsible to fix the sidewalks. 1984, California law. So Ventura County says, we don't have to follow California law. We're a general law county. We do whatever we want. So in 1984, there was Jones versus Dieter. Please look that up. In 2010, we had Los Angeles, we, we had Willits versus Los Angeles. Everybody knows about that. In 2010, L.A. County was sued for $1.4 billion. And the court said, the federal court said the responsibility to fix the sidewalk and the parkway tree was L.A. County. Not the adjacent property owner, but L.A. County. What makes you different? So a federal judge says L.A. County in 2010 is responsible to repair the parkway trees and the sidewalks, and Ventura County, a general law county, is not responsible for anything. It's not responsible for federal law. It's not responsible for state law. It lives on an island. It does whatever it wants. It does whatever it wants. I'm fed up. I am completely fed up. I want you to follow federal law and state law. This is a county. You're not above a federal law. You're not above the state law. Streets and Highways Code 941A and 1806 supersedes 5600 and 5630. Please follow federal law and please follow state law. You cannot build an adjacent property over for parkway trees or sidewalks. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much Gabriel. for your time. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Any no, questions? Thank you. Nope. I think. Richard Riggs. Well, Mr. Riggs is coming up. I do have a question for County Council. Um, we've heard from Mr. Gabrielson a number of times, and he's presented, I know, information to you. Um, so has anything new been presented to you from Mr. Gabrielson that changes your opinion, uh, that disagrees with him? No, sir. I've reviewed all the citations that he's brought, and uh, nothing has changed. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I appreciate you seeing me. First, I wish I could all buy you a coconut smile. You know, I don't have the temperament for your job, but I'm sure I'm glad you're here. Um, I just, I'm just getting back to basics, basic common sense. <clears throat> this started from planted tree 
That was, oh, oh, I'm the $1,300 that haven't paid. I haven't made any arrangements. I'm $1,300. I, you know, there's this money that I'm being billed for. So I'm the guy. I'm the scofflaw. Because um, I was looking for common sense. This, this tree was planted 50 years ago, and it has uplifted and heaved the concrete. We lived there 12 years. It, and it, it cracked the curb, as you can imagine, uh, 12 years. Uh, how can we be accountable and responsible? Now, we know that the county has incurred cost. And we also appreciate that you want to pass that on. But it's just common sense. We didn't, we're living in this. And I've had Casa County homes before without trees. And la, 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 it was a great experience. Great neighborhood, great neighbors, uh, and just modest little homes. And everybody mind their own business. But I, and then I got this tree, and I said, it's a beautiful tree. And an arborist came by who lives next door, and he said, it's in great shape. This is, but it is busting up your concrete sidewalk and busting up the curb. And I said, yeah, that's a problem. And I start thinking about liability. And so, and then I get the letter from Mr. Raj or Mr. Fleisch, and, and that everything started in, I believe, 2008. Um, but at any rate, uh, and then we come along, and I met with you folks in March and said that, you know, we're, we're going to see where this is going. And then grand jury came up with, with results that were inconclusive, and I believe that they asked for, we needed more dialogue. So, however, and so in that, the grand jury sent out 58 surveys to the various counties in California, I believe it's 58, and they got 20 responses. 11 said that, yes, we're the county and we're responsible. Nine said, no, the homeowner or shared cost relationship is the way we handle it. Now, I contacted personally by email 12 other counties asking for a specific response. And they all said the county does it and the shared cost. I believe Santa Barbara pays for it and LA County pays for it. So I'm not trying to get away with anything, I don't think. <clears throat> and then, as excuse me, two weeks ago, I called uh, Attorney General. I'm sorry, is my time up? Yes. I'm sorry. It is. But Can I, you wrap I contacted. It up here? I'm sorry. Can you wrap up here? And sure. Uh, I contacted uh, Attorney Kamala Harris's offices. They referred me to counsel, a uh, Mr. Hicks. They said they do not uh, offer suggestions, do anything for counties proactively, meaning before lien or before a judgment. We can only get involved after the fact. So, and, and I don't want that to happen. So what can we do? How, how can we play nice? I mean, I know you're going to, I like the idea of shared cost. But at the same time, hearing Mr. Gabriel, Gabrielson's arguments, if we're not responsible, we, we're not responsible. And I don't know how Santa Barbara can do it and L.A. County can do it. Because we're in a better position, Ventura County. Anyway, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Briggs. Thank you. Jenny Clark. I wasn't intending on hearing this item, but it's ridiculous. So I decided that I had a couple comments. Um, much like the people in Nylon Acres and Satakoy, um, I have eyeballs and a brain. So I was aware when I moved into the Casa Conejos that I had cracked sidewalks and beautiful large trees, much like they were aware that they don't have sidewalks. So I'm a little confused why that came up on the last item. But point being, I have a brain. Um, I found the tone during the presentation incredibly offensive and insulting and, quite frankly, condescending towards Supervisor Parks. I don't know if anybody else caught that. Um, saying things like things they do all the time and databases and they can do it quickly. Um, just so you know, you didn't convince me of, of anything. Um, I find it ridiculous that you're claiming that you, as a government agency, don't have any kind of work breakdown structure, any kind of separation of um, regular expenses 
from a GNA account, I, 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 I don't buy that at all, and I think you're misinforming the public. Um, I'm really convinced now that the $100 is more like five to $800, quite frankly, the administrative cost for, for uh, what you want to do. Um, the reason that they're not answering the second notice isn't because they didn't understand. It's because they think it's BS, so um, much like the prior speaker. Um, the issue here, just so you understand, is a complete lack of integrity and trust in what you are supposed to be doing for us. If I'm going to pay for something, then why don't you start talking to me about the contract you sign, the insurance involved, not to exceed amounts, terms and conditions. I don't understand why it's fair for you to pass these costs down to us and put workers in front of our homes to do this work, yet we don't have any say in it. And I am going to stand by my comment that I'm sure I'll see you again when my $100 grind turns into an $8,000 tree removal and God knows what else your contractors find. Okay, that concludes the public comments. Uh, we'll close the public hearing, and that's before the board. Anything else for staff? Comments back staff or questions of staff? If we were to do a process similar to the city of Thousand Oaks, for example, or the city of Oxnard, they just go in and grind when it needs to be grinded without doing the notice. Are we legally allowed to do that if we wanted to? I don't know how to answer a legal question. I can tell you the difference between Thousand Oaks and Oxnard in the county is we have an ordinance that places the responsibility on the property owner for liability and for the costs. So they do what they do based on their process. I, I can't answer the legal question. Are, are we legally allowed to just go in and fix sidewalks, do the grinding without noticing, and you know, just the way the cities do it? Is it legal to do that? I know Butch Britt, for example, used to do regularly go and do patchwork and in, in cases he would do some grinding and, and not charge residents. I'm just wondering if you know, that, that can happen in well, I, the I type of county the state we're state of the current ordinance that places the obligation on the homeowner, Yes. the scenario you're describing conflicts with that somewhat. So then it really becomes a question of can we in some limited circumstances mm -hmm. not enforce or abide by that ordinance uh, so the the when we had approved question. it in October of 2014 to grind and not charge residents you're saying we're not allowed to do that no I'm, I'm not saying that I'm saying that in that circumstance what you would be doing is in a very limited or low-cost scenario not enforcing the ordinance to its full extent any other questions Okay. Any recommended changes? Uh, just move the recommended action with the with the obvious change that you have to make in terms of who's responsible on the cost of the grinding. Yeah, and I'm going to vote against it because I don't think it's um, streamlined enough. I think we can do this for a lot cheaper. And secondly, I don't believe that we should be putting liens on people's properties. There's a motion and a second. Please vote. That passes four to one. All right, board members, we're going to take a five minute break before we do our three o'clock time certain item 28. director who is uh, on vacation uh, see if we can uh, uh, do her justice here today um, the uh, the item before you today is um, related to the uh, general plan update work that we've been doing um, you recall we had the joint session with the Planning Commission on July 7th uh, the board and the Planning Commission provided a lot of good feedback and direction uh, to staff and to the consultant um, some of some of the items that you know that we felt we had clear direction on would be the um, 
There was no need for an extensive visioning process, per se, which is often a part of general plan updates. Um, kind of reaffirmation that the Planning Commission would serve as the primary advisory body for, for this effort. Um, there was interest in uh, pursuing uh, an element or chapters related to agriculture, water, healthy communities, and climate action planning. And then lastly, there was a strong desire amongst uh, the board members that we pursue the update in a very timely manner. So uh, we, got, we got a lot of clear direction, uh, which we appreciated, but uh, there were a few items that we uh, uh, wanted to bring back. The board graciously uh, invited us to come back on the 4th if we felt we needed some additional direction, and that's what we're doing here today. Um, we've highlighted in the board letter for you four, four areas where uh, we wanted to see if we could get um, provide some additional information and perhaps get uh, some uh, more direction of feedback from the board members. The uh, Jim Harnish from uh, our consultant is here today as well, and, and I'll have him come up when I'm finished making our remarks and share some of his uh, thoughts, perspectives, and recommendations, uh, and, uh, and then uh, we'll go from there. Uh, very briefly, uh, I'll touch on the four items, one of them being the economic development element or chapter. Uh, we had, we had a, a fairly uh, high-level discussion about that on the 7th, and we wanted to uh, provide to the board some, uh, some you know, more detailed information. And uh, the first attachment to your board letter is actually uh, a sample of what a economic development chapter or element might look like. This is from Merced County. Uh, I believe that uh, Mintier Harnish was involved in that, and if you have some questions on that, I'm sure Jim would be happy to answer them. Uh, as you can see, a lot of the items in there are actually programmatic as opposed to land use specific. Uh, so that's, that's something that I, I wanted to make sure uh, was available for the board to, to look at and consider. Uh, also, between the 7th and today, we received a letter from the uh, Economic Development Collaborative, and we've included that as attachment to, uh, to the board letter, letter uh, suggesting uh, that the board, in fact, specifically uh, direct that we include a economic development uh, element in the general plan. Uh, we also talked a bit about the area plan updates uh, and how they might tie into the general plan update. Uh, we had, uh, again, a fairly broad discussion on that on the 7th, uh, and uh, the board uh, raised a number of good questions about area plans and how they may differ and whether or not we should provide, look into that in a little more detail. Uh, we've done that. we provided a summary in the board letter for you. I think the the uh, important points are that uh, the costs for preparing area plan updates vary. They're, they're not, uh, we gave you, I think, a generalized uh, number for all of those area plan updates and doing a, re a review of them that that isn't really uh, uh, necessary. Some of, the, some of the area plans, for example, the Satikoi area plan we're just in the process of finishing would not need to be updated extensively. A number of the other area plans are fairly modest uh, and would not require extensive updates at that level, and we've provided you a little more information about that uh, for your consideration. The, uh, the other area is with respect to alternatives analysis, and uh, the board felt was very clear that uh, you didn't uh, want to get into any, uh, whether I don't know whether the term intellectual exercise was uh, actually from the from the discussion or not, but we didn't want to get into an exercise of taking a look at some broad land use alternatives given the policies we have in place at the county, uh, but that we may want to look at policy alternatives as the plan is developed. Um, the um, consultant team has, has done a number of general plans as was presented to you on the 7th and uh, talked about uh, something that they've done in some counties uh, which we'll call kind of focused land use alternatives, and we describe those kind of very briefly and generally in the, in the board letter. And I'll ask Jim uh, to speak to that and their experience, give you a description of what that might look like. And I'd like to uh, get some direction and feedback from the board, whether or not that's something uh, that you're interested in pursuing. And then finally, in the public engagement area, uh, there was uh, some discussion last time about um, incorporating uh, community surveys or polling uh, into the outreach program. So we uh, gathered some information about options and costs for that kind of activity, and that is uh, attachment three provides you some details on those. Um, and we wanted to make sure you had those available. We also included some information related to uh, the focus groups, and that information was included uh, previously 
uh, at the joint session. Uh, but generally, those fall into the same category with those community surveys. Um, and we wanted to make sure you kind of had that, that, that picture uh, and consideration of those costs, you know, as you, as you think about uh, options for community surveys or polls. Um, and and I, lastly, I guess before I turn it over to Jim to share his, uh, as I said, his comments and, and suggestions, I uh, mentioned to you that the Planning Commission last week asked for a report back uh, from staff on the general plan. We kind of shared for them some, some, of, the, some of these uh, preliminary thoughts and uh, share with you some of their comments. Um, they were, uh, again, wanted to reiterate their, their interest in agriculture and uh, water elements or chapters, that those are, those are extremely important issues. Uh, they also talked about some of the issues related to climate change and energy use. Wanted to make sure that uh, we continue to have those on our radar screen. And they also emphasized, uh, uh, particularly Chair Westner, uh, his interest in the economic development chapter or element and uh, particularly interested in some of the issues about workforce housing or particularly relevant to the county farm worker housing and how that ties into the economy of agriculture and felt that that was very important and something that needs to be included in the update. So um, I had a, a few other comments that aren't coming right to my mind, but anyway, that gives you, I think, a flavor of, uh, of uh, the discussion that we had at the Planning Commission. So if there are any questions for me now, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, I'll, I'll have the... Jim Harnish, come up. Other okay. questions at this time? Jim. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome back. It's nice to be back. <laughs> I love Ventura. <laughs> uh, um, Chair Long, members of the board, my name is Jim Harnish. I'm a principal with Minter Harnish. Um, and thank you again for having me back. Um, we've uh, I've worked with staff uh, since your last meeting to come up with some additional information as Chris had mentioned uh, on some of the items that you um, seem to um, uh, have some questions about or just uh, needed uh, additional information and it fell into four basic categories as Chris mentioned the uh, economic development element um, alternatives analysis uh, area plan updates and then community engagement and I thought what I would do is give you uh, kind of a, just a brief overview of the information you have in your packet. I'm not going to repeat it all. Maybe talk just a little bit about my uh, experience with each one of those topics and, and what would be my recommendation based on what all I heard in your discussion last month. Um, and I think probably be best if I went through all four of the topics. You can stop me any time and ask for qu questions and clarification, but uh, and then maybe come back around and talk about each one of them at the end if that makes sense to you. So uh, economic development element has seemed to have generated uh, a lot of interest in, in questions. Um, we've identified kind of what, what uh, economic development elements can do. Uh, their general objectives are to um, help stimulate the uh, local economy, uh, stimulate job growth, uh, generate additional public revenues um, to, for uh, public services and facilities. Um, there's a broad range of topics that can be addressed in the economic development element, really depending on the, the, the circumstances that the city or county finds it in. And uh, the example that we provided you for Merced County you see the focus is really uh, on uh, more agricultural oriented issues uh, and um, really prog programmatic, as Chris pointed out, looking at job retention and, and job growth. Um, it, there is a, a wide range of choices there. In my experience lately, uh, most uh, um, cities and counties are addressing economic development in one fashion or another through their general plan. Uh, some put it right up front and make it the, the uh, driving force behind the general plan. These are cities, typically. And then the counties are looking at um, uh, ways of enhancing their agricultural economy, at least the ag counties that I've worked in. So um, it's become more common. Ten or 20 years ago, you didn't see it quite as much, but it's not unusual. Um, the, the additional work... Um, uh, for a general plan update, falls into three or four categories. You gather more information up front, uh, maybe do a market analysis that will help you help tell you what kind of um, land uses you might be considering based on market demand. Um, then, uh, uh, oftentimes, uh, 
uh, we make a special effort to work with uh, um, uh, members of the um, economic development community, the business community, the um, builders, uh, the, um, the uh, ag uh, folks related to the ag industry to talk more specifically about their needs and how the county's general, pol general plan policies can help them. And we have a summary of the additional costs um, for uh, economic development element in here. Just roughly $125,000, $150,000 for the background information, the outreach, the policy development, and maybe some of the special studies. Um, second major uh, issue for your consideration are how you're going to deal with the area plan updates. And there are three uh, basic choices. Um, not including doing nothing, because I think you have to do something. And the basic choice is to reformat the, uh, the area plans to um, eliminate inconsistencies with the general plan, eliminate uh, goals and policies and programs that would be redundant with the general plan, uh, and focus just on the goals, policies, and programs that are relevant to each one of the, the areas. Um, uh, the reformatting would also involve um, kind of formatting in a, a, in a way consistent with the updated general plan so that they would read similarly, be organized similarly. So that's really the base choice. The second um, approach would be to do that plus uh, uh, integrate the area plans as a, um, um, a section or a chapter of the general plan. Um, and we've done this in, in um, several communities. Um, I like it as an approach because it gets the area plans right there next to the general plan, or in the general plan. The uh, area plan land use maps are really serve as a land use diagram for that portion of the county, and they're there to be read along with the, the rest of the general plan. So you have one unified document. It's a bigger document, but it's a, a unified document. And I had been thinking about this. So we, I, we don't mention this in your uh, board memo, but um, taking that approach uh, may end up satisfying your needs for several of the, the area plans so that you may not need to update them for quite a while just by doing that housekeeping effort, getting them into, into the general plan, consistent policies, consistent format. And then the, the third option is the comprehensive update. And uh, as Chris mentioned, and you're, we go into a little bit of a detail in your memo, it, taking a look at all of the area plans, they're not, they're not, they're not all the same. So some would uh, uh, argue for a greater level of update and effort than, than others would, especially if you took this integrated approach and cleaned them up and got them into the general plan. Um, so uh, our recommendation on that is not necessarily to try to do that as a part of the general plan update because uh, we're talking about a, a, um, a timely schedule. I wouldn't call it aggressive, but a three or four year schedule is a, a good schedule. Um, if you do a parallel community plan update, it could have the potential of slowing the, the general plan down. Um, I've seen that happen in one instance. So. Uh, our suggestion is to, as one of the implementation measures of the general plan, have a program that you would regularly update the, the area plans one or two or three a year and have them go into a cycle so that you're um, um, addressing all of the plans and keeping them updated over a period of time. Um, the third uh, topic was alternatives analysis. Uh, I think there was uh, uh, several comments on the board suggesting that you're not interested in uh, an intellectual exercise just to be analyzing alternatives. And I think we see this periodically with um, EIRs, that there is a stretch to find some alternatives to do some comparison um, that sometimes don't reflect the realistic alternatives. They should be, but they aren't always. Uh, and that has happened in general plan updates as well. Um, uh, the our suggestion as an alternative is not to not do any alternatives analysis, but to um, do what we call focused area alternatives analysis combined with uh, uh, policy alternatives analysis. And the, 
focused area alternatives, you, you would look at, you might take an area like uh, North Ventura Avenue and say, this is a growth area. There's a lot of, of uh, potential changes that could occur here. Let's take a look at this and, uh, as, uh, and look at two or three alternatives and evaluate those as a part of the plan and evaluate policy alternatives that would apply just to that um, particular area or policy alternatives that apply countywide. So um, this is a, a tool we're using more frequently because even with cities that are uh, more expansion oriented, oftentimes a, a, a vast majority of the city is set. They're not thinking about changing the core and they're not thinking about changing a lot of neighborhoods. So there are areas around the fringe or maybe some infill areas that become a focus of the update and uh, we would go through a process of looking at each one of those areas and then collectively treating them as, a, um, as the alternative. So this is a, 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 our suggestion is that you include this as a, uh, at least a placeholder, uh, provide some um, funding for it. If it turns out that there aren't any of those areas and you don't have to go through that process. But we wouldn't know what those areas were until we went through the early part of the background analysis, issues and opportunities, and really identified one or more of these areas that might be susceptible to uh, that kind of an analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, um, we had a lot of discussion about uh, public engagement. And uh, the recommended um, uh, uh, work program that we have has a number of, of um, pretty straightforward elements that we, we generally do in every general plan update, which would be the, the website, the, the um, uh, project branding, emails, uh, blasts, newsletters, community workshops, study sessions with the planning commission and the board and so forth. So we're, we're um, moving forward assuming that we have that kind of core group, but there was some concern about how many community workshops we do and whether or not there were some alternatives to um, just that more traditional approach to outreach. And so we provided you with um, a couple of um, um, options uh, that could be effective. Um, the community survey, and I think I mentioned this to you uh, at our, our last meeting in July, we personally don't have a lot of experience using these. Uh, I've never been a strong proponent of them, um, but they have been used successfully, and we're, uh, we've just finished one in a small town that we're doing a general plan update, and the town council and planning commission seem to be very satisfied with the results of, of that survey. Um, it was a, a, a phone survey um, that called, I'm not sure how many thousand people, but there were eventually 300 um, contacts. And, and from a polar, polling, I was uh, actually fascinated listening to the presentation from the folks that con conducted the polling. Uh, because they can read so many interesting things out of, out of the, the results that they got. Um, and it was really quite interesting. The question you have to have is what do you want to get out of the poll? What, what are you interested in hearing? What would be helpful to the, the planning process? Um, and in this case I'm talking about, it was really kind of ratifying that the town was heading in the right direction, that people were happy with the, the uh, growth policies and they have very strong growth controls in this community and it ratified the support for those like 90% ratification, unusually high. So there are some, some questions. If uh, you have to have the questions that are really, the answers would be meaningful to you in terms of your decision making process on the general plan update. And so the, there are a number of other um, polling or survey techniques and these are all summarized in this uh, attachment that uh, was on your board memo. I'd be happy to answer questions about those but based on our discussions with the people that do the polling and once you move away from the phone surveys, your reliability and usefulness of the results uh, drop dramatically because in most cases people self-select and it's similar to people deciding to show up at a workshop. It's only people who have a specific interest that go there uh, and uh, it's the same is true for most, in most cases for mail-out surveys um, or um, surveys, door-to-door -door surveys. Uh, people self-select and, and uh, choose not to survey, whereas with the phone, or choose not to respond, whereas with the phone survey, the surveyors keep at it 
until they um, get the number that they need. And it's really fascinating about how they, they uh, categorize the group. So they don't just call 300 or 1,000 people. They group the, they, they know the background, the party affiliation, um, marital status, you know, all these, uh, this information about the people they're calling, and they group them, and they call, keep calling the groups of people until they get the number and get a, a, a broad selection. So um, the other um, technique that, that I'm uh, really familiar with and I really like in some circumstances uh, are using focus groups to address specific topics uh, that are of most interest um, in, in this county it would probably be um, agriculture and water, healthy communities are three that I can think of. If you decide to do an economic development element, having a, an economic focus group would be a really good forum to deal with those issues. Um, and in this case, we'll put, get together 10 or 12 um, leading experts uh, or, or community leaders on particular topics and uh, um, meet with them three or four times during the course of the project and get direction and information from them specifically focused on those topical areas. And then um, that feeds into the larger uh, background information um, and policy development. We'll take policies, draft policies to them and get their uh, feedback on them. So I like it. Uh, it's a way of engaging the community uh, and community representatives without having a community advisory committee. We oftentimes have done this instead of a, using an advisory committee. Uh, it's more manageable and, pardon the pun, more focused. So. And with that, that's my brief summary of all of these, these four topics, and I'd be happy to come back, circle back around, and answer questions about any one of them. Okay. Board members, questions? Just ask one question on the uh, <clears throat> survey, community survey, and telephone. When you telephone uh, or call people, do people answer the phone? Because there's a lot of marketing calls, and, and I don't answer them. <laughs> I don't remember the number, but they made thousands of phone calls. And they and call cell phones and landlines, so there's a, a mix. And I frankly, I don't know how they do it. But, but people do answer the phone? Yeah. Yeah. We did get uh, interesting. There was one complaint that came through us because we were the the the, the folks that are doing survey contracted with us, so we were mm -hmm. their manager, and we had a complaint from a senior citizen uh, being harassed because they kept calling her, yeah. and she wouldn't talk to them, but they kept calling her back. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how big of an issue that is, but I, that was the only one I heard of. So. Yeah, interesting. Supervisor, um, I don't, are there more presentations? No. Nope. Okay. Um, I agree with you. The phone call um, is a really good survey method. That's what the City of Thousand Oaks does, um, and they do it every two years. Gets an attitude survey, and then also allows for people to do it online too. But it, there are two different groups. One's you know a volunteer group that may have you know some special interests, right. but that's why the, that phone one is good, and it's, it's, I think they do it for $34,000, both those things. So I think it's a, a good price to get public engagement. Um, I know you, um, it was mentioned in here about ex that board comments um, indicated that we wanted to expand public engagement, you know, beyond all the things you listed, but I think what we were talking about, as was mentioned, is we want to use the Planning Commission for workshops, use the MACs, and um, for outreach activities, but also to be able to do this kind of survey. Uh, and, I, and I think that would be effective. The question that I have, um, and it might be for uh, you or, or staff, but it, there's a little footnote that says that the general plan update as present does not include an update to the coastal plan or covers the coastal zone. And I'm just wondering, I know, is that just a parallel action? Because we are, as my, I understand it, working on the coastal zone. So maybe Mr. Yeah. Stevens can answer. Or? Yes, that, yeah, that is a parallel action. We have a grant that we're working on, our local right. coastal program, as you know, and, and that work is ongoing. Uh, they are, while, while the local coastal program is the coastal portion of the general plan, and together they make a, a, the general plan for the county. They really are distinct efforts. They have a slightly different processes, as you know, with the Coastal Commission. So uh, this was just trying to be clear that that is not part of, at this time, as we've defined it, the general plan update. Right. 
And also, uh, I, I agree with you that what we discussed, or one of the things I was suggesting, is getting the water and agriculture in that conservation open space uh, element that we're doing in terms of our chapter, as Supervisor Long called it. So we have the, we are able to focus more on them and actually give them space, you know, a, 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 a separate um, review. And that's something uh, I think is really important. We're at a time now where water is, you know, um, such an incredible, um, you know, with the drought and all that, we have to make sure that we plan well for the lack of water. And it's almost like we are in a conservative unless it gets worse, you know, that this is the conservative um, scenario right now and we should plan with that in mind because we could come back here again in the future. So we really need to, I think, push that, that water element or at least folding it in with the other open space and conservation ones. And I don't know where you would put energy and I think that's also a really important um, feature too and I don't know what you're thinking about that. I, th I think at the at the joint workshop we, we, we kind of use the term sustain sustainability and uh, tie that into the climate action planning and and the energy uh, fits right within that category in, 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 in my, from my perspective I don't know do you, would you agree with that Jim mm -hmm. yeah as well so we, we see it fitting in in, in kind right. of the, the climate so, action planning realm yeah. and it is um, a requirement to deal with the greenhouse gas mm -hmm. emissions issue so being right. able to look at things like the community choice aggregation looking at alternative energy sources ways to reduce our our footprint but also to uh, in, in efforts to get off the grid way we be, that's one way of becoming sustainable too so uh, that is something that we can cover then mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and I would just mention a few um, counties have adopted um, an energy element. Kern County comes to mind, mm -hmm. um, and you can imagine why, given the array of energy resources that they have there. But it, that's that's uncommon, mm -hmm. and but we do deal with energy um, in a fairly robust way in most of the, the general plan because of the greenhouse gas emissions. So. Do you think about what lands would you want solar panels on mm -hmm. or should we be pushing for a rooftop mounted? And, um, another uh, point I think that was very strong at the last meeting was realizing that public engagement isn't the expensive part of this and also which can take the longest and when you're talking about long horizons which I find this to be exceedingly long. Um, I just want to make sure that we are very focused on the fact that, you know, the idea that it's easy to go out there and spend a lot of money and we're talking several million dollars, you're talking several years, but I'm afraid, uh, and I had asked, let's see if we can do this in three and a half years if we can. Uh, if it goes too long, it almost becomes obsolete. And, and, and that's a, a concern I have and I feel like by the time you get it in the general plan and then you start implementing it, you know, you're, you're so far down the line. I, I guess this is a new age. I'm not, as <laughs> Bruce Smith was saying, when he could do it in one year, I'm just uh, okay. I'm actually kind of shocked to see that it, you're talking five years to do this. Yeah. And, and with that, I would like to see an analysis of how can you do it in three and a half years? What would you do? You know, like you were saying, you can um, do the housekeeping with the area plans. Uh, but adding more and more to this, uh, I think is going, and adding more and more public engagement and more and more is going to just take this thing uh, to a very expensive and long time frame. Uh, I, I think the, the, the board's preference for us to move this, uh, you know, ahead in, in, in a timely manner was uh, something we clearly understood. Um, and, and, uh, and I would just reference, for example, the, the focused general plan update that we adopted in 2005 to give you some, some perspective. That, that, that project took about four years and, uh, and I think in the end was probably somewhere in the $600,000 range in terms of our, our costs. Um, so, so things have changed, uh, be it also CEQA analysis as well as the level number of issues that the state has added that we have to address every time we do a general plan update. So, so um, we, we just want to make sure we're, you know, uh, up front with the board that those issues are out there and, and, and a, a one-year general plan entirely in-house is really not something that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's feasible, but we will do our best to do things in a, as, as quickly and as timely as we can. We're sensitive to the fact that we want to maintain momentum, we want to get a project done before it is obsolete. We don't want to have to go mm -hmm. back 
as happened with the 2005 update and actually had to redo some analysis that was done at the front end mm -hmm. as we got to the back end. We definitely want to avoid that kind of an issue. So maybe in a, you know, if you can give us information, how do you do it in three and a half years? I would like that. And whether that's also concurrently doing the EIR the best you can or, or whatever it takes, but this is, I, I think this is just too long. Well, uh, he, Supervisor Foy is suggesting a timetable, but I would actually like to see your recommendation on how you can do it in three and a half years. <laughs> the, 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 the speed with which we're able to do it will be tied to the amount of resources and staff that we can put to it, as well as what, what the consultant can offer. And, and that will be, we can take a look at it from, from our end, and when we put out uh, a request for proposal, that we can emphasize for the bidders for that. Here, here's our timeline. Here's what, here's what we're... Here's what we're shooting for. You, you provide us how you're going to meet this timeline within that budget. So it, it'll be, it'll be a, a work in progress, but the request for proposal process will certainly be a way for us to emphasize but, for potential bidders. in addition bidders. to just what the consultant can offer and the resources you mm -hmm. have, but actually what in the elements that you're suggesting right. can we do to, you know, is it faster to do the integration of the area plan? You know, just kind of that analysis mm -hmm. is what I'd like to see. Madam Chair, um, are we going to incorporate some of the J. Lou's uh, recommendations from Steve DeGeorge, you know? That? Yeah, I, certainly. Yeah, w uh, assuming that that plan is adopted uh, uh -huh. by the parties, we will definitely. Uh, that, that, that's a perfect example of the type of thing that's happened in the last 25 years that we need to reflect and update our plans to incorporate. So most certainly because, we would because, be. You know, that's, that's important to yeah. the DOD, you know, and all of us for that matter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, I, we do have some public speakers on this, but I want to just give some feedback on the Merced example. I, I, there are elements of the focus economic development uh, piece that I, I really like and, and think. Yeah, I, th I thought that was very good. Yeah, yeah it's applicable good to our county. Uh, we certainly have a, um, uh, from Mr. Stensley's, as you can see, a very engaged um, uh, economic development collaborative. Uh, I particularly like one of them, and that's policy uh, economic development 4.5 child care facility encouragement, and that's wearing my my hats of the first five commission too. But um, and the uh, the the analysis that was done that says the value of child care, um, the economic engine that it is. Mm -hmm. I think I think what we have in some of this is is um, current uh, analysis already completed by either EDC VC or we, we, we must have five, you know, first five, we must have five or six economic forecasts in this region done a year. So I think that, you know, not to reinvent some of this, but to see if you could pull things in that are still uh, current and um, uh, workable to put into an economic development element. I just, I feel we need to have that. Um, the other piece, uh, when, I, when I talked at the last meeting on this with the health and all policies, um, to have somewhere in here some language that says the word poverty. Um, there is poverty in this county. Uh, we know that we still have children living at the, below the poverty level. We have families. Um, and so workforce and economic development um, you know, ties into bringing, bringing those families and children out of poverty. Um, but w words really make a difference. So somewhere in a document you, we have poverty is uh, mentioned as a, um, uh, something where we all want to work on and integrate into uh, success in the, in the applications of general plan components. So just, just my first comments for the afternoon. There may be more. I agree with the energy uh, focus. Um, and sustainability, um, and, and I also think with the uh, area plans, as was said last time, that we have most of them are are um, not as outdated, and and we ought to be able to just incorporate, streamline, put them in the appropriate um, uh, section here, and uh, rely on them as a, as a uh, critical piece of the general plan, because the residents look to that because uh, they've all worked on it, so. Any other comments, board? We'll open up for the public comments. Those who are here to speak to us, yes. Well, I, as I see it, there are chapters or elements that we have to do and some that we can add if we want mm -hmm. to. But then there's this whole set of goals and policies. And 
to me, that is where we can focus a lot of these type of issues that instead of an entire element on them, but actually if it's part of our goals or our policies of the general plan, when we're making decisions on land use, we're making decisions on water, we'll be considering those goals and policies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's open up and uh, hear from those folks who are patiently awaiting to speak to us. Joe Gibson's first up. Welcome, Mr. Gibson. It's almost dinner time. Yes, Sorry. and I'm missing Sorry my Canal Valley Little League play in the World Series against some foreign country tonight to be here. So, oh. Kathy, our Madam Chair, members of the board, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Joe Gibson. Today I'm here representing Vasita as the vice chair. As you're aware, Vasita is a 66 year organization that's recognized regionally and throughout the state uh, discussing issues that affect our economy and our region. Our members leverage the power of a unified regional business group focused on stimulating the, the economy through ag advocacy and positive working relationships with government officials, private and nonprofit leaders. Ventura County is embarking on an important step forward in its, as it weighs the latest update to its general plan. One piece of that step would be to include an economic development element to the general plan in this next approval cycle. Numerous organizations have recommended the county include an economic development element, and we at Vesita wholeheartedly agree. As been, has been pointed out, inclusion of an economic development element increasingly is part of the, quote, best practices going forward throughout the state. And increasingly, more and more communities are in, and uh, counties are including, general, including economic development elements as part of their general plan. An e economic development element can assist the county chart as it looks to strengthen its open space while also spelling out how the county is going to develop jobs and preverb, preverb the existing industry. Let's remember that government doesn't create jobs, business creates jobs. The county needs to prioritize the areas from roads to wastewater to water to air transportation. An economic development element will help you do this. It will help you as elected officials make informed policy decisions. It will clarify for the private sector how those decisions affect business. We encourage you to address the, the issue of how to sustain a viable ag industry over the decades to come and use the information being gathered by EDCVC in a sustainable ag study. An economic development element enables us businesses to speak up when it comes to measuring the impact of county actions on the private sector. An economic development element in the county general plan doesn't guarantee economic success, but it does provide a framework for making success happen and help business plan and employers plan to make good decisions. Finally, a few thoughts about the process. The planning pro horizon process should not be unreasonably long. It should be 2040, not 2050. The plan needs to cover issues of business expansion and retention and partnerships to encourage a healthy economy in the county, supporting the cities. This includes features such as allowing areas in the unincorporated county to have ag-related business uses to support our ag community. The plan should consider alternative land uses in limited unincorporated areas to include farm worker housing, agricultural processing, solar expansion, ocean desal, green waste processing, and future technologies that will be necessary to sustain the county. And finally, the general plan should not consider SOAR, which is a political action. In the future, a new vote could repeal or change it to fit a good general plan policy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Patty Waters. Excuse me. Oh, 
Thank you. My name is Patty Waters. I live in Moore Park, 10865 Broadway, Moore Park. I'm here um, to just very much encourage you to include the economic development element. Uh, we're farmers, and we've been farming in Ventura County for over 100 years. And in those 100 years, farming has changed drastically. And it changes faster every year than it did in previous years. Uh, new regulations from every angle that you can possibly think of come up. Um, and so when you talk about doing a general plan and making it last till 2050, you, you, we haven't got a slightest idea of what 2050 is going to look like. And so for you to put regulations on today that's going to regulate 2000, from 2040 to 2050, when none of us even know what it's going to look like, is kind of stretching beyond what we as human beings can do. So I think you're going looking at too long. My other concern is this is probably the most important thing you do as a general plan. And to rush it in any way, to me, uh, means that you can be leaving out very important things. So I think you need to shorten your scope. You need to make sure that you do it in a timely manner. But sometimes rushing makes things way worse. So I think rushing it is worse because this is the most important thing. This is going to affect so many things. And you hear right now, we did it in 85, and now we have things, we have things coming before you that nobody even knew was going to be coming up, things like handling green waste from the cities and trying to develop it and put it into agricultural areas because the agricultural people are who you want to use it. But nobody knew the technology that was going to be developed. Nobody knew the need for it. Nobody knew all of the stuff that's going to come out. So for you to try to do something now and say we're going to regulate something this far ahead is almost insane in my book. But uh, So I think that the economic development element is, the mo is one of the most important things that you can add to this because it gives you some scope and some ability to change things as they progress. Um, in, in, in farming and in agriculture, it's not just growing a product. That's, that's the part that God takes care of. The part that we take care of is picking it, moving it to where it needs to be processed, maybe processing it closer to where it's picked. And if we try to process closer to where it's picked, right now that's impossible in this county. Uh, the people that work there, maybe they want to live closer to where they work, maybe spread them out because it's a big county operation. Don't house them all in Oxnard. House them throughout the county. But now we can't do that because we can't put, any, we can't put them even close to where they work. You look at Lyman Air and they have some great housing projects out there. You couldn't do any of those today under what you have. But maybe that's some of the things that we need. So the only way we can do those and the only way we can change and have some flexibility as we move forward is to put in things like the economic development element and making sure that those things work. Um, so I hope that you will not push it too fast. I hope you will not make it go into a future that we cannot predict. And I hope that you will absolutely look at the economic development element. It's for thinking. It's called best practices. This county's tried to always be uh, ahead of people, and I think that uh, joining in that group would be a good part. So thank you. Thank you. Matt Guthrie. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, evening, mm -hmm. um, Chair Long, members of the board. My name is Matt Guthrie, and I'm here today representing Ventura County Colab and our uh, over 400 members. Uh, I know that this is very early in the process. Um, it's going to take several years to complete. I appreciate the opportunity. We've several times we were here at the joint meeting. Um, Lynn Jensen, our executive director, was at the planning commission meeting on Thursday, speaking about this. And so um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, my comments will mirror some of those as well as some of the previous speakers here today. But uh, um, so I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, as we move forward with the general plan update. Um, such a long-term overarching planning document is going to have especially profound implications for people who do business in the unincorporated areas of the county. Uh, it's for that reason we continue to reiterate our support for the adoption of an economic development element to the general plan. Uh, and Colab's not alone in that opinion. You've heard that from several people. Uh, comments from the Planning Commission, stakeholder input uh, throughout the county, both EDC, VC, um, Visita, 
uh, have been very clear in emphasizing the importance of economic considerations being given to local agriculture and businesses that operate within the county. Um, plan this past Thursday at the Planning Commission, uh, Chairman Wessner commented that um, agriculture has to be looked at as, in, as an industry, not a park service. Um, I think his point being that economic viability is critical to the long-term long sustainability uh, and the existence of agriculture and some of the businesses um, that are out there. Um, the fact is there are hundreds of businesses that operate in, in the county land. Um, they provide valuable jobs and they make a significant contribution to the county. Uh, we understand, and, and, and this is part of the conversation you guys had originally at the, at the joint session meeting, um, that the county has different considerations in the county plan um, update in the process than, than the cities do um, when it comes to crafting the general plan. But the, the precedent for the coexistence of resource protection um, and maintaining the viability of agriculture and businesses that operate there um, through an economic development are not mutually exclusive uh, and a better balance can be had. Um, and then as, as uh, Mr. Harnish stated that, that lately the trend seems to be moving toward, I, I think when they originally showed the, um, the slide up there, it was roughly 40% of counties had an economic development um, element to them, um, if I remember correctly. Um, but that seems to be, the trend seems to be going that way. I, I don't know if it, if it keeps going that way, I would imagine eventually over half of them will have that. Um, so I think that's important. I, I know there are other elements that you're considering as well. I think that this element in particular um, has, has pretty big ramifications for the people who do business here. Um, and they, like I said, they provide jobs and a lot of products that, that um, do a lot of good here. So um, that's our strong consideration. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. Anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Okay. All right, then we'll bring it back up to the board for further questions, discussion with staff, other comments to be you made. Know, I appreciate Mr. Guthrie's point that uh, preserving agriculture land preservation is not a mutually exclusive from uh, business and industry. and. I think about the J. Lou study too, which was saying specifically our largest employer in the county of Naval Base Ventura County is actually protected by the agricultural land around it. So there are a lot of um, mutually uh, synergistic benefits as a result of both having the agriculture land and obviously you can't have an agriculture industry without it and the, the preservation of that and also being able to, because of that, um, protect our businesses too. I, uh, <clears throat> there's a, couple, a lot of good things said by the speakers, and I thought that there's a common theme here about this economic piece. And I think for all of us who also sit on the Transportation Commission, we saw the survey that came out. We talk about maybe a half cent sales tax, quarter cent widening. What was the number one thing besides keeping rates low to the people? Was jobs, jobs, growth in the county. They wanted that was the big thing people wanted. And I think in our plan, we have to do whatever we can to help cons preserve the jobs we have in our ag communities and within the, um, uh, the business community so people can enjoy living here and have an opportunity to work here. We also saw that a lot of people leave this county to get their jobs. We, we got to figure that out and find that balance. Uh, I, I think it's, it's critical. The other thing that I thought was interesting and I think is so true is not going out too far. You know, there's 20 years versus 30 years, 40 years. And it was interesting talking to Darren Kettle again at that. He goes, you know, well, the problem we get out there is we just, we're just making so many guesses that are just like throwing darts at the wall. If you go too far out, you don't have. And I think Ms. Waters said the same thing is, as humans, we can't come up with those kind of ideas. We don't know where technology is going to be. I'm sure that we never knew what the state was going to do on green waste issues that we have to deal with now. All those things coming up. So we have to have a, a, a not so long, but a flexible type program that we can in, be flexible enough to endorse the new ideas that come down from the state, what we have to do, also the technology in uh, farming, uh, which I, I think is critical because we don't know. All of a sudden we're doing typical farming, we're doing orchards, then all of a sudden you see Howling Nurseries put greenhouses up and they can grow stuff on what they grow on 7,000 acres and 250 acres. We've got to be flexible enough to make these kind of things. So hopefully this, uh, this will have those economic abilities in this kind of a plan. I think it's very important. And I was glad to see the, there was a common theme with, with our speakers here with that. So. Thank you. Okay. Other comments here? Um, I have uh, sort of questions and comments at the same time. So if I could have our consultant uh, come up and um, Mr. Stevens, you're probably going to get, get some of these questions also. So um, my, my first question is, 
uh, last time when we spoke, uh, this issue of economic development plan came up, and, and uh, I think some good points are made about that. But what we tried to emphasize was that we have consistently done visioning in Ventura County, and it consistently comes up with the same concept of making sure we preserve agriculture and and you know these distinction between the cities, et cetera. Can we focus an economic development plan on the agriculture and enhancing agriculture? It, it feels to me like that is the most complementary way for us to do an economic development plan. And as you said, there was there are some places where the cities did one part of it and they focused on the. Do you feel like that's something that we can we can do also here? With this. Uh, sure, I do. It's your. It will ultimately be your policy document, and you can direct the focus of that right. as well as any of the other be elements. So. Because, as you listed, I was I was looking, quite frankly, and for because the board sort of gave you that direction last time. I was looking for the economic development list to sort of show us how we could do the economic development component with the heavy emphasis on the ag side of it. This looks to me like a standard economic development list. I could be wrong, um, but you have, you know, listed in here, you know, new business attraction and recruitment. Um, those kinds of things fit more in the category of cities, unless it's new business from an agricultural you know, standpoint and stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I, I was looking for that, I guess, between now and next week, I would hope that we could, could address that. And that's exactly what today is for, is you haven't had much time um, and, and to try to revisit today so that we can fine tune a little bit before we go. So that's, that's one question um, or, 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 or one hope. Um, and then um, the second one is in, in, with regard to the area plans. I share your, your interest or your recommendation that we should probably do an integration. Today with modern technology, we should have one document everybody can go to online and they can navigate that document rather than they have to go find another document if they want to find the area plan. Um, you talked about the possibility of trying to decide how late in the process can we decide, make these decisions about whether we do any comprehensive area plans or whether we, you know, or, or you know, to what degree, you know, the integration, you know, engages something. How late in the process can we go with that? How much do we need to know that early, et cetera? I would say at least a year into the process. I mean, the front end of the process is data gathering, and, uh, and in fact, you may, you, you want to do some of that to inform that, that decision. That decision. To some extent. Okay. As particularly the third option, which is a comprehensive update. Mm -hmm. You may find that a, a focused area alternatives analysis for a couple of these areas uh, fill, fulfills the bulk of the need mm -hmm. for the update and the change okay. by looking at these choices that could then find its way later on into a more robust update after the general plan. So a question for you and Chris, and that is, do you need that for the initial going out to work with the consultants and the cost estimates, et cetera? You don't believe so, right? And Chris, do you feel comfortable with that, That's um, keeping that flexible during that yeah, first Yeah, I, I don't believe we need period? that at this point. Okay. I, I think it's good for us to know what um, what direction or whether we're, you know, whether the board wishes to entertain that as an option because uh -huh. in, in a request for a proposal, we can include kind of optional tasks mm -hmm. and get an initial assessment from them, uh, from a consultant as to what Okay. They think the time and cost might be, but we don't have to contract for those initially. Okay. So. And and so back to the consultant, your recommendation is that we we keep the we keep the option open for the alternatives update. Uh, I'm not opposed to keeping the option open. I I I think there's there I don't I don't I don't think it's likely that we're going to do a lot with that, but I'm but I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to keeping that open. And then um, we, we discussed uh, timeline and public engagement last time, and they're, they're, they're somewhat intertwined. Um, and, and I appreciate sort of the summary you gave uh, to it, uh, Chris, but this is, I, I think this is the, for me, what most accurately reflects the board's uh, direction the last time we talked was, uh, we want to move crisply, you know, we want to move promptly, but we want a good and appropriate product, and we don't want to move so fast that we don't 
we don't pull it off. You don't do this very often. We do definitely want to get it right. We recognize that if we don't put a timeline on that has some feeling of constraint, it's just very easy to kick it down. And you gave the examples of people at eight and 10 years doing their general plans. We don't want to go that direction. But you talked about people, you know, you really have to hustle to get it done in. And you guys were talking in the four to five year range uh, last time. And uh, so I know you, you, you've got a request of, you know, what, what is it at the three and a half? I guess I would, I, I would think that, can you bracket that as short as three and a half and as long as five, right? Um, based on what you guys were saying, but but have it really firm. It's not going past that, you know, or I don't know whether it's five or three and a half and four and a half, right, or, or whatever. And when we say that three and a half, four and a half, when are we talking about is the start time from today or the start time from when you come back or how, how, how what 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 is the start time as we keep talking three and a half and four and a half because that's obviously what on some people's minds here the the start time would be once you've selected the consultant and the consultant starts work okay so I'm not quite sure Chris can talk about how much time he thinks he'll need to get to that point uh, but to answer the second part of your question on the, the setting the timeline um, I think it uh, would be important to set the timeline you want, and uh, I keep hearing three and a half years, that's doable, and there are uh, project management techniques that um, uh, the consultant can put in place uh, to uh, develop close uh, uh, iterative working relationships with the staff. One of the questions to be answered still is the role of staff versus the consultants, and so That'll have some influence on the, the schedule, but I think it's essential to have a s schedule with milestones, uh, understanding that it's possible it'll slip, but I wouldn't have a schedule that's three and a half to five years. I would have a well, three no, and a half year schedule. I absolutely agree. I'm just saying when you come back, I recognize that three and a half is really moving. And so I'm saying give us the, you know, we, the request was, well, what could, what, what, how would you do it if you're doing it in three and a half? Also tell us, how would you do it if you're doing it in four and a half? Mm -hmm. so, and then we choose, you know, uh, between those, you know, so that we can kind of look at the process and say, how much of a, 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 of a, of a forced march is it to do it in three and a half? How much of a forced march is it at four and a half? We want it to be a march, right? Uh, we want it to be, you know, regular progress. But I agree. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we just leave this. A, but as we're picking the deadline, I'm asking to have more than one option to pick when you come back. I, I, you know, I'd like to hear a three and a half. I'd like to hear a four and a half, because I'd like to see how condensed is the work, and how much are we either on top of each other, or how confident do we feel we'll have a good product. Well, I can at, tell you right business. now that the three and a half year schedule is um, not a forced march, but it's a very steady effort to get the product done, and would have no. Um, no major uh, unanticipated delays. Slips. Mm -hmm. So um, we can identify a longer schedule and we can talk about how, what the differences are in there, but sometimes it's, uh, well, are we going to take uh, uh, four months to do an administrative draft EIR or seven months? Well, we could do it in four, which is, you know, a good steady pace, or we could do it in seven which is provides more time for internal review and um, and either one would work but um, the uh, and there are pros and cons to each but the I, I think the objective that the board setting for the schedule is, should be a driving force behind whatever schedule we set frankly on the projects that have gotten on done on time or nearly done on time uh, that I've worked on uh, it has been because the elected officials have, have demanded that it be done by a, a certain date, and uh, the staff and the consultants mm -hmm. have uh, taken that to heart. And that's, um, and that's what we heard last time from you, yeah. right? Um, and the um, uh, the issue. Um, I agree. Well, I think I think 
I think you've got it in terms of public engagement, and I, I appreciate the comments that you made about polling versus other, and so that we're sensitive to the self-select meetings, whether it's group meetings and all that stuff, versus the the true opinion polling that we would do for the for all of the residents of Ventura County, whether they are able to get to that particular that particular meeting or not. So, all right, thank you very much. Um, I would hope that you could give me some sense of how we could do economic development plan that has a significant focus on the ag side of it and, and perhaps having the cities focusing on some of the other aspects. So if you could do that, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, Madam Chair, I know we've discussed, you know, the different issues about economic development and area planning and so forth. Initially, I asked about the J. Lou, you know, and I had a, a briefing from uh, Steve DeGeorge regarding the, the study of encroachment issues, and that's to me is extremely important that we continue working with the, with our military. And the reason I'm asking is that I know we share this over and over again, that we have a $2 billion payroll with the, in about 18,000 jobs there at, uh, at the base. And the multiplying effect that we have on that, on, on the economy, is just tremendous. You know, it's, what is it, about two, three times uh, the economic fact, uh, dollars that we get out of that, those, that payroll. And that also helps, I, I believe, the, our ag economy because we have the encroachment issues. One of the things that the military, doesn't want, the military does not want is to, to build around the base. And we've been working with the different communities like Oxnard and Camarillo and, and those areas to keep that, uh, that ag free and clear, you know, from, uh, from the basis. And also it helps our military bases. So I think that that will help the ag economy, as, as mentioned here before, and the and also um, other other uh, parts of the of the general plan that uh, that might help us, you know, with the total economic uh, uh, development for for the county. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, supervisor. <coughs> the uh, looking, we haven't any kind of uh, agriculture element yet, so I think that these two things seem to fold it well together, uh, but. Uh, general plans are specific for guidelines for development, right? And um, they're the blueprint for development. And it's, we have probably the meat and potatoes that I see of this is the zoning. And we have all these lands, but we've identified them of all the lands that are inconsistent zones with the general plan. And that all needs to be taken care of. And because we've done so much staff work already, hopefully, you know, that's something that we can move on. It's going to have its own environmental document. but. Um, to me, it will be uh, a lot of it is open space with the wrong zoning, so it, it probably won't be increased impacts. But I think that that's something that we really need to take care of. And I see these being done, as you were saying, it's a matter of management. You can do these things in parallel, you know, while someone's writing the language for you know, resources and adding agriculture and water in there. Someone else could be working on, or it's probably not someone else, so another team's working on the zoning. And a question also regarding um, use of staff. I know our staff are um, burdened, but they're also the best. And we have some, they really know the stuff. They're really good at uh, putting this stuff together. And I would encourage wherever we can and where we can use our staff because um, I think they are the best. Certainly appreciate those comments. I agree with you that we have a very good, very good and competent staff, and I I know agree. a number of them are eager to, to work on this project, along with the many others they have on their plate. But uh, that 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 may, that may be the primary issue. Here, here in the comments from the board today, I, I'm 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 not confident that we could return next week with a, with an answer to some of these uh, questions and the analysis with that scope. However, what we may be able to bring next week uh, uh, before, for the board's consideration might be some, some, uh, some of the administrative steps we need to keep this process moving and not lose the momentum that we have. And then we can take some time during your recess and come back right after that with our scope and, and, yeah. and uh, I think that would get good. that out. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to rush it and try and turn this yeah. thing around in one day. Uh, you may, there's some very good comments and direction from the board that I think are going to take uh, more than uh, 24 hours for us to think about uh, before we come back. But, uh, but I don't want to lose that momentum, and I think we'd like to come back. It, perhaps we'll look at uh, uh, tonight and tomorrow at uh, what we have and, and, and may have for you next week some, uh, administrative, some recommendations for administrative things, perhaps related to staffing, so that we can keep the, keep the project moving. Good. Well, hopefully we have enough 
staffing. We'll have to do whatever we have to do and put the right together. But I think uh, our consultant made a good comment is when you put a date and you have to go to that target date, I think that's what really drives you. And I know we've been talking three and a half years, but I'd rather think it'd be closer to three years because by the time we get in there, we'll be done. And hopefully some of us will still be here to vote on that. But, um, but, I, but I think it's, it's clear. It's like, a, it's like a game. Look at a football game. How many most of the points are scored in the last few minutes? And that's at the end of the day, it's because you have a timetable. And I think it's true. We have to get that timetable together. And I think that would be a, something to put it together and move it, move it fast. And if we can use our staff, that's great. But I, your staff's a little stretched, as we know. So, again, Mr. Powers has promised you all the pennies in his in his packets to make this happen. So, <laughs> you notice I said pennies, not pennies, dollars. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's an improvement. <laughs> so, yeah, no, just to clarify, uh, Mr. Stevens, uh, administrative uh, items. What what specifically well, were you? Well, uh, I was thinking uh, uh, most particularly about perhaps uh, uh, staffing. We we had some analysis uh, provided as to. Um, uh, the relationship between the staffing that we would like to have in-house and what we might have the consultant do. And at the joint workshop, uh, I think the board was clear they wanted the staff to be the face of the project. <clears throat> so we've already started kind of a work on what kind of staffing level we might need for the project. And if we're ready for that, we may want to bring that back to you next week, uh, uh, kind of get uh, your, uh, your review and perhaps an authorization, because there is a time lag to recruit and get staff on board. And we'd I'd like to use the recess period to perhaps get the ball rolling on that process. So that's the kind of thing I was thinking of. And, and certainly there's some things you contract out, you know, someone on hydrology or sound or things like noise, and you know, but certainly I, I like the idea of staff overseeing it. Yeah. And, and one last thing I would add, there was some, some comments about the time horizon. Um, and uh, 2050 was thrown out. I, 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 that, that hasn't been something that we've recommended at, at the staff level. Typically, the general plans are tied to the regional forecasts that are done, and we're in the SCAG region. They've established 2040 as their, as their horizon date for the next regional transportation plan. Um, if we were to choose a date other than that, we would have to develop our own forecasts, which is a very time consuming and costly process. So well, then don't uh, do that. I don't know that I've ever I don't know that I've ever worked in a jurisdiction that shows a horizon different than the one established at the regional level. Well I appreciate you so, saying that because I think that's be what everybody said that too. That's point. good. It's good. That's a logical reason to tie it to that. Do you know uh, the other cities in the area are they I've heard some doing 2050. And do you know, that might be something to take a I, look I, at because they must be getting that information from somewhere too, huh? They, they typically get it from the regional forecast. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I haven't, I've been having some preliminary discussions with uh, Steve at VCTC. We are going to, uh, they have within their budget this year to update their traffic model. We are going to take advantage of that work. Yeah. And he mentioned to me that that would be at 2040. And, and he also mentioned that a couple of the other cities in the county are also looking to use that for their general plan updates. But that's as much information as I have about, about the cities. Okay, so we'll look for kind of an admin framework for discussion points sure. for next week. Um, okay. um, again, this is a process, and yeah. we have to know all of this is kind of a rolling living document discussion, at least till we get... People hired and on board and doing it. Yeah. Any other direction you need? No, I think that's. I think that'll other do it for goodbye. now. Other than goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you I for it. the update and the information. Thank you to all the public folks who showed up to participate and listen. And this is a receive and file report, and direction was given. Let's have a receive and file action. We have a motion. We have a second. And this this is very helpful, I think, to be able to yeah. give some guidance on this. Yeah. Please vote. There we go. That action's taken. That completes our agenda. See you all next week, or some of you. <laughs>